Preface to the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Preface. The aim of this book is best exhibited by describing its origin. I am, and have been since early manhood, an editor of newspapers, magazines, and books, and a critic of the last named. These occupations have forced me into a pretty wide familiarity with current literature, both periodical and within covers, and in particular into a familiarity with the current literature of England and America. It was part of my daily work for a good many years to read the principal English newspapers and reviews. It has been part of my work all the time to read the more important English novels, essays, poetry, and criticism. An American born and bred, I early noted, as everyone else in like case must note, certain salient differences between the English of England and the English of America, as practically spoken and written. Differences in vocabulary, in syntax, in the shades and habits of idiom, and even, coming to the common speech, in grammar. And I noted, too, of course, partly during visits to England, but more largely by a somewhat wide and intimate intercourse with English people in the United States, the obvious differences between English and American pronunciation and intonation. Greatly interested in these differences, some of them so great that they led me to seek exchanges of light with Englishmen, I looked for some work that would describe and account for them with a show of completeness, and perhaps depict the process of their origin. I soon found that no such work existed, either in England or in America, that the whole literature of the subject was astonishingly meager and unsatisfactory. There were several dictionaries of Americanisms, true enough, but only one of them made any pretension to scientific method, and even that one was woefully narrow and incomplete. The one more general treatise, the work of a man foreign to both England and America in race and education, was more than forty years old and full of palpable errors. For the rest, there was only a fugitive and inconsequential literature an almost useless mass of notes and essays, chiefly by the minor sort of pedagogues, seldom illuminating, save in small details, and often incredibly ignorant and inaccurate. On the large and important subject of American pronunciation, for example, I could find nothing save a few casual essays. On American spelling, with its wide and constantly visible divergences from English usages, there was little more. On American grammar there was nothing whatever. Worse, an important part of the poor literature that I unearthed was devoted to absurd efforts to prove that no such thing as an American variety of English existed, that the differences I constantly encountered in English, and that my English friends encountered in American, were chiefly imaginary, and to be explained away by denying them. Still intrigued by the subject and in despair of getting any illumination from such theoretical masters of it, I began a collection of materials for my own information, and gradually it took on a rather formidable bulk, my interest in it being made known by various articles in the newspapers and magazines. I began also to receive contributions from other persons of the same fancy, both English and American, and gradually my collection fell into a certain order, and I saw the workings of general laws in what at first had appeared to be mere chaos. The present book then began to take form its preparation a sort of recreation from other and far different labor. It is anything but an exhaustive treatise upon the subject. It is not even an exhaustive examination of the materials. All it pretends to do is to articulate some of those materials, to get some approach to order and coherence into them, and so pave the way for a better work by some more competent man. That work calls for the equipment of a first-rate philologist, which I am surely not. All I have done here is to stake out the field, sometimes borrowing suggestions from other inquirers, and sometimes, as in the case of American grammar, attempting to run the lines myself. That it should be regarded as an antisocial act to examine and exhibit the constantly growing differences between English and American, as certain American pedants argue sharply, this doctrine is quite beyond my understanding. All it indicates, stripped of sophistry, is a somewhat childish effort to gain the approval of Englishmen, a belated efflorescence of the colonial spirit often commingled with fashionable aspiration. The plain fact is that the English themselves are not deceived, 
nor do they grant the approval so ardently sought for. On the contrary, they are keenly aware of the differences between the two dialects and often discuss them as the following pages show. Perhaps one dialect in the long run will defeat and absorb the other. If the two nations continue to be partners in great adventures, it may very well happen. But even in that case, something may be accomplished by examining the differences which exist today. In some ways, as in intonation, English usage is plainly better than American. In others, as in spelling, American usage is as plainly better than English. But in order to develop usages that the people of both nations will accept, it is obviously necessary to study the differences now visible. This study thus shows a certain utility. But its chief excuse is in its human interest, for it prods deeply into national idiosyncrasies and ways of mind, and that sort of prodding is always entertaining. I am thus neither teacher, nor prophet, nor reformer, but merely inquirer. The exigencies of my vocation make me almost completely bilingual. I can write English, as in this clause, quite as readily as American, as in this here one. Moreover, I have a hand for the compromise dialect which embodies the common materials of both and is thus free from offense on both sides of the water, as befits the editor of a magazine published in both countries. But that compromise dialect is the living speech of neither. What I have tried to do here is to make a first sketch of the living speech of these states. The work is confessedly incomplete, and in places very painfully so. But in such enterprises a man must put an arbitrary charm to his labors, lest some mischance after years of diligence take him from them too suddenly for them to be closed, and his laborious accumulations, as Ernest Walker says in his book on English surnames, be doomed to the wastebasket by harassed executors. If the opportunity offers in future, I shall undoubtedly return to the subject. For one thing, I am eager to attempt a more scientific examination of the grammar of the American vulgar speech, here discussed briefly in Chapter 6. For another thing, I hope to make further inquiries into the subject of American surnames of non-English origin. Various other fields invite. No historical study of American pronunciation exists. The influence of German, Irish English, Yiddish, and other such immigrant dialects upon American has never been investigated. There is no adequate treatise on American geographical names. Contributions of materials and suggestions for a possible revised edition of the present book will reach me if addressed to me in care of the publisher at 220 West 42nd Street, New York. I shall also be very grateful for the correction of errors, some perhaps typographical, but others due to faulty information or mistaken judgment. In conclusion, I borrow a plea in confession and avoidance from Ben Johnson's Pioneer Grammar of English, published in an incomplete form after his death. We have set down, he said, that, that in our judgment agreeth best with reason and good order, which notwithstanding, if it seem to any to be too rough-hued, let him plane it out more smoothly, and I shall not only envy it, but in the behalf of my country most heartily thank him for so great a benefit. Hoping that I shall be thought sufficiently to have done my part if in tolling this bell I may draw others to a deeper consideration of the matter. For, touching myself, I must needs confess that after much painful churning, this only would come which here we have devised. Mencken, Baltimore, January 1st, 1919 End of Preface. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 1. Part 1. Of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 1. By Way of Introduction. Part 1. THE DIVERGING STREAMS Thomas Jefferson, with his usual prevision, saw clearly, more than a century ago, that the American people, as they increased in numbers and in the diversity of their national interests and racial strains, would make changes in their mother tongue, as they had already made changes in the political institutions of their inheritance. The new circumstances under which we are placed, he wrote to John Waldo from Monticello on August 16, 1813, 
call for new words, new phrases, and for the transfer of old words to new objects. An American dialect will therefore be formed. Nearly a quarter of a century before this, another great American, and one with an expertness in the matter that the too versatile Jefferson could not muster, had ventured upon a prophecy even more bold and specific. He was Noah Webster, then at the beginning of his stormy career as a lexicographer. In his little volume of Dissertations on the English Language, printed in 1789 and dedicated to His Excellency Benjamin Franklin Esquire, LLD, FRS, late President of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Webster argued that the time for regarding English usage and submitting to English authority had already passed, and that a future separation of the American tongue from the English was necessary and unavoidable. Numerous local causes, he continued, such as a new country, new associations of people, new combinations of ideas in arts and sciences, and some intercourse with tribes wholly unknown in Europe, will introduce new words into the American tongue. These causes will produce, in a course of time, a language in North America as different from the future language of England as the modern Dutch, Danish, and Swedish are from the German, or from one another. Neither Jefferson nor Webster put a term upon his prophecy. They may have been thinking one or both of a remote era, not yet come to dawn, or they may have been thinking with the facile imagination of those days of a period even earlier than our own. In the latter case, they allowed far too little, and particularly Webster, for factors that have worked powerfully against the influences they saw so clearly in operation about them. One of these factors, obviously, has been the vast improvement in communications across the ocean, a change scarcely envisioned a century ago. It has brought New York relatively nearer to London today than it was to Boston or even to Philadelphia during Jefferson's presidency, and that greater proximity has produced a steady interchange of ideas, opinions, news, and mere gossip. We latter-day Americans know a great deal more about the everyday affairs of England than the early Americans, for we read more English books, and have more about the English in our newspapers, and meet more Englishmen, and go to England much oftener. The effects of this ceaseless traffic in ideas and impressions so plainly visible in politics, in ethics and aesthetics, and even in the minutia of social intercourse are also to be seen in the language. On the one hand, there is a swift exchange of new inventions on both sides, so that much of our American slang quickly passes to London, and the latest English fashions in pronunciation are almost instantaneously imitated, at least by a minority in New York, and, on the other hand, the English, by so constantly having the floor, force upon us, out of their firmer resolution and certitude, a somewhat sneaking respect for their own greater conservatism of speech, so that our professors of the language, in the overwhelming main, combat all signs of differentiation with the utmost diligence, and safeguard the doctrine that the standards of English are the only reputable standards of American. This doctrine, of course, is not supported by the known laws of language, nor has it prevented the large divergences that we shall presently examine. But all the same it has worked steadily toward a highly artificial formalism, and as steadily against the investigation of the actual national speech. Such grammar, so-called as is taught in our schools and colleges, is a grammar standing four-legged upon the theorizings and false inferences of English Latinists, eager only to break the wild tongue of Shakespeare to a rule, and its frank aim is to create in us a high respect for a book language which few of us ever actually speak, and not many of us even learn to write. That language, heavily artificial though it may be, undoubtedly has notable merits. 
It shows a sonority and a stateliness that you must go to the Latin of the Golden Age to match. Its highly charged and heavy shotted periods, in Matthew Arnold's phrase, serve admirably the obscurantist purposes of American pedagogy and of English parliamentary oratory and leader writing. It is something for the literary artists of both countries to prove their skill upon by flouting it. But to the average American, bent upon expressing his ideas not stupendously, but merely clearly, it must always remain something vague and remote, like Greek history or the properties of a parabola, for he never speaks it or hears it spoken, and seldom encounters it in his everyday reading. If he learns to write it, which is not often, it is with a rather depressing sense of its artificiality. He may master it as a Korean, bred in the colloquial Anmun, may master the literary Korean Chinese, but he never thinks in it or quite feels it. This fact, I dare say, is largely responsible for the notorious failure of our schools to turn out students who can put their ideas into words with simplicity and intelligibility. What their professors try to teach is not their mother tongue at all, but a dialect that stands quite outside their common experience, and into which they have to translate their thoughts consciously and painfully. Bad writing consists in making the attempt and failing through lack of practice. Good writing consists, as in the case of Howells, in deliberately throwing overboard the principles so elaborately inculcated, or, as in the case of Lincoln, in standing unaware of them. Thus the study of the language he is supposed to use to the average American takes on a sort of bilingual character. On the one hand, he is grounded abominably in a grammar and syntax that have always been largely artificial, even in the country where they are supposed to prevail. And on the other hand, he has to pick up the essentials of his actual speech, as best he may. Literary English, says Van Wyck Brooks, with us is a tradition, just as Anglo-Saxon law with us is a tradition. They persist not as the normal expressions of a race, but through prestige and precedent and will and habit of a dominating class, largely out of touch with a national fabric, unconsciously taking form out of school. What thus goes on out of school does not interest the guardians of our linguistic morals. No attempt to deduce the principles of American grammar or even of American syntax from the everyday speech of decently spoken Americans has ever been made. There is no scientific study, general and comprehensive in scope, of the American vocabulary or of the influences lying at the root of American word formation. No American philologist, so far as I know, has ever deigned to give the same sober attention to the sermo plebeus of his country that he habitually gives to the mythical objective case in theoretical English, or to the pronunciation of Latin, or to the irregular verbs in French. End of chapter 1, part 1 Chapter 1, part 2 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 1, Part 2. The Academic Attitude. This neglect of the Vulgate by those professionally trained to investigate it and its disdainful dismissal, when it is considered at all, are among the strangest phenomena of American scholarship. In all other countries, the everyday speech of the people, and even the speech of the illiterate, have the constant attention of philologists, and the laws of their growth and variation are elaborately studied. In France, to name but one agency, there is the Société de Parler de France, 
with its diligent inquiries into changing forms. Moreover, the Academy itself is endlessly concerned with the subject and is at great pains to observe and note every fluctuation in usage. In Germany, amid many other such works, there are the admirable grammars of the spoken speech by Dr. Otto Bremer. In Sweden, there are several journals devoted to the study of the Vulgate, and the government has recently granted a subvention of 7,500 kronen a year to an organization of scholars called the Underskogen of Svenska Formal, formed to investigate it systematically. In Norway, there is a widespread movement to overthrow the official Dano-Norwegian and substitute a national language based upon the speech of the peasants. In Spain, the Academia is constantly at work upon its great Dictionario, Photographica and Grammatica, and revises them at frequent intervals the last time in 1914, taking in all new words as they appear in all new forms of the old ones. And in Latin America, to come nearer to our own case, the native philologists have produced a copious literature on the matter closest at hand, and one finds in it very excellent works upon the Portuguese dialect of Brazil and the variations of Spanish in Mexico, the Argentine, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Uruguay, and even Honduras and Costa Rica. But in the United States, the business has attracted little attention and less talent. The only existing formal treatise upon the subject was written by a Swede trained in Germany and is heavy with errors and omissions. And the only usable dictionary of Americanisms was written in England and is the work of an expatriated lawyer not a single volume by a native philologist familiar with the language by daily contact and professionally equipped for the business is to be found in the meager bibliography i am not forgetting of course the early explorations of noah webster of which much more anon nor the labors of our later dictionary makers nor the inquiries of the american dialect society nor even the occasional illuminations of such writers as Richard Grant White, Thomas S. Lounsbury, and Brander Matthews. But all this preliminary work has left the main field almost uncharted. Webster, as we shall see, was far more a reformer of the American dialect than a student of it, he introduced radical changes into its spelling and pronunciation, but he showed little understanding of its direction and genius. One always sees in him, indeed, the teacher rather than the scientific inquirer. The ardor of his desire to expound and instruct was only matched by his infinite capacity for observing inaccurately and his profound ignorance of elementary philological principle. In the preface to the first edition of his American Dictionary, published in 1828, the verse in which he added the qualifying adjective to the title, he argued eloquently for the right of Americans to shape their own speech without regard to English precedents. But only a year before this, he had told Captain Basil Hall that he knew of but 50 genuine Americanisms, a truly staggering proof of his defective observation. Webster was the first American professional scholar, and despite his frequent engrossment in public concerns and his endless public controversies, there was always something sequestered and almost medieval about him. The American language that he described and argued for was seldom the actual tongue of the folks about him, but sort of a volpuk made up of one part faulty reporting and nine parts academic theorizing. In only one department did he exert any lasting influence, and that was in the department of orthography, 
the fact that our spelling is simpler and usually more logical than the English, we chiefly owe to him. But it is not to be forgotten that the majority of his innovations even here were not adopted, but rejected. Nor is it to be forgotten that spelling is the least of all the factors that shape and condition a language. The same caveat lies against the work of the later makers of dictionaries. They have gone ahead of common usage in the matter of orthography, but they have hung back in the far more important matter of vocabulary, and have neglected the most important matter of idiom altogether. The defect in the work of the dialect society lies in a somewhat similar circumspection of activity. Its constitution, adopted in 1889, says that its object is the investigation of the spoken English of the United States and Canada. But that investigation so far has got little beyond the accumulation of vocabularies of local dialects such as they are. Even in this department, its work is very far from finished, and the dialect dictionary announced years ago has not yet appeared. Until its collections are completed and synchronized, it will be impossible for its members to make any profitable inquiry into the general laws underlaying the development of American, or even to attempt a classification of the materials common to whole speech. The meagerness of the materials accumulated in the five slow-moving volumes of dialect notes shows clearly indeed how little the American philologist is interested in the language that falls upon his ears every hour of the day. And in modern language notes, that impression is reinforced, for its bulky volumes contain exhaustive studies of all the other living languages and dialects, but only an occasional essay upon American. Now add to this the general indifference, a persistent and often violent effort to oppose any formal differentiation of English and American, initiated by English purists, but heartily supported by various Americans, and you come, perhaps, to some understanding of the unsatisfactory state of the literature on the subject. The Pioneer Dictionary of Americanisms, published in 1816 by John Pickering, a Massachusetts lawyer, was not only criticized unkindly, it was roundly denounced as something subtly impertinent and corrupting, and even Noah Webster took a formidable fling at it. Most of the American philologists of the early days Witherspoon, Worcester, Fowler, Cobb, and their like, were uncompromising advocates of conformity, and combated every indication of a national independence in speech with the utmost vigilance. One of their company, true enough, stood out against the rest. He was George Perkins Marsh, and his lectures on the English language, he argued that in point of naked syntactical accuracy, the English of America is not at all inferior to that of England, but even March expressed the hope that Americans would not, without malice, prepense, go about to republicanize our orthography and our syntax, our grammars and our dictionaries, our nursery hymns and our Bibles to the point of actual separation. Moreover, he was a philologist only by courtesy. The regularly ordained schoolmasters were all against him. The fear voiced by William C. Fowler, professor of rhetoric at Amherst, that Americans might break loose from the laws of the English language altogether, was echoed by the whole fraternity. And so the corrective bastinado was laid on. It remained, however, for two professors of a later day to launch the doctrine that the independent growth of American was not only immoral, but a sheer illusion. They were Richard Grant White, for long the leading American writer upon language questions, at least in popular esteem, and Thomas S. Lounsbury, for thirty-five years professor of the English language and literature at the Sheffield Scientific School at Yale. 
and an indefatigable conversationalist. Both men were of the utmost industry in research, and both had wide audiences. White's Words and Their Uses, published in 1872, was a mine of erudition, and his everyday English, following eight years later, was another. True enough, Fitzward Hall, the Anglo-Indian American philologist, disposed of many of his etymologies and otherwise did execution upon him. But in the main his contentions held water. Lounsbury was also an adept and favorite expositor. His attacks upon certain familiar pedantries of the grammarians were penetrating and effective. And his two books, The Standard Usage in English and The Standard Pronunciation in English, not to mention his excellent history of the English language and his numerous magazine articles, showed a profound knowledge of the early development of the language and an admirable spirit of free inquiry. But both of these laborious scholars, when they turned from English proper to American English, displayed an unaccountable desire to deny its existence altogether and to support of that denial they brought a critical method that was anything but unprejudiced. White devoted not less than eight long articles in the Atlantic Monthly to a review of the fourth edition of John Russell Bartlett's American Glossary, and when he came to the end he had disposed of nine-tenths of Bartlett's specimens and called into question the authenticity of at least half of what remained. And no wonder, for his method was simply that of erecting tests, so difficult and so arbitrary, that only the exceptional word or phrase could pass them, and then only by a sort of chance. To stamp a word or a phrase as an Americanism, he said, it is necessary to show that, one, it is of so-called American origin, that is, that it first came into use in the United States of North America, or that, two, it has been adopted in those states from some language other than English, or has been kept in use there, while it has wholly passed out of use in England. Going further, he argued that, unless the simple words in compound names were used in America, in a sense different from that in which they are used in England, the compound itself could not be regarded as an Americanism. The absurdity of all this is apparent when it is remembered that one of his rules would bar out such obvious Americanisms as the use of sick in place of ill, of molasses for trickle, and of fall for autumn. For all of these words, while archaic in England, are by no means wholly extinct, and that another would dispose of that vast category of compounds, which includes some unmistakably characteristic Americanisms as joyride, rake off, showdown, uplift, outhouse, rubberneck, chair warmer, fire eater, and back talk. Lounsbury went even further. In the course of a series of articles in Harper's Magazine in 1913, he laid down the dogma that cultivated speech affords the only legitimate basis of comparison between the language as used in England and in America, and then went on, in the only really proper sense of the term, an Americanism is a word or phrase naturally used by an educated American, under which similar conditions would not be used by an educated Englishman. The emphasis, it will be seen, lies in the word educated. This curious criterion, fantastic as it must have seemed to European philologists, was presently reinforced, for in his fourth article, Lounsbury announced that his discussion was, quote, restricted to the written speech of educated men, end quote. 
The result, of course, was a wholesale slaughter of Americanisms. If it was not impossible to reject a word like white on the ground that some stray English poet or other had once used it, it was almost always possible to reject it on the ground that it was not admitted into the vocabulary of a college professor when he sat down to compose formal book English. What remained was a small company indeed, and almost the whole field of the American idiom and American grammar, so full of interest for the less austere explorer, was closed without even a peek into it. White and Lounsbury dominated the arena and fixed the fashion. The later national experts upon the national language, with a few somewhat timorous exceptions, pass over its peculiarities without noticing them. So far as I can discover, there is not a single treatise in type upon one of its most salient characters, the wide departure of some of its vowel sounds from those of orthodox English. March, C. H. Grangent, and Robert J. Menner have printed a number of valuable essays upon the subject. But there is no work that coordinates their inquiries or that attempts otherwise to cover the field. When, in preparing materials for the following chapters, I sought to determine the history of the A sound in America, I found it necessary to plow through scores of ancient spelling books make deductions perhaps sometimes rather rash from the works of Franklin, Webster, and Cobb. Of late, the National Council of Teachers of English has appointed a committee on American speech and sought to let some light into the matter. But as yet its labors are barely begun, and the publications of its members get little beyond preliminaries. Such an inquiry involves a laboriousness which should have intrigued Lounsbury. He once counted the number of times the word female appears in Vanity Fair, but you will find only a feeble dealing with the question in his book on pronunciation. Nor is there any adequate work, for Schill de Vers is full of errors and omissions, upon the influences felt by American through contact with the language of our millions of immigrants, nor upon our peculiarly rich and characteristic slang. There are several excellent dictionaries of English slang, and many more of French slang, but I have been able to find but one devoted exclusively to American slang, and that one is a very bad one. End of chapter one, part two. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Chapter one, part three of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter one, by way of introduction. Part three. The view of writing men. But though the native Galerton thus neglect the vernacular or even oppose its study, it has been the object of earnest lay attention since an early day, and that attention has borne fruit in a considerable accumulation of materials, if not in any very accurate working out of its origins and principles. The English, too, have given attention to it often, alas, satirically or even indignantly. For a long while, as we shall see, they sought to stem its differentiation by heavy denunciations of its vagaries, and so late as the period of the Civil War they attached to it that quality of abhorrent barbarism which they saw as the chief mark of the American people. But in later years they have viewed it with a greater showing of scientific calm, and its definite separation from correct English, at least as a spoken tongue, is now quite frankly admitted. The Cambridge History of English Literature, for example, says that English and American are now notably dissimilar in vocabulary, and that the latter is splitting off into a distinct dialect. 
The eleventh edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, going further, says that the two languages are already so far apart that it is not uncommon to meet with American newspaper articles of which an untraveled Englishman would hardly be able to understand a sentence. A great many other academic authorities, including A. H. Sace and H. W. and F. G. Fowler, bear testimony to the same effect. On turning to the men actually engaged in writing English, and particularly to those aspiring to an American audience, one finds nearly all of them adverting, at some point or other, to the growing difficulties of intercommunication. William Archer, Arnold Bennett, H. G. Wells, Sidney Lowe, the Chestertons, and Kipling are some of those who have dealt with the matter at length. Lowe, in an article in the Westminster Gazette, ironically headed, ought American to be taught in our schools, has described how the latter-day British businessman is puzzled by his ignorance of colloquial American, and painfully hampered thereby in his handling of American trade. He continues, In the United States of North America, the study of the English tongue forms part of the educational scheme. I gather this because I find that they have professors of the English language and literature in the universities there, and I note that in the schools there are certain hours allotted for English under instructors who specialize in that subject. This is quite right. English is still far from being a dead language, and our American kinsfolk are good enough to appreciate the fact. But I think we should return the compliment. We ought to learn the American language in our schools and colleges. At present it is strangely neglected by the educational authorities. They pay attention to linguistic attainments of many other kinds, but not to this. How many thousands of youths are at this moment engaged in puzzling their brains over Latin and Greek grammar only Whitehall knows? Every well-conducted seminary has some instructor who is under the delusion that he is teaching English boys and girls to speak French with a good Parisian accent. We teach German, Italian, even Spanish, Russian, modern Greek, Arabic, Hindustani. For a moderate fee you can acquire a passing acquaintance with any of these tongues at the Berlitz Institute and the Gouin schools. But even in these polyglot establishments there is nobody to teach you American. I have never seen a grammar of it or a dictionary. I have searched in vain at the booksellers for how to learn American in three weeks or some similar compendium. Nothing of the sort exists. The native speech of one hundred millions of civilized people is as grossly neglected by the publishers as it is by the schoolmasters. You can find means to learn Hausa or Swahili or Cape Dutch in London more easily than the expressive, if difficult, tongue which is spoken in the office, the bar-room, the tram-car, from the snows of Alaska to the mouths of the Mississippi, and is enshrined in a literature that is growing in volume and favor every day. Lowe then quotes an extract from an American novel appearing serially in an English magazine, an extract including such Americanisms as Side Stepper, Salt Water Taffy, Prince Albert, Coat, Boob, Bartender, and Kidding, and many characteristically American extravagances of metaphor. It might be well argued, he goes on, that this strange dialect is as near to the tongue that Shakespeare spoke as the dialect of Bayswater or Brixton, but that philological fact does not help to its understanding. You might almost as well expect him, the British businessman, to converse freely with a Portuguese railway porter because he tried to stumble through Caesar when he was in the upper fourth at school. In the London Daily Mail, W. G. Faulkner lately launched this proposed campaign of education by undertaking to explain various terms appearing in American moving pictures to English spectators. Mr. Faulkner assumed that most of his readers would understand sombrero, sidewalk, candy store, freight car, boost, elevator, boss, crook, and fall for autumn, without help, but he found it necessary to define such commonplace Americanisms as hoodlum, hobo, bunco-steerer, rubberneck, drummer, sucker, 
dive in the sense of a thieves resort clean up graft and to feature curiously enough he proved the reality of the difficulties he essayed to level by falling into error as to the meanings of some of the terms he listed among them deadbeat flume dub and stag another english expositor apparently following him thought it necessary to add definitions of hold up quitter rube shack road agent cinch live wire and scab but he too mistook the meaning of deadbeat and in addition he misdefined bandwagon and substituted get out seemingly an invention of his own for getaway footnote of the words cited as still unfamiliar in england thornton has traced hobo to eighteen ninety one hold up and bunco to eighteen eighty seven dive to eighteen eighty two deadbeat to 1877, hoodlum to 1872, road agent to 1866, stag to 1856, drummer to 1836, and flume to 1792. All of them are probably older than these references indicate. End of footnote. Faulkner, somewhat belated in his animosity, seized the opportunity to read a homily upon the vulgarity and extravagance of the American language, and argued that the introduction of its coinages through the moving picture theater, anglais cinema, cannot be regarded without serious misgivings if only because it generates and encourages mental indiscipline so far as the choice of expressions is concerned. In other words, the greater pliability and resourcefulness of American is a fault to be corrected by the English tendency to hold to that which is established. Cecil Chesterton, in The New Witness, recently called attention to the increasing difficulty of intercommunication, not only verbally but in writing. The American newspapers, he said, even the best of them, admit more and more locutions that puzzle and dismay an English reader. After quoting a characteristic headline, he went on. I defy any ordinary Englishman to say that that is the English language, or that he can find any intelligible meaning in it. Even a dictionary will be of no use to him. He must know the language colloquially or not at all. No doubt it is easier for an Englishman to understand American than it would be for a Frenchman to do the same, just as it is easier for a German to understand Dutch than it would be for a Spaniard. But it does not make the American language identical with the English. Chesterton, however, refrained from denouncing this lack of identity. On the contrary, he allowed certain merits to American. I do not want anybody to suppose, he said, that the American language is in any way inferior to ours. In some ways it has improved upon it in vigor and raciness. In other ways it adheres more closely to the English of the best period. Testimony to the same end was furnished before this by William Archer. New words, he said, are begotten by new conditions of life, and as American life is far more fertile of new conditions than ours, the tendency toward neologism cannot but be stronger in America than in England. America has enormously enriched the language, not only with new words, but, since the American mind is on the whole quicker and wittier than the English, with apt and luminous colloquial metaphors. The list of such quotations might be indefinitely prolonged. There is scarcely an English book upon the United States which does not offer some discussion, more or less profound, of American peculiarities of speech, both as they are revealed in spoken discourse, particularly pronunciation and intonation, and as they show themselves in popular literature and in the newspapers, and to this discussion protest is often added, as it very often is by the reviews and newspapers. The Americans, says a typical critic, have so far progressed with their self-appointed task of creating an American language that much of their conversation is now incomprehensible to English people. 
on our own side there is almost equal evidence of a sense of difference despite the fact that the educated american is presumably trained in orthodox english and can at least read it without much feeling of strangeness the american says george aid in his book of travel in pastures new must go to england in order to learn for a dead certainty that he does not speak the english language this pitiful fact comes home to every american when he arrives in london that there are two languages the english and the american one is correct the other is incorrect one is a pure and limpid stream the other is a stagnant pool swarming with bacilli this was written in nineteen hundred and six twenty-five years earlier mark twain had made the same observation when i speak my native tongue in its utmost purity in england he said an englishman can't understand me at all the languages continued mark were identical several generations ago but our changed conditions and the spread of our people far to the south and far to the west have made many alterations in our pronunciation and have introduced new words among us and changed the meanings of old ones even before this the great humorist had marked and hailed these differences already in roughing it he was celebrating the vigorous new vernacular of the occidental plains and mountains and in all his writings even the most serious he deliberately engrafted its greater liberty and more fluent idiom upon the stem of english and so lent the dignity of his high achievement to a dialect that was as unmistakably american as the point of view underlying it the same tendency is plainly visible in william dean howells his novels are mines of american idiom and his style shows an undeniable revolt against the trammels of english grammarians in eighteen eighty six he made a plea in harper's for a concerted effort to put american on its own legs if we bother ourselves he said to write what the critics imagine to be english we shall be priggish and artificial and still more so if we make our americans talk english on our lips our continental english will differ more and more from the insular english and we believe that this is not deplorable but desirable howells then proceeded to discuss the nature of the difference and described it accurately as determined by the greater rigidity and formality of the english of modern england in american he said there was to be seen that easy looseness of phrase and gait which characterized the english of the elizabethan era and particularly the elizabethan hospitality to changed meanings and bold metaphors american he argued made new words much faster than english and they were in the main words of much greater daring and savor the difference between the two tongues thus noted by the writers of both was made disconcertingly apparent to the american troops when they first got to france and came into contact with the english fraternizing was made difficult by the wide divergence in vocabulary and pronunciation a divergence interpreted by each side as a sign of uncouthness the y m c a made a characteristic effort to turn the resultant feeling of strangeness and homesickness among the americans to account in the chicago tribune's paris edition of july seventh nineteen seventeen i find a large advertisement inviting them to make use of the y m c a clubhouse in the avenue montaigu where american is spoken earlier in the war the illinoiser staats zeitung no doubt seeking to keep the sense of difference alive advertised that it would publish articles daily in the american language end of chapter one part three chapter one part four of the american language this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce peary the american language by h l mencken chapter one by way of introduction part four foreign observers 
what english and american laymen have thus observed has not escaped the notice of continental philologists the first edition of bartlett published in eighteen forty eight brought forth a long and critical review in the archiv für das studium der neueren sprachen und literaturen by professor felix flugel and in the successive volumes of the archive down to our own day there have been many valuable essays upon americanisms by such men as herrig kuhler and kuppel various dutch philologists among them barentz kaiser and van der Voort, have also discussed the subject and a work in french has been published by g a barringer that even to the lay continental american and english now differ considerably is demonstrated by the fact that many of the popular german sprachfuhrer appear in separate editions americanisch and english this is true of the metulle sprachfuhrer published by professor f lannenscheidt and of the polyglot kunst books the american edition of the latter starts off with the doctrine that jeder der nach nordamerika oder australien will muss englisch können but a great many of the words and phrases that appear in its examples would be unintelligible to many englishmen for example free lunch real estate agent buckwheat corn for maize conductor popcorn and drugstore and a number of others would suggest false meanings or otherwise puzzle for example napkin saloon wash stand water pitcher and apple pie footnote like the english expositors of american slang this german falls into several errors for example he gives cock for rooster boots for shoes braces for suspenders and postman for letter carrier and lists ironmonger joiner and linen draper as american terms he also spells wagon in the english manner with two g's and translates schweinefusse as pork feet but he spells such words as color in the american manner and gives the pronunciation of clerk as the american clerk not as the english clerk End of footnote. to these pedagogical examples must be added that of baidecker of guidebook celebrity in his guidebook to the united states prepared for englishmen he is at pains to explain the meaning of various american words and phrases a philologist of scandinavian extraction elias moly has gone so far as to argue that the acquisition of correct english to a people grown so mongrel in blood as the americans has become a useless burden in place of it he proposes a mixed tongue based on english but admitting various elements from the other germanic languages his grammar however is so much more complex than that of english that most americans would probably find his artificial american very difficult of acquirement at all events it has made no progress footnote moly's notions are set forth in plea for an american language chicago 1888 and teutonish chicago 1902 he announced the preparation of a dictionary of the american language in 1888 but so far as i know it has not been published he was born in wisconsin of norwegian parents in 1845 and pursued linguistic studies at the university of wisconsin where he seems to have taken a phb end of footnote end of chapter one part four chapter one part five of the american language this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devora allen the american language by h l mencken chapter one by way of introduction part five the characters of american the characters chiefly noted in american speech by all who have discussed it are first its general uniformity throughout the country so that dialects properly speaking are confined to recent immigrants to the native whites of a few isolated areas and to the negroes of the south and secondly its impatient disdain of rule and precedent and hence its large capacity distinctly greater than that of the english of england 
for taking in new words and phrases and for manufacturing new locutions out of its own materials. The first of these characters has struck every observer, native and foreign. In place of the local dialects of other countries, we have a general Volkssprache for the whole nation. And if it is conditioned at all, it is only by minor differences in pronunciation and by the linguistic struggles of various groups of newcomers. The speech of the United States, said Gilbert M. Tucker, is quite unlike that of Great Britain, in the important particular that here we have no dialects. We all, said Mr. Taft during his presidency, speak the same language and have the same ideas. Manners, morals, and political views, said the New York World, commenting upon this dictum, have all undergone a standardization which is one of the remarkable aspects of American evolution. Perhaps it is in the uniformity of language that this development has been most noteworthy. Outside of the Tennessee Mountains and the back country of New England, there is no true dialect. While we have, or have had, single counties as large as Great Britain, says another American observer, and in some of our states England could be lost, there is practically no difference between the American spoken in our 4,039,000 square miles of territory, except as spoken by foreigners. We, assembled here, would be perfectly understood by delegates from Texas, Maine, Minnesota, Louisiana, or Alaska, or from whatever walk of life they might come. We can go to any of the 75,000 post offices in this country and be entirely sure we will be understood, whether we want to buy a stamp or borrow a match. From Portland, Maine, to Portland, Oregon, agrees an English critic, no trace of a distinct dialect is to be found. The man from Maine, even though he may be of inferior education and limited capacity, can completely understand the man from Oregon. No other country can show such linguistic solidarity, nor any approach to it, not even Canada, for there a large part of the population resists learning English altogether. The little Russian of the Ukraine is unintelligible to the citizen of Petrograd. The northern Italian can scarcely follow a conversation in Sicilian. The low German from Hamburg is a foreigner in Munich. The Breton flounders in Gascony. Even in the United Kingdom there are wide divergences. When we remember, says the New International Encyclopedia, that the dialects of the counties in England have marked differences, so marked indeed, that it may be doubted whether a Lancashire miner and a Lincolnshire farmer could understand each other. We may well be proud that our vast country has, strictly speaking, only one language. This uniformity was noted by the earliest observers. Pickering called attention to it in the preface to his vocabulary, and ascribed it, no doubt accurately, to the restlessness of the Americans, their inheritance of the immigrant spirit, the frequent removals of people from one part of our country to another. It is especially marked in vocabulary and grammatical forms, the foundation stones of a living speech. There may be slight differences in pronunciation and intonation, a southern softness, a Yankee drawl, a western burr, but in the words they use and the way they use them, all Americans, even the least tutored, follow the same line. One observes, of course, a polite speech and a common speech, but the common speech is everywhere the same and its uniform vagaries take the place of the dialectic variations of other lands. A Boston streetcar conductor could go to work in Chicago, San Francisco, or New Orleans without running the slightest risk of misunderstanding his new fares. Once he had picked up half a dozen localisms, he would be, to all linguistic intents and purposes, fully naturalized. Of the intrinsic differences that separate American from English, the chief have their roots in the obvious disparity between the environment and traditions of the American people since the 17th century and those of the English. The latter have lived under a stable social order, and it has impressed upon their souls their characteristic respect for what is customary and of good report. Until the war brought chaos to their institutions, their whole lives were regulated, perhaps more than those of any other people save the Spaniards, by a regard for precedent. The Americans, though largely of the same blood, have felt no such restraint, and acquired no such habit of conformity. On the contrary, they have plunged to the other extreme, for the conditions of life in their new country have put a high value upon the precisely opposite qualities of curiosity and daring, and so they have acquired that character of restlessness, that impatience of forms, that disdain of the dead hand which now broadly marks them. From the first, says a recent literary historian, they have been less phlegmatic, less conservative than the English. There were climatic influences, it may be, 
there was surely a spirit of intensity everywhere that made for short effort. Thus in the arts, and thus in business, in politics, in daily intercourse, in habits of mind and speech. The American is not, in truth, lacking in a capacity for discipline. He has it highly developed. He submits to leadership readily, and even to tyranny. But by a curious twist, it is not the leadership that is old and decorous that fetches him, but the leadership that is new and extravagant. He will resist dictation out of the past, but he will follow a new messiah with almost Russian willingness, and into the wildest vagaries of economics, religion, morals, and speech. A new fallacy in politics spreads faster in the United States than anywhere else on earth, and so does a new fashion in hats, or a new revelation of God, or a new means of killing time, or a new metaphor or piece of slang. Thus the American, on his linguistic side, likes to make his language as he goes along, and not all the hard work of his grammar teachers can hold the business back. A novelty loses nothing by the fact that it is a novelty. It rather gains something, and particularly if it meet the national fancy for the terse, the vivid, and above all the bold and imaginative. The characteristic American habit of reducing complex concepts to the starkest abbreviations was already noticeable in colonial times, and such highly typical Americanisms as OK, NG, and PDQ have been traced back to the first days of the Republic. Nor are the influences that shape these early tendencies invisible today, for the country is still in process of growth, and no settled social order has yet descended upon it. Institution-making is still going on, and so is language-making. In so modest an operation as that which has evolved bunco from buncombe and bunk from bunco, there is evidence of a phenomenon which the philologist recognizes as belonging to the most primitive and lusty stages of speech. The American Vulgate is not only constantly making new words, it is also deducing roots from them, and so giving proof, as Professor Sace says, that the creative powers of language are even now not extinct. But of more importance than its sheer inventions, if only because much more numerous, are its extensions of the vocabulary, both absolutely and in ready workableness, by the devices of rhetoric. The American, from the beginning, has been the most ardent of recorded rhetoricians. His politics bristles with pungent epithets. His whole history has been bedizened with tall talk. His fundamental institutions rest as much upon brilliant phrases as upon logical ideas. And in small things, as in large, he exercises continually an incomparable capacity for projecting hidden and often fantastic relationships into arresting parts of speech. Such a term as rubberneck is almost a complete treatise on American psychology. It reveals the national habit of mind more clearly than any labored inquiry could ever reveal it. It has in it precisely the boldness and disdain of ordered forms that are so characteristically American. And it has, too, the grotesque humor of the country, and the delight in devastating opprobriums, and the acute feeling for the succinct and savory. The same qualities are in Rough House, Water Wagon, Near Silk, Has Been, Lame Duck, and a thousand other such racy substantives, and in all the great stock of native verbs and adjectives. There is indeed but a shadowy boundary in these new coinages between various parts of speech. Corral, borrowed from the Spanish, immediately becomes a verb and the father of an adjective. Bust, carved out of burst, erects itself into a noun. Bum, coming by way of an earlier bummer from the German bummler, becomes noun, adjective, verb, and adverb. Verbs are fashioned out of substantives by the simple process of prefixing the preposition to engineer, to chink, to stump, to hog. Others grow out of an intermediate adjective, as to boom. Others are made by torturing nouns with harsh affixes, as to burglarize and to itemize, or by groping for the root, as to resurrect. Yet others are changed from intransitive to transitive. A sleeping car sleeps thirty passengers. So with the adjectives. They are made of substantives unchanged, codfish, jitney, or by bold combinations, down and out, upstate, flat-footed, or by shading down suffixes to a barbaric simplicity, scary, classy, tasty, or by working over adverbs until they tremble on the brink between adverb and adjective. Right and near are examples. All of these processes, of course, are also to be observed in the English of England, 
In the days of its great Elizabethan growth, they were in the lustiest possible being. They are indeed common to all languages. They keep language alive. But if you will put the English of today beside the American of today, you will see at once how much more forcibly they are in operation in the latter than in the former. English has been arrested in its growth by its purists and grammarians. It shows no living change in structure and syntax since the days of Anne, and very little modification in either pronunciation or vocabulary. Its tendency is to conserve that which is established, to say the new thing as nearly as possible in the old way, to combat all that expansive gusto which made for its pliancy and resilience in the days of Shakespeare. In place of the old loose-footedness, there is set up a preciosity which, in one direction, takes the form of unyielding affectations in the spoken language, and in another form shows itself in the heavy Johnsonese of current English writing. The jargon denounced by Sir Arthur Quiller Couch in his Cambridge lectures. This infirmity of speech, Quiller Couch finds in parliamentary debates and in the newspapers. It has become the medium through which boards of government, county councils, syndicates, committees, commercial firms, express the processes as well as the conclusions of their thought, and so voice the reason of their being. Distinct from journalese, the two yet overlap, and have a knack of assimilating each other's vices. American, despite the gallant efforts of the professors, has so far escaped any such suffocating formalization. We, too, have our occasional practitioners of the authentic English jargon. In the late Grover Cleveland, we produced an acknowledged master of it. But in the main, our faults in writing lie in precisely the opposite direction. That is to say, we incline toward a directness of statement which, at its greatest, lacks restraint and urbanity altogether, and toward a hospitality which often admits novelties for the mere sake of their novelty, and is quite uncritical of the difference between a genuine improvement in succinctness and clarity and mere extravagant raciness. The tendency, says one English observer, is to consider the speech of any man, as any man himself, as good as any other. All beauty and distinction, says another, are ruthlessly sacrificed to force, Moreover, this strong revolt against conventional bonds is by no means confined to the folk speech, nor even to the loose conversational English of the upper classes. It also gets into more studied discourse, both spoken and written. I glance through the speeches of Dr. Woodrow Wilson, surely a purist if we have one at all, and find in a few moments half a dozen locutions that an Englishman in like position would never dream of using. Among them, we must get a move on. Hog as a verb, gumshoe as an adjective with verbal overtones, honorary in place of ordinary, and that is going some. From the earliest days, indeed, English critics have found this gypsy tendency in our most careful writing. They denounced it in Marshall, Cooper, Mark Twain, Poe, Lossing, Lowell, and Holmes, and even in Hawthorne and Thoreau. And it was no less academic a work than W. C. Brownell's French Traits, which brought forth, in a London literary journal, the dictum that the language most depressing to the cultured Englishman is the language of the cultured American. Even educated American English, agrees the chief of modern English grammarians, is now almost entirely independent of British influence, and differs from it considerably, though as yet not enough to make the two dialects, American English and British English, mutually unintelligible. American thus shows its character in a constant experimentation, a wide hospitality to novelty, a steady reaching out for new and vivid forms. No other tongue of modern times admits foreign words and phrases more readily. None is more careless of precedence. None shows a greater fecundity and originality of fancy. It is producing new words every day, by trope, by agglutination, by the shedding of inflections, by the merging of parts of speech and by sheer brilliance of imagination. It is full of what Bret Hart called the sabre cuts of Saxon. It meets Montaigne's ideal of a succulent and nervous speech, short and compact, not as much delicated and combed out as vehement and brusque, rather arbitrary than monotonous, not pedantic but soldierly, as Suetonius called Caesar's Latin. One pictures the common materials of English dumped into a pot, exotic flavorings added, and the bubblings assiduously and expectantly skimmed. 
What is old and respected is already in decay the moment it comes into contact with what is new and vivid. Let American confront a novel problem alongside English, and immediately its superior imaginativeness and resourcefulness become obvious. Movie is better than cinema. It is not only better American, it is better English. Billboard is better than hoarding. Office holder is more honest, more picturesque, more thoroughly Anglo-Saxon than public servant. Stem winder somehow has more life in it, more fancy and vividness than the literal keyless watch. Turn to the terminology of railroading, itself, by the way, an Americanism. Its creation fell upon the two peoples equally, but they tackled the job independently. The English, seeking a figure to denominate the wedge-shaped fender in front of a locomotive, called it a plow. The Americans, characteristically, gave it the far more pungent name of cowcatcher. So with the casting where two rails join. The English called it a crossing plate. The Americans, more responsive to the suggestion in its shape, called it a frog. This boldness of conceit, of course, makes for vulgarity. Unrestrained by any critical sense, and the critical sense of the professors counts for little, for they cry wolf too often. It flowers in such barbaric inventions as tasty, all right, no account, pants, go aheadativeness, tony, semi occasional, to fellowship, and to doxologize. Let it be admitted, American is not infrequently vulgar. The Americans too are vulgar. Bayard Taylor called them Anglo Saxons relapsed into semi barbarism. America itself is unutterably vulgar. But vulgarity, after all, means no more than a yielding to natural impulses in the face of conventional inhibitions, and that yielding to natural impulses is at the heart of all healthy language-making. The history of English, like the history of American and every other living tongue, is a history of vulgarisms that, by their accurate meeting of real needs, have forced their way into sound usage and even into the lifeless catalogues of the grammarians. The colonial pedants denounced to advocate as bitterly as they ever denounced to compromit or to happify, and all the English authorities gave them aid. But it forced itself into the American language despite them, and today it is even accepted as English and has got into the Oxford Dictionary. To donate, so late as 1870, was dismissed by Richard Grant White as ignorant and abominable and to this day the English will have none of it. But there is not an American dictionary that doesn't accept it, and surely no American writer would hesitate to use it. Footnote. Despite this fact, an academic and ineffective opposition to it still goes on. On the style sheet of the Century magazine, it is listed among the words and phrases to be avoided. It was prohibited by the famous Index Expurgatorius, prepared by William Cullen Bryant, for the New York Evening Post and his prohibition is still theoretically in force, but the word is now actually permitted by the Post. The Chicago Daily News style book, dated July 1, 1908, also bans it. End of footnote. Reliable, gubernatorial, standpoint, and scientist have survived opposition of equal ferocity. The last named was coined by William Hewell, an Englishman, in 1840, but was first adopted in America. Despite the fact that Fitz Edward Hall and other eminent philologists used it and defended it, it aroused almost incredible opposition in England. So recently as 1890, it was denounced by the London Daily News as an ignoble Americanism, and according to William Archer, it was finally accepted by the English only at the point of the bayonet. Footnote. Scientist is now in the Oxford Dictionary. So are reliable, standpoint, and gubernatorial. But the Century Magazine still bans standpoint, and the Evening Post, at least in theory, bans both standpoint and reliable. The Chicago Daily News accepts standpoint, but bans reliable and gubernatorial. All of these words, of course, are now quite as good as ox or and. End of footnote. The purist performs a useful office in enforcing a certain logical regularity upon the process, and in our own case, the omnipresent example of the greater conservatism of the English corrects our native tendency to go too fast. But the process itself is as inexorable in its workings as the procession of the equinoxes. And if we yield to it more eagerly than the English, 
it is only a proof, perhaps, that the future of what was once the Anglo-Saxon tongue lies on this side of the water. The story of English grammar, says Morrison, is a story of simplification, of dispensing with grammatical forms, and of the most copious and persistent enlargement of vocabulary and mutation of idiom ever recorded, perhaps, by descriptive philology. English now has the brakes on, but American continues to leap in the dark, and the prodigality of its movement is all the indication that is needed of its intrinsic health, its capacity to meet the ever-changing needs of a restless and iconoclastic people, constantly fluent in racial composition and disdainful of hampering traditions. Language, says Sace, is no artificial product, contained in books and dictionaries, and governed by the strict rules of impersonal grammarians. It is the living expression of the mind and spirit of a people, ever-changing and shifting, whose sole standard of correctness is custom and the common usage of the community. The first lesson to be learned is that there is no intrinsic right or wrong in the use of language, no fixed rules such as are the delight of the teacher of Latin prose. What is right now will be wrong hereafter. What language rejected yesterday, she accepts today. End of chapter 1, part 5 Chapter 1, Part 6 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 1, By Way of Introduction Part 6, The Materials of American one familiar with the habits of pedagogues need not be told that, in their grudging discussions of American, they have spent most of their energies upon vain attempts to classify its materials. White and Lonesbury, as I have shown, carried the business to the limits of the preposterous. When they had finished identifying and cataloguing Americanisms, there were no more Americanisms left to study. The ladies and gentlemen of the American Dialect Society though praiseworthy for their somewhat deliberate industry, fall into a similar fault, for they are so eager to establish minute dialectic variations that they forget the general language almost altogether. Among investigators of less learning, there is a more spacious view of the problem, and the labored categories of White and Lonesbury are much extended. Pickering, the first to attempt a list of Americanisms, rehearsed their origin under the following headings. 1. We have formed some new words. 2. To some old ones, that are still in use in England, we have affixed new significations. 3. Others, which have long been obsolete in England, are still retained in common use among us. Bartlett, in the second edition of his dictionary, dated 1859, increased these classes to 9. 1. Archaisms, that is, Old English words, obsolete or nearly so in England, but retained in use in this country. 2. English words used in a different sense from what they are in England. These include many names of natural objects differently applied. 3. Words which have retained their original meaning in the United States, though not in England. 4. English provincialisms adopted into general use in America. 5. Newly coined words, which owe their origin to the productions or to the circumstances of the country. 6. Words borrowed from European languages, especially the French, Spanish, Dutch, and German. 7. Indian words. 8. Negroisms. 9. Peculiarities of pronunciation. Some time before this, but after the publication of Bartlett's first edition in 1848, William C. Fowler, professor of rhetoric at Amherst, devoted a brief chapter to American dialects in his well-known work on English, and in it one finds the following formidable classification of Americanisms. 1. Words borrowed from other languages. a. Indian, as Kennebec, Ohio, Tombigbee, Sagamore, Quahog, Succotash. b. Dutch, as Boss, Kruller, Stoop. C. German, as spook, S-P-U-K-E, sauerkraut. D. French, as bayou, cache, C-A-C-H-E, shoot, C-H-U-T-E, 
Crevasse, Levy. E. Spanish, as Calaboose, Chaparral, Hacienda, Rancho, Ranchero. F. Negro, as Buckra. 2. Words introduced from the necessity of our situation in order to express new ideas. A. Words connected with and flowing from our political institutions, as selectman, presidential, congressional, caucus, mass meeting, lynch law, help for servants. B. Words connected with our ecclesiastical institutions, as associational, consociational, to fellowship, to missionate. C. Words connected with a new country, as lot, diggings, betterments, squatter. 3. Miscellaneous Americanisms a. Words and phrases become obsolete in England, as talented, offset, for set off, back and forth, for backward and forward. b. Old words and phrases, which are now merely provincial in England, as hub, wap, to wilt. c. Nouns formed from verbs by adding the French suffix meant, as publishment, releasement, requirement. d. Forms of words which fill the gap or vacancy between two words which are approved, as obligate, between oblige and obligation, and variate, between vary and variation. e. Certain compound terms for which the English have different compounds as bank bill for bank note, bookstore for bookseller's shop, bottom land for interval land, clapboard for pail, seaboard for seashore, side hill for hillside. F. Certain colloquial phrases, apparently idiomatic and very expressive, as to cave in, to flare up, to flunk out, to fork over, to hold on, to let on, to stave off, to take on. G. Intensives, often a matter of mere temporary fashion, as dreadful, mighty, plaguy, powerful. H. Certain verbs expressing one's state of mind, but partially or timidly, as to allot upon, for to count upon, to calculate, to expect, to think or believe, to guess, to reckon, I. Certain adjectives expressing not only quality, but one's subjective feelings in regard to it, as clever, grand, green, likely, smart, ugly. J. Abridgments, as stage for stagecoach, turnpike for turnpike road, spry for sprightly, to conduct for to conduct oneself. K. Quaint or burlesque terms, as to tote, to yank, humbug, loafer, muss, plunder, for baggage, rock, for stone. L. Low expressions, mostly political, as slangwanger, loco foco, hunker, to get the hang of. M. Ungrammatical expressions, disapproved by all, as do don't. Used to could, can't come it, universal preacher, for universalist, there's no two ways about it. Elwin, in 1859, attempted no classification. He confined his glossary to archaic English words surviving in America, and sought only to prove that they had come down from our remotest ancestry, and were thus undeserving of the reviling lavished upon them by English critics. Shell de Vere, in 1872, followed Bartlett, and devoted himself largely to words borrowed from the Indian dialects, and from the French, Spanish, and Dutch. But Farmer, in 1889, ventured upon a new classification, prefacing it with the following definition. An Americanism may be defined as a word or phrase, old or new, employed by general or respectable usage in America, in a way not sanctioned by the best standards of the English language. As a matter of fact, however, the term has come to possess a wider meaning, and it is now applied not only to words and phrases which can be so described, but also to the new and legitimately born words 
adapted to the general needs and usages, to the survivals of an older form of English than that now current in the mother country, and to the racy, pungent vernacular of Western life. He then proceeded to classify his materials thus. 1. Words and phrases of purely American derivation, embracing words originating in a. Indian and Aboriginal life, b. Pioneer and frontier life, c. The church, d. Politics, e. Trades of all kinds, f. Travel, afloat and ashore. 2. Words brought by colonists, including a. The German element, b. The French, c. The Spanish, d. The Dutch, e. The Negro, f. The Chinese. 3. Names of American things, embracing a. Natural products, b. Manufactured articles. 4. Perverted English words. 5. Obsolete English words still in good use in America. 6. English words American by inflection and modification. 7. Odd and ignorant popular phrases, proverbs, vulgarisms, and colloquialisms, cant and slang. 8. Individualisms. 9. Doubtful and miscellaneous. Clappen, in 1902, reduced these categories to four. 1. Genuine English words, obsolete or provincial in England, and universally used in the United States. 2. English words conveying in the United States a different meaning from that attached to them in England. 3. Words introduced from other languages than the English. French, Dutch, Spanish, German, Indian, etc. 4. Americanisms proper, that is, words coined in the country, either representing some new idea or peculiar product. Thornton, in 1912, substituted the following. 1. Forms of speech, now obsolete or provincial in England, which survive in the United States, such as allow, bureau, fall, gotten, Guess, likely, professor, shote. 2. Words and phrases of distinctly American origin, such as belittle, lengthy, lightning rod, to darken one's doors, to bark up the wrong tree, to come out at the little end of the horn, blind tiger, cold snap, gay Quaker, gone coon, long sauce, pay dirt, small potatoes, some pumpkins. 3. Nouns which indicate quadrupeds, birds, trees, articles of food, etc., that are distinctively American, such as groundhog, hangbird, hominy, live oak, locust, opossum, persimmon, pone, succotash, wampum, wigwam. 4. Names of persons and classes of persons and of places, such as buckeye, cracker, greaser, hoosier, old bullion, old hickory, the Little Giant, Dixie, Gotham, The Bay State, The Monumental City. 5. Words which have assumed a new meaning, such as card, clever, fork, help, penny, plunder, raise, rock, sack, ticket, windfall. In addition, Thornton added a provisional class of words and phrases of which I have found earlier examples in American than in English writers, with the caveat that further research may reverse the claim. A class offering specimens in alarmist, capitalize, eruptiveness, horse of another color, the jigs up, nameable, omnibus bill, propaganda, and whitewash. No more than a brief glance at these classifications is needed to show that they hamper the inquiry by limiting its scope. Not so much to be sure as the ridiculous limitations of White and Lounsbury, but still very seriously. They meet the ends of purely descriptive lexicography, but largely leave out of account some of the most salient characters of a living language, for example, pronunciation and idiom. Only Bartlett and Farmer establish a separate category of Americanisms produced by changes in pronunciation, though even Thornton, of course, is obliged to take notice of such forms as bust and bile. None of them, however, goes into the matter at any length, nor even into the matter of etymology. Bartlett's etymologies are scanty and often inaccurate. 
Shell de Viers are sometimes quite fanciful. Thornton offers scarcely any at all. The best of these collections of Americanisms, and by long odds, is Thornton's. It presents an enormous mass of quotations, and they are all very carefully dated, and it corrects most of the more obvious errors in the work of earlier inquirers. But its very dependence upon quotations limits it chiefly to the written language, and so the enormously richer materials of the spoken language are passed over, and particularly the materials evolved during the past twenty years. One searches the two fat volumes in vain for such highly characteristic forms as would of, near accident, and budinsky, the use of sure as an adverb, and the employment of well as a sort of general equivalent of the German also. These grammatical and syntactical tendencies are beyond the scope of Thornton's investigation, but it is plain that they must be prime concerns of any future student who essays to get at the inner spirit of the language. Its difference from standard English is not merely a difference in vocabulary, to be disposed of in an alphabetical list. It is, above all, a difference in pronunciation, in intonation, in conjugation and declension, in metaphor and idiom, in the whole fashion of using words. A page from one of Ring W. Lardner's baseball stories contains few words that are not in the English vocabulary, and yet the thoroughly American color of it cannot fail to escape anyone who actually listens to the tongue spoken around him. Some of the elements which enter into that color will be considered in the following pages. The American vocabulary, of course, must be given first attention, for in it the earliest American divergences are embalmed, and it tends to grow richer and freer year after year. But attention will also be paid to materials and ways of speech that are less obvious, and in particular to certain definite tendencies of the grammar of spoken American, hitherto wholly neglected. End of chapter 1, part 6 Chapter 2, part 1 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 2 The Beginnings of American Part 1 In Colonial Days William Gifford, the first editor of the Quarterly Review, is authority for the tale that some of the Puritan clergy of New England, during the Revolution, proposed that English be formally abandoned as the national language of America, and Hebrew adopted in its place. An American chronicler, Charles Astor Bristed, makes the proposed tongue Greek, and reports that the change was rejected on the ground that it would be more convenient for us to keep the language as it is, and make the English speak Greek. The story, though it has the support of the editors of the Cambridge History of American Literature, has an apocryphal smack. One suspects that the savagely anti-American Gifford invented it. But, true or false, it well indicates the temper of those times. The passion for complete political independence of England bred a general hostility to all English authority whatever its character, and that hostility in the direction of present concern to us culminated in the revolutionary attitude of Noah Webster's Dissertations on the English Language, printed in 1789. Webster harbored no fantastic notion of abandoning English altogether, but he was eager to set up American as a distinct and independent dialect. Let us, he said, seize the present moment and establish a national language as well as a national government. As an independent nation, our honor requires us to have a system of our own in language as well as government. Long before this, the challenge had been flung. Scarcely two years after the Declaration of Independence, Franklin was instructed by Congress on his appointment as minister to France to employ the language of the United States, not simply English, in all his replies or answers to the communications of the ministry of Louis the Sixteenth, And eight years before the declaration, Franklin himself had drawn up a characteristically American scheme of spelling reform, 
and had offered plenty of proof in it perhaps unconsciously that the standards of spelling and pronunciation in the new world had already diverged noticeably from those accepted on the other side of the ocean in acknowledging the dedication of webster's dissertations franklin endorsed both his revolt against english domination and his forecast of widening differences in future though protesting at the same time against certain americanisms that have since come into good usage and even migrated to england this protest was marked by franklin's habitual mildness but in other quarters dissent was voiced with far less urbanity the growing independence of the colonial dialect not only in its spoken form but also in its most dignified written form had begun indeed to attract the attention of purists in both england and america and they sought to dispose of it in its infancy by force majeure one of the first and most vigorous of the attacks upon it was delivered by john witherspoon a scotch clergyman who came out in seventeen sixty nine to be president of princeton in partibus infidelium this witherspoon brought a scotch hatred of the english with him and at once became a leader of the party of independence he signed the declaration to the tune of much rhetoric and was the only clergyman to sit in the continental congress but in matters of learning he was orthodox to the point of hunkerousness and the strange locutions that he encountered on all sides aroused his pedagogic ire i have heard in this country he wrote in seventeen eighty one in the senate at the bar and from the pulpit and see daily in dissertations from the press errors in grammar improprieties and vulgarisms which hardly any person of the same class in point of rank and literature would have fallen into in great britain it was witherspoon who coined the word americanism and at once the english guardians of the sacred vessels began employing it as a general synonym for vulgarism and barbarism another learned immigrant the rev jonathan boucher soon joined him this boucher boucher was a friend of washington but was driven back to england by his loyalist sentiments he took revenge by printing various charges against the americans among them that of making all the haste they can to rid themselves of the english language after the opening of the new century all the british reviews maintained an eager watchfulness for these abhorrent inventions and denounced them when found with the utmost vehemence the edinburgh which led the charge opened its attack in october eighteen o four in the appearance of the five volumes of chief justice marshall's life of george washington during the three years following gave the signal for corrective articles in the british critic the critical review the annual the monthly and the eclectic the british critic in april eighteen o eight admitted somewhat despairingly that the damage was already done that the common speech of the United States has departed very considerably from the standard adopted in England. The others, however, sought to stay the flood by invective against Marshall, and later against his rival biographer, the Reverend Aaron Bancroft. The annual in 1808 pronounced its high curse and anathema upon that torrent of barbarous phraseology which was pouring across the Atlantic, and which threatened to destroy the purity of the English language. In Bancroft's Life of George Washington, 1808, according to the British critic, there were gross Americanisms inordinately offensive to Englishmen, at almost every page. The Reverend Jeremy Belknap, long anticipating Elwin, White and Lounsbury, tried to obtain a respite from this abuse by pointing out the obvious fact that many of the americanisms under fire were merely survivors of an english that had become archaic in england but this effort counted for little for on the one hand the british purists enjoyed the chase 
too much to give it up and on the other hand there began to dawn in america a new spirit of nationality at first very faint which viewed the differences objected to not with shame but with a fierce sort of pride in the first volume of the north american review william ellery channing spoke out boldly for the american language and literature and a year later pickering published his defiant dictionary of words and phrases which have been supposed to be peculiar to the united states this thin collection of five hundred specimens set off a dispute which yet rages on both sides of the atlantic pickering however was undismayed he had begun to notice the growing difference between the english and american vocabulary and pronunciation he said while living in london from seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o one and he had made his collections with the utmost care and after taking counsel with various prudent authorities both english and american already in the first year of the century he continued the english had accused the people of the new republic of a deliberate design to effect an entire change in the language and while no such design was actually harbored the facts were the facts and he cited the current newspapers the speeches from pulpit and rostrum and webster himself in support of them this debate over pickering's list as i say still continues lounsbury entrenched behind his grotesque categories once charged that four-fifths of the words in it had no business being there and gilbert m tucker has argued that only seventy of them were genuine americanisms but a careful study of the list in comparison with the early quotations recently collected by thornton seems to indicate that both of these judgments and many others no less have done injustice to pickering he made the usual errors of the pioneer but his sound contributions to the subject were anything but inconsiderable and it is impossible to forget his diligence and his constant shrewdness he established firmly the native origin of a number of words now in universal use in america e g backwoodsman breadstuffs caucus clapboard sleigh and squatter and of such familiar derivatives as gubernatorial and dutiable and he worked out the genesis of not a few loan words including prairie scow rapids hominy and barbecue it was not until eighteen forty eight when the first edition of bartlett appeared that his work was supplanted end of chapter two part one chapter two part two of the american language this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 2. The Beginnings of American. Part 2. Sources of Early Americanisms. The first genuine Americanisms were undoubtedly words borrowed bodily from the Indian dialects. Words in the main indicating natural objects that had no counterparts in England. We find opossum, for example, in the form of O-P-A-S-U-M, in Captain John Smith's Map of Virginia, 1612, and in the form of A-P-O-S-S-O-U-N, in a Virginia document two years older. Moose is almost as old. The word is borrowed from the Algonquin Musa, and must have become familiar to the Pilgrim Fathers soon after their landing in 1620 for the woods of Massachusetts then swarmed with the huge quadrupeds, and there was no English name to designate them. Again, there are skunk, from the Abenaki Indian Saganku, hickory, squash, pawpaw, raccoon, chinkapin, porgy, chipmunk, pemmican, terrapin, menhaden, catalpa, persimmon, and cougar. Of these, Hickory and terrapin are to be found in Robert Beverly's History and Present State of Virginia, 1705, and squash, chinkapin, and persimmon are in documents of the preceding century. Many of these words, of course, were shortened or otherwise modified on being taken into colonial English. Thus, chinkapin was originally chakinquimin, 
and squash appears in early documents as Isquanter squash, Ascuta squash, Isquanker squash, and Squanter squash. But William Penn, in a letter dated August 16, 1683, used the latter in its present form. Its variations show a familiar effort to bring a new and strange word into harmony with the language, an effort arising from what philologists call the law of Hobson Jobson. This name was given to it by Colonel Henry Ewell and A. C. Burnell, compilers of a standard dictionary of Anglo-Indian terms. They found that the British soldiers in India, hearing strange words from the lips of the natives, often converted them into English words of similar sound, though of widely different meaning. Thus the words Hassan and Hossein, frequently used by the Mohammedans of the country in their devotions, were turned into Hobson Jobson. The same process is constantly in operation elsewhere. By it, the French Ro de Roi has become Rotten Row in English, Ecrevis has become Crayfish, and the English Beausprit has become Beaupre, Beautiful Meadow, in French. The word Pigeon, in Pigeon English, offers another example. It has no connection with the bird, but merely represents a Chinaman's attempt to pronounce the word business. No doubt squash originated in the same way. That woodchuck did so is practically certain. Its origin is to be sought not in wood and chuck, but in the Cree word ochak, used by the Indians to designate the animal. In addition to the names of natural objects, the early colonists, of course, took over a great many Indian place names, and a number of words to designate Indian relations and artificial objects in Indian use. To the last division belong hominy, pone, toboggan, canoe, tapioca, moccasin, powwow, papoose, tomahawk, wigwam, succotash, and squaw, all of which were in common circulation by the beginning of the 18th century. Finally, new words were made during the period by translating Indian terms. For example, warpath, war paint, pale face, medicine man, pipe of peace, and fire water. The total number of such borrowings, direct and indirect, was a good deal larger than now appears. For with the disappearance of the red man, the use of loan words from his dialects has decreased. In our own time, such words as papoose, sachem, tipi, wigwam, and wampum have begun to drop out of everyday use. Footnote. A number of such Indian words are preserved in the nomenclature of Tammany Hall and in that of the Improved Order of Red Men an organization with more than 500,000 members. The red men, borrowing from the Indians, thus name the months in order. Cold moon, snow, worm, plant, flower, hot, buck, sturgeon, corn, travelers, beaver, and hunting. They call their officers Incahoni, Sachem, Wampum Keeper, etc. But such terms, of course, are not in general use. End of footnote. At an earlier period, the language sloughed off ocelot, manatee, calumet, supon, somp, and quahog, or began to degrade them to the estate of provincialisms. Footnote. A long list of such obsolete Americanisms is given by Clappin in his dictionary. End of footnote. A curious phenomenon is presented by the case of maize, M-A-I-Z-E which came into the colonial speech from some West Indian dialect, went over into Orthodox English, and from English into French, German, and other continental languages, and was then abandoned by the colonists. We shall see other examples of that process later on. Whether or not Yankee comes from an Indian dialect is still disputed. An early authority, John G. E. Heckwelder, argued that it was derived from an Indian mispronunciation of the word English. Certain later etymologists hold that it originated more probably in an Indian mishandling of the French word anglais. Yet others derive it from the Scotch Yankee, Y-A-N-K-I-E, meaning a gigantic falsehood. A fourth party derive it from the Dutch, and cite an alleged Dutch model for Yankee Doodle, beginning Yanker Diddy Doodle Down. Of these theories, that of Heckwelder is the most plausible. But here, as in other directions, the investigation of American etymology remains sadly incomplete. An elaborate dictionary of words derived from the Indian languages, compiled by the late W. R. Girard, 
is in the possession of the Smithsonian Institution, but on account of a shortage of funds it remains in manuscript. From the very earliest days of English colonization, the language of the colonists also received accretions from the languages of the other colonizing nations. The French word portage, for example, was already in common use before the end of the 17th century, and soon after came chowder, cache, C-A-C-H-E, caribou, voyager, and various words that, like the last named, have since become localisms or disappeared altogether. Before 1750, bureau, footnote, A, a chest of drawers, B, a government office. In both senses, the word is rare in English, though its use by the French is familiar. In the United States, its use in B has been extended, for example, in employment bureau, end of footnote. Gopher, bateau, bogus, and prairie were added, and caboose, a word of Dutch origin, seems to have come in through the French. Carriol is also French in origin, despite its English quality. It comes, by the law of Hobson Jobson, from the French carriole. The contributions of the Dutch during the half-century of their conflicts with the English included cruller, cold slaw, domini, for parson, cookie, stoop, span, of horses, pit, as in peach pit, waffle, hook, a point of land, scow, boss, smear case, and Santa Claus, footnote, from St. Claus, St. Nicholas. Santa Claus has also become familiar to the English, but the Oxford Dictionary still calls the name an Americanism. End of footnote. Shell de Vere credits them with Hayberic, a corruption of Hoybert. That they established the use of bush as a designation for back country is very probable. The word has also got into the South African English. In American, it has produced a number of familiar derivatives, such as bushwhacker and bush league. Borer and Leland also credit the Dutch with dander, which is commonly assumed to be an American corruption of dandruff. They say that it is from the Dutch word donder, meaning thunder. Opdonderen, in Dutch, means to burst into a sudden rage. The chief Spanish contributions to American were to come after the War of 1812, with the opening of the West. But Creole, Calaboose, Palmetto, Peewee, Key, a small island, Quadroon, Octoroon, Barbecue, Piccaninny, and Stampede had already entered the language in colonial days. Jerked beef came from the Spanish Charqui, by the law of Hobson Jobson. The Germans, who arrived in Pennsylvania in 1682, also undoubtedly gave a few words to the language, though it is often difficult to distinguish their contributions from those of the Dutch. It seems very likely, however, that sauerkraut and noodle are to be credited to them. Footnote. The spelling is variously S-A-U-E-R-K-R-A-U-T. S-A-U-R-K-R-A-U-T. S-O-U-R-K-R-A-U-T. And S-O-U-R-K-R-O-U-T. End of footnote. Finally, the Negro slaves brought in gumbo, goober, juba, and voodoo, usually corrupted to hoodoo, and probably helped to corrupt a number of other loanwords, for example, banjo and breakdown. Banjo seems to be derived from bandor or banduria, modern French and Spanish forms of timbre, respectively. It may, however, be an actual Negro word. There is a term of like meaning, bania, in Senegambian. Ware says that breakdown, designating a riotous Negro dance, is a corruption of the French rigadon. The word is not in the Oxford Dictionary. Bartlett listed it as an Americanism, but Thornton rejected it, apparently because, in the sense of a collapse, it has come into colloquial use in England. Its etymology is not given in the American dictionaries. End of Chapter 2, Part 2 Chapter 2, Part 3 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 2. The Beginnings of American Part 3. 
New Words of English Material. But of far more importance than these borrowings was the great stock of new words that the colonists coined in English metal, words primarily demanded by the new circumstances under which they were placed, but also indicative, in more than one case, of a delight in the business for its own sake. The American, even in the early 18th century, already showed many of the characteristics that were to set him off from the Englishman later on. His bold and somewhat grotesque imagination, his contempt for authority, his lack of aesthetic sensitiveness, his extravagant humor. Among the first colonists, there were many men of education, culture, and gentle birth, but they were soon swamped by hordes of the ignorant and illiterate, and the latter, cut off from the corrective influence of books, soon laid their hands upon the language. It is impossible to imagine the austere Puritan divines of Massachusetts inventing such verbs as to cowhide and to log roll, or such adjectives as no account and stumped, or such adverbs as know-how and lickety-split, or such substantives as bullfrog, hogwallow, and hoe-cake. But under their eyes there arose a contumacious proletariat which was quite capable of the business, and very eager for it. In Boston, so early as 1628, there was a definite class of blackguard roisterers, chiefly made up of sailors and artisans. In Virginia, nearly a decade earlier, John Porry, secretary to Governor Yardley, lamented that, in these five months of my continuance here, there have come at one time or another eleven sails of ships into this river, but frighted more with ignorance than with any other merchandise. In particular, the generation born in the new world was uncouth and iconoclastic. The only world it knew was a rough world, and the virtues that environment engendered were not those of niceness, but those of enterprise and resourcefulness. Upon men of this sort fell the task of bringing the wilderness to the axe and the plough, and with it went the task of inventing a vocabulary for the special needs of the great adventure. Out of their loutish ingenuity came a great number of picturesque names for natural objects, chiefly boldly descriptive compounds, bullfrog, canvasback, lightning bug, mud hen, catbird, razorback, garter snake, groundhog, and so on. And out of an inventiveness somewhat more urbane came such coinages as live oak, potato bug, turkey gobbler, pokeweed, copperhead, eelgrass, reed bird, eggplant, bluegrass, peanut, pitch pine, clingstone, peach, moccasin snake, june bug, and butternut. Live oak appears in a document of 1610. Bullfrog was familiar to Beverly in 1705. So was Jamestown weed, later reduced to Jimson weed, as the English hurtleberry or hortleberry was reduced to huckleberry. These early Americans were not botanists. They were often ignorant of the names of the plants they encountered, even when those plants already had English names. And so they exercised their fancy upon new ones. So arose Johnny Jump Up for the viola tricolor, and basswood for the common European linden or lime tree, Tilia, and locust for the Robinia pseudocachia and its allies. The Jimson weed itself was anything but a novelty, but the pioneers apparently did not recognize it, and so we find them ascribing all sorts of absurd medicinal powers to it, and even Beverly solemnly reporting that some soldiers, eating it in a salad, turned natural fools upon it for several days. The grosser features of the landscape got a lavish renaming, partly to distinguish new forms, and partly out of an obvious desire to attain a more literal descriptiveness. I have mentioned key and hook, the one borrowed from the Spanish and the other from the Dutch. With them came run, branch, fork, bluff, noun, neck, barrens, bottoms, underbrush, bottomland, clearing, notch, divide, knob, riffle, gap, rolling country, and rapids, and the extension of pond from artificial pools to small natural lakes, and of creek from small arms of the sea to shallow feeders of rivers. Such common English geographical terms as downs, weald, wold, fen, bog, fell, chase, coom, dell, heath, and more disappeared from the colonial tongue, save as fossilized in a few proper names. So did Bracken. 
With the new landscape came an entirely new mode of life. New foods, new forms of habitation, new methods of agriculture, new kinds of hunting. A great swarm of neologisms thus arose, and as in the previous case, they were chiefly compounds. Back country, back woods, back woodsmen, back settler, back settlements. All these were in common use early in the 18th century. Backlog was used by Increase Mather in 1684. Log House appears in the Maryland Archives for 1669. Hoe Cake, Johnny Cake, Pan Fish, Corn Dodger, Roasting Ear, Corn Crib, Corn Cob, and Popcorn were all familiar before the Revolution. So were Pine Knot, Snow Plow, Cold Snap, Landslide, Salt Lick, Prickly Heat, Shell Road, and Cane Break. Shingle was a novelty in 1705, but one S. Simmons wrote to John Winthrop of Ipswich, about a clapboarded house in 1637. Frame house seems to have come in with shingle. Trail, half-breed, Indian summer, and Indian file were obviously suggested by the red men. State house was borrowed, perhaps, from the Dutch. Selectman is first heard of in 1685, displacing the English alderman. Mush had displaced porridge by 1671. Soon afterward, haystack took the place of the English haycock and such common English terms as buyer, muse, weir, and wain began to disappear. Hired man is to be found in the Plymouth Town Records of 1737, and hired girl followed soon after. So early as 1758, as we find by the diary of Nathaniel Ames, the second-year students at Harvard were already called sophomores, though for a while the spelling was often made sophimores. Camp meeting was later, it did not appear until 1799. But land office was familiar before 1700. And sidewalk, spelling bee, bee line, mossback, crazy quilt, mud scow, stamping ground, and a hundred and one other such compounds were in daily use before the Revolution. After that great upheaval, the new money of the Confederation brought in a number of new words. In 1782, Governor Morris proposed to the Continental Congress that the coins of the Republic be called in ascending order, unit, penny bill, dollar, and crown. Later Morris invented the word cent, substituting it for the English penny. In 1785, Jefferson proposed mill, cent, dime, dollar, and eagle, and this nomenclature was adopted. Various nautical terms peculiar to America, or taken into English from American sources, came in during the 18th century, among them schooner, catboat, and pungi not to recall bateau and canoe. According to a recent historian of the American Merchant Marine, the first schooner ever seen was launched at Gloucester, Massachusetts, in 1713. The word, it appears, was originally spelled schooner, S-C-O-O-N-E-R. To schoon was a verb borrowed by the New Englanders from some Scotch dialect, and meant to skim or skip across the water like a flat stone. As the first schooner left the ways and glided out into Gloucester Harbor, an enraptured spectator shouted, Oh, see how she schoons! A schooner let her be, replied Captain Andrew Robinson, her builder, and all boats of her peculiar and novel fore-and-aft rig took the name hereafter. The Dutch mariners borrowed the term and changed the spelling, and this change was soon accepted in America. The Scotch root came from the Norse schooner, to hasten, and there are analogues in Icelandic, Anglo-Saxon, and Old High German. The origin of catboat and pungi I have been unable to determine. Perhaps the latter is related in some way to pung, a one-horse sled or wagon. Pung was often widely used in the United States, but of late it has sunk to the estate of a New England provincialism. Longfellow used it, and in 1857 a writer in the Knickerbocker magazine reported that pungs filled Broadway in New York after a snowstorm. Most of these new words, of course, produced derivatives. For example, to stack hay, to shingle, to shuck, i.e., corn, to trail, and to caucus. Backwoods immediately begat backwoodsmen, and was itself turned into a common adjective. The colonists, indeed, showed a beautiful disregard of linguistic nicety. At an early date, they shortened the English law phrase, to convey by deed, to the simple verb, to deed. Pickering protested against this as a barbarism and argued that no self-respecting law writer would employ it. But all the same, it was firmly entrenched in the common speech, and it has remained there to this day. 
to table, for, to lay on the table, came in at the same time, and so did various forms represented by bindery, for bookbinder's shop. To tomahawk appeared before 1650, and to scalp must have followed soon after. Within the next century and a half, they were reinforced by many other such new verbs, and by such adjectives made of nouns as no account and one horse, and such nouns made of verbs as carry all and goner, and such adverbs as know-how. In particular, the manufacture of new verbs went on at a rapid pace. In his letter to Webster in 1789, Franklin denounced to advocate, to progress, and to oppose, a vain enterprise, for all of them are now in perfectly good usage. To advocate, indeed, was used by Thomas Nash in 1589, and by John Milton half a century later, but it seems to have been reinvented in America. In 1822, and again in 1838, Robert Southey, then Poet Laureate, led two belated attacks upon it, as a barbarous Americanism, but its obvious usefulness preserved it, and it remains in good usage on both sides of the Atlantic today, one of the earliest of the English borrowings from America. In the end, indeed, even so ardent a purist as Richard Grant White adopted it, as he did to placate. Webster, though he agreed with Franklin in opposing to advocate, gave his imprimatur to appreciate, i.e. to raise in value, and is credited by Sir Charles Lyell with having himself invented to demoralize. He also approved to obligate. To antagonize seems to have been given currency by John Quincy Adams. To immigrate by John Marshall. To eventuate by Governor Morris. And to derange by George Washington. Jefferson, always hospitable to new words, used to belittle in his Notes on Virginia. And Thornton thinks that he coined it. Many new verbs were made by the simple process of prefixing the preposition to common nouns. For example, to clerk, to dicker, to dump, to blow, that is, to bluster or boast, to cord, that is, wood, to stump, to room, and to shin. Others were made by transferring verbs in the orthodox vocabulary, for example, to cavort, from to curvet, and to snoop, from to snook. Others arose as metaphors, for example, to whitewash, figuratively, and to squat, on unoccupied land. Others were made by hitching suffixes to nouns, for example, to negative, to deputize, to locate, to legislate, to infract, to comprite, and to habify. Yet others seem to have been produced by onomatopoeia, for example, to fizzle, or to have arisen by some other such spontaneous process so far unintelligible, for example, to tote. With them came an endless series of verb phrases, for example, to draw a bead, to face the music, to darken one's door, to take to the woods, to fly off the handle, to go on the warpath, and to saw wood, all obvious products of frontier life. Many coinages of the pre-revolutionary era later disappeared. Jefferson used to ambition, but it dropped out nevertheless, and so did to comprit, that is, to compromise, to homologize, and to happify. Fierce battles raged round some of these words, and they were all violently derided in England. Even so useful a verb as to locate, now in perfectly good usage, was denounced in the third volume of the North American Review, and other purists of the times tried to put down to legislate. The young and tender adjectives had quite as hard a row to hoe, particularly lengthy. The British critic attacked it in November 1793, and it also had enemies at home, but John Adams had used it in his diary in 1759, and the authority of Jefferson and Hamilton was behind it, and so it survived. Years later, James Russell Lowell spoke of it as the excellent adjective, and boasted that American had given it to English. Dutiable also met with opposition and moreover it had a rival, costumable. But Marshall wrote it into his historic decisions, and thus it took root. The same anonymous watchman of the North American Review who protested against to locate, pronounced his anathema upon such barbarous terms as presidential and congressional, but the plain need for them kept them in the language. Gubernatorial had come in long before this, and it is to be found in the New Jersey archives of 1734. Influential was denounced by the Reverend John Butcher and by George Canning, who argued that influent was better. 
but it was ardently defended by William Pinckney, of Maryland, and gradually made its way. Handy, kinky, law-abiding, chunky, solid, in the sense of well-to-do. Evincive, complected, judgmatical, underpinned, blooded, and cute were also already secure in revolutionary days. So, with many nouns, Jefferson used breadstuffs in his report of the Secretary of State on Commercial Restrictions, December 16, 1793. Balance, in the sense of remainder, got into the debates of the First Congress. Mileage was used by Franklin in 1754, and is now sound English. Elevator, in the sense of a storage house for grain, was used by Jefferson and by others before him. Draw, for drawbridge, comes down from revolutionary days. So does slip, in the sense of a berth for vessels. So does addition, in the sense of a suburb. So, finally, does darkey. The history of many of these Americanisms shows how vain is the effort of grammarians to combat the natural processes of language development. I have mentioned the early opposition to dutiable, influential, presidential, lengthy, to locate, to oppose, to advocate, to legislate, and to progress. Bogus, reliable, and standpoint were attacked with the same academic ferocity. All of them are to be found in Bryant's Index Expurgatoris, circa 1870, and reliable was denounced by Bishop Cox as that abominable barbarism so late as 1886. Edward S. Gould, another uncompromising purist, said of standpoint that it was the bright particular star of solemn philological blundering and the very counterpart of Dogberry's non-cum. Gould also protested against to jeopardize, leniency, and to demean, and Richard Grant White joined him in an onslaught upon to donate. But all of these words are in good use in the United States today, and some of them have gone over into English. End of Chapter 2, Part 3 Recording by Todd Chapter 2, Part 4 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 2. The Beginnings of American Part 4. Changed Meanings A number of the foregoing contributions to the American vocabulary, of course, were simply common English words with changed meanings. To squat, in the sense of to crouch, had been sound English for centuries. What the colonists did was to attach a figurative meaning to it, and then bring that figurative meaning into wider usage than the literal meaning. In a somewhat similar manner, they changed the significance of pond, as I have pointed out. So, too, with creek. In English it designated, and still designates, a small inlet or arm of a larger river or of the sea. In American, so early as 1674, it designated any small stream. Many other such changed meanings crept into American in the early days. A typical one was the use of lot to designate a parcel of land. Thornton says, perhaps inaccurately, that it originated in the fact that the land in New England was distributed by lot. Whatever the truth, lot, to this day, is in almost universal use in the United States, though rare in England. Our conveyancers, in describing real property, always speak of all that lot or parcel of land. Other examples of the application of old words to new purposes are afforded by freshet, barn, and team. A freshet in 18th century English meant any stream of fresh water. The colonists made it signify an inundation. A barn was a house or shed for storing crops. In the colonies, the word came to mean a place for keeping cattle also. A team in English was a pair of draft horses. In the colonies, it came to mean both horses and vehicle. The process is even more clearly shown in the history of such words as corn and shoe. Corn, in orthodox English, means grain for human consumption, and especially wheat. For example, the corn laws. The earliest settlers, following this usage, gave the name of Indian corn to what the Spaniards, following the Indians themselves, had called maize. But gradually the adjective fell off, and by the middle of the 18th century, maize was called simply corn and grains in general were called breadstuffs. Thomas Hutchinson, discoursing to George III in 1774, used corn in this restricted sense, speaking of rye and corn mixed. What corn? asked George. Indian corn, explained Hutchinson, or, 
as it is called in authors, maze. So with shoe. In English it meant, and still means, a topless article of footwear. But the colonists extended its meaning to varieties covering the ankle, thus displacing the English boot, which they reserved for foot coverings reaching at least to the knee. To designate the English shoe, they began to use the word slipper. This distinction between English and American usage still prevails, despite the affectation that has lately sought to revive boot, and with it its derivatives, boot shop and bootmaker. Store, shop, lumber, pie, dry goods, cracker, rock, and partridge, among nouns, and to haul, to jew, to notify, and to heft, among verbs, offer further examples of changed meanings. Down to the middle of the 18th century, shop continued to designate a retail establishment in America, as it does in England to this day. Store was applied only to a large establishment, one showing, in some measure, the character of a warehouse. But in 1774, a Boston young man was advertising in the Massachusetts Spy for a place as a clerk in a store. Three Americanisms in a row. Soon afterwards, shop began to acquire its special American meaning as a factory. For example, machine shop. Meanwhile, store completely displaced shop in the English sense, and it remained for a late flowering of Anglomania, as in the case of boot and shoe, to restore, in a measure, the status quo ante. Lumber, in 18th century English, meant disused furniture, and this is its common meaning in England today. But the colonists early employed it to designate timber, and that use of it is now universal in America. Its familiar derivatives, for example, lumberyard, lumberman, lumberjack, greatly reinforce this usage. Pie, in English, means a meat pie. In American, it means a fruit pie. The English call a fruit pie a tart. The Americans call a meat pie a pot pie. Dry goods in England means non-liquid goods as corn, that is, wheat. In the United States, the term means textile fabrics or wares. The difference had appeared before 1725. Rock, in English, always means a large mass. In America, it may mean a small stone, as in rock pile, and to throw a rock. The Puritans were putting rocks into the foundations of their meeting houses so early as 1712. Cracker began to be used for biscuit before the Revolution. Tavern displaced inn at the same time. As for partridge, it is cited by a late authority as a salient example of changed meanings, along with corn and store. In England, the term is applied only to the true partridge, perdix perdix, and its nearly related varieties. But in the United States, it is also used to designate the ruffled grouse, bonassa umbellus, the common quail, colinus virginius, and various other tetranoid birds. This confusion goes back to colonial times. So with rabbit. Properly speaking, there are no native rabbits in the United States. They are all hares. But the early colonists, for some unknown reason, dropped the word hare out of their vocabulary, and it is rarely heard in American speech to this day. When it appears, it is almost always applied to the so-called Belgian hare, which, curiously enough, is not a hare at all, but a true rabbit. To haul, in English, means to move by force or violence. In the colonies it came to mean to transport in a vehicle, and this meaning survives in sound American. To Jew, in English, means to cheat. The colonists made it mean to haggle, and devised to Jew down to indicate an effort to work a reduction in price. To heft, in English, means to lift. The early Americans made it mean to weigh by lifting, and kept the idea of weighing in its derivatives, for example, hefty. Finally, there is the familiar American misuse of miss or miz for misses. It was so widespread in 1790 that on November 17th of that year, Webster solemnly denounced it in The American Mercury. End of Chapter 2, Part 4 Recording by Todd Chapter 2, Part 5 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 2. The Beginnings of American Part 5. Archaic English Words Most of the colonists who lived along the American seaboard in 1750 were the descendants of immigrants who had come in fully a century before. 
after the first settlements there had been much less fresh immigration than many latter-day writers have assumed according to prescott f hall the population of new england at the time of the revolutionary war was produced out of an immigration of about twenty thousand persons who arrived before sixteen forty and we have franklin's authority for the statement that the total population of the colonies in seventeen fifty one then about one million had been produced from an original immigration of less than eighty thousand even at that early day indeed the colonists had begun to feel that they were distinctly separated in culture and customs from the mother country and there were signs of the rise of a new native aristocracy entirely distinct from the older aristocracy of the royal governor's courts the enormous difficulties of communication with england helped to foster this sense of separation the round trip across the ocean occupied the better part of a year and was hazardous and expensive a colonist who had made it was a marked man as hawthorne said the petit maitre of the colonies nor was there any very extensive exchange of ideas for though most of the books read in the colonies came from england the great majority of the colonists down to the middle of the century seems to have read little save the bible and biblical commentaries and in the native literature of the time one seldom comes upon any reference to the english authors who were glorifying the period of the restoration and the reign of anne moreover after seventeen sixty the colonial eyes were upon france rather than upon england and rousseau montesquieu voltaire and the encyclopedias began to be familiar names to thousands who were scarcely aware of addison and steele or even the great elizabethans the result of this isolation on the one hand was that proliferation of the colonial speech which i have briefly reviewed and on the other hand the preservation of many words and phrases that gradually became obsolete in england the pilgrims of sixteen twenty brought over with them the english of james i and the revised version and their descendants of a century later inheriting it allowed its fundamentals to be little changed by the academic overhauling that the mother tongue was put to during the early part of the eighteenth century in part they were ignorant of this overhauling and in part they were indifferent to it whenever the new usage differed from that of the bible they were inclined to remain faithful to the bible not only because of its pious authority but also because of the superior pull of its eminent and constant presence thus when an artificial prudery in english ordered the abandonment of the anglo-saxon sick for the gothic ill the colonists refused to follow for sick was in both the old testament and the new and that refusal remains in force to this day a very large number of words and phrases many of them now exclusively american are similar survivals from the english of the seventeenth century long since obsolete or merely provincial in england among nouns thornton notes foxfire flapjack jeans molasses beef to designate the live animal chinch cordwood homespun ice cream julep and swingle tree hallowell adds andiron bay window cesspool clodhopper cross purposes greenhorn loophole ragamuffin riffraff rigmarole and trash and other authorities cite stock for cattle fall for autumn offal din underpinning and adds bub used in addressing a boy is very old english but survives only in american flapjack goes back to piers plowman but has been obsolete in england for two centuries muss in the sense of a row is also obsolete over there but is to be found in anthony and cleopatra char as a noun disappeared from english a long time ago but it survives in american as chore among the adjectives similarly preserved are to whittle to wilt and to approbate to guess in the american sense of to suppose is to be found in henry the sixth not altogether far better i guess that we do make our entrance several ways in measure for measure escalus says i guess not to angelo the new english dictionary offers examples much older from chaucer wycliffe and gower to interview is in decker to loan in the american sense of to lend is in thirty four and thirty five henry the eighth but it dropped out of use in england early in the eighteenth century and all the leading dictionaries both english and american now call it an americanism to fellowship once in good american use but now reduced to a provincialism is in chaucer even to hustle it appears is ancient among adjectives homely which means only homelike or unadorned in england was used in its american sense of plain featured by both shakespeare and milton other such survivors are burly 
catty-cornered, likely, deft, copious, scant, and ornate. Perhaps clever also belongs in this category, that is, in the American sense of amiable. Our ancestors, said James Russell Lowell, unhappily could bring over no English better than Shakespeare's. Shakespeare died in 1616. The pilgrims landed four years later. Jamestown was founded in 1607. As we have seen, the colonists, saving a few superior leaders, were men of small sensitiveness to the refinements of life and speech. Soldiers of fortune, amateur theologians, younger sons, neighborhood advanced thinkers, bankrupts, jobless workmen, decayed gentry, and other such fugitives from culture. In brief, Philistines of the sort who join tin-pot fraternal orders today and march in parades and whoop for the latest mountebanks in politics. There was thus a touch of rhetoric in Lowell's saying that they spoke the English of Shakespeare, as well argued that the London grocers of 1885 spoke the English of Petar. But in a larger sense, he said truly, for these men at least brought with them the vocabulary of Shakespeare, or a part of it, even if the uses he made of it were beyond their comprehension, and they also brought with them that sense of ease in the language, that fine disdain for formality, that bold experimentalizing in words, which was so peculiarly Elizabethan. There were no grammarians in that day. There were no purists that anyone listened to. It was a case of saying your say in the easiest and most satisfying way. In remote parts of the United States, there are still direct and almost pure-blooded descendants of those 17th century colonists. Go among them, and you will hear more words from the Shakespearean vocabulary still alive and in common service, than anywhere else in the world, and more of the loose and brilliant syntax of that time, and more of its gypsy phrases. End of chapter 2, part 5 Recording by Todd Chapter 2, part 6 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 2 The Beginnings of American Part 6 Colonial Pronunciation The debate that long raged over the pronunciation of classical Latin exhibits the difficulty of determining, with exactness, the shades of sound in the speech of a people long departed from earth. The American colonists, of course, are much nearer to us than the Romans, and so we should have relatively little difficulty in determining just how they pronounced this or that word. But against the fact of their nearness stands the neglect of our philologists, or perhaps more accurately, our lack of philologists. What Sweet did to clear up the history of English pronunciation and what Wilhelm Corson did for Latin, no American professor has yet thought to attempt for American. The literature is almost, if not quite, a blank. But here and there we may get a hint of the facts. And though the sum of them is not large, they at least serve to set at rest a number of popular errors. One of these errors, chiefly prevalent in New England, is that the so-called Boston pronunciation, with its broad A's, making last, path, and ant, almost assonant with bar, comes down unbrokenly from the day of the first settlements, and that it is in consequence superior in authority to the pronunciation of the rest of the country, with its flat A's, making the same words assonant with ban. A glance through Webster's dissertations is sufficient to show that the flat A was in use in New England in 1789 for the pronunciation of such words as wrath, bath, and path, as given by him, makes them rhyme with hath. Moreover, he gives aunt the same A sound. From other sources come indications that the A was likewise flattened in such words as plant, basket, branch, dance, blast, command, and castle, and even in balm and calm. Changes in the sound of the letter have been going on in English ever since the Middle English period, 
and according to Lounsbury, they have moved toward the disappearance of the continental ah, the fundamental vowel tone of the human voice. Grangent, another authority, says that it became flattened by the 16th century, and that until 1780 or thereabouts, the standard language had no broad A, even in such words as father, car, and ask. The flat A was universally used. Sheridan, in the dictionary he published in 1780, actually gave no ah sound in his list of vowels. This habit of flattening the A had been brought over, of course, by the early colonists, and was as general in America in the third quarter of the 18th century as in England. Benjamin Franklin, when he wrote his Scheme for a New Alphabet and a Reformed Mode of Spelling, in 1768, apparently had no suspicion that any other A was possible. But between 1780 and 1790, according to Grangent, a sudden fashion for the broad A, not the aw sound as in fall, but the continental sound as in far, arose in England, and this fashion soon found servile imitation in Boston. But it was as much an affectation in those days as it is today, and Webster indicated the fact pretty plainly in his dissertations. How, despite his opposition, the broad A prevailed east of the Connecticut River, and how, in the end, he himself yielded to it, and even tried to force it upon the whole nation, this will be rehearsed in the next chapter. The colonists remained faithful much longer than the English, to various other vowel sounds that were facing change in the 18th century. For example, the long E sound in herd. Webster says that the custom of rhyming herd with bird instead of with feared came in at the beginning of the revolution. To most people in this country, he adds, the English pronunciation appears like affectation. He also argues for rhyming deaf with leaf, and protests against inserting a Y sound before the U in such words as nature. Franklin's authority stands behind git, forget. This pronunciation, according to Menner, was correct in 17th century England and perhaps down to the middle of the next century. So was the use of the continental E sound in oblige, making it oblige. It is probable that the colonists clung to these disappearing usages much longer than the English. The latter, according to Webster, were unduly responsive to illogical fashions set by the exquisites of the court and by popular actors. He blames Garrick, in particular, for many extravagant innovations, most of them not followed in the colonies. But Garrick was surely not responsible for the use of a long E sound in such words as motive, nor for the corruption of mercy to mercy. Webster denounced both of these barbarisms. The second he ascribed somewhat lamely to the fact that the letter R is called R and proposed to dispose of it by changing the R to air. As for the consonants, the colonists seem to have resisted valiantly the tendency to slide over them, which arose in England after the Restoration. Franklin, in 1768, still retained the sound of L in such words as would and should a usage not met with in England after the year 1700. In the same way, according to Menner, the W in sword was sounded in America for some time after Englishmen had abandoned it. The sensitive ear of Henry James detected an unpleasant R sound in the speech of Americans long ago got rid of by the English. So late as 1905, he even charged that it was inserted gratuitously in innocent words. 
the obvious slurring of the consonants by southerners is explained by a recent investigator on the ground that it began in england during the reign of charles the second and that most of the southern colonists came to the new world at that time the court of charles it is argued was under french influence due to the king's long residence in france and his marriage to henrietta marie charles objected to the inharmonious contractions willant or won't and wasn't and weren't and set the fashion of using the softly euphonious won't and want which are used in speaking to this day by the best class of southerners a more direct french influence upon southern pronunciation is also pointed out with full knowledge of his g's and r's the southerner sees fit to glide over them and he carries over the consonant ending one word to the vowel beginning the next just as the frenchman does the political importance of the south in the years between the mecklenburg declaration and the adoption of the constitution tended to force its provincialisms upon the common language many of the acknowledged leaders of the nascent nation were southerners and their pronunciation as well as their phrases must have become familiar everywhere pickering gives us a hint indeed at the process whereby their usage influenced that of the rest of the people the americans early dropped the h sound in such words as when and where but so far as i can determine they never elided it at the beginning of words save in the case of herb and a few others this elision is commonly spoken of as a cockney vulgarism but it has extended to the orthodox English speech. In Ostler, the initial H is openly left off. In hotel and hospital, it is seldom sounded, even by the most careful Englishman. Certain English words in H, in which the H is now sounded, betray its former silence by the fact that not A, but N, is still put before them. It is still good English usage to write an hotel and an historical. It is the American usage to write a hotel and a historical. The great authority of Webster was sufficient to establish the American pronunciation of schedule. In England, the SCH is always given the soft sound, but Webster decided for the hard sound as in scheme the variance persists to this day the name of the last letter of the alphabet which is always z in english is usually made z in the united states thornton shows that this americanism arose in the 18th century end of chapter 2 part 6 Chapter 3, Part 1 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 3 The Period of Growth, Part 1 The New Nation. The American language thus began to be recognizably differentiated from English in both vocabulary and pronunciation by the opening of the nineteenth century, but as yet its growth was hampered by two factors, the first being the lack of a national literature of any pretensions, and the second being an internal political disharmony which greatly conditioned and enfeebled the national consciousness. During the actual revolution, common aims and common dangers forced the Americans to show a united front. But once they had achieved political independence, they developed conflicting interests. And out of these conflicting interests came suspicions and hatreds which came near wrecking the new confederation more than once. Politically their worst weakness, perhaps, was an inability to detach themselves wholly from the struggle for domination still going on in Europe. The surviving loyalists of the revolutionary era, estimated by some authorities to have constituted fully a third of the total population in 1776, were ardently in favor of England, and such patriots as Jefferson were as ardently in favor of France. 
This engrossment in the quarrels of foreign nations was what Washington warned against in his farewell address. It was at the bottom of such bitter animosities as that between Jefferson and Hamilton. It inspired and perhaps excused the pessimism of such men as Burr. Its net effect was to make it difficult for the people of the new nation to think of themselves politically as Americans. Their state of mind, vacillating, uncertain, alternately timorous and pugnacious, has been well described by Henry Cabot Lodge in his essay on colonialism in America. Soon after the Treaty of Paris was signed, someone referred to the late struggle, in Franklin's hearing, as the War for Independence. Say rather the War of the Revolution, said Franklin. The War for Independence is yet to be fought. That struggle, adds Lossing, occurred, and that independence was won by the Americans in the War of 1812. In the interval, the new republic had passed through a period of Sturm und Drang, whose gigantic perils and passions we have begun to forget, a period in which disaster ever menaced, and the foes within were no less bold and pertinacious than the foes without. Jefferson, perhaps, carried his fear of monocrats to the point of monomania, but under it there was undoubtedly a body of sound fact. The poor debtor class, including probably a majority of the veterans of the Revolution, had been fired by the facile doctrines of the French Revolution to demands which threatened the country with bankruptcy and anarchy, and the class of property owners, in reaction, went far to the other extreme. On all sides, indeed, there flourished a strong British party, and particularly in New England, where the so-called codfish aristocracy, by no means extinct even today, exhibited an undisguised anglomania, and looked forward confidently to a reapprochement with the mother country. Footnote. The thing went, indeed, far beyond mere hope. In 1812, a conspiracy was unearthed to separate New England from the Republic and make it an English colony. The chief conspirator was one John Henry, who acted under the instructions of Sir John Craig, Governor-General of Canada. In footnote. This Anglomania showed itself not only in ceaseless political agitation, but also in an elaborate imitation of English manners. We have already seen on Noah Webster's authority how it even extended to the pronunciation of the language. The first sign of the dawn of a new national order came with the election of Thomas Jefferson to the presidency in 1800. The issue in the campaign was a highly complex one but under it lay a plain conflict between democratic independence and the old doctrine of dependence and authority. And with the alien and sedition laws about his neck, so vividly reminiscent of the issues of the revolution itself, Adams went down to defeat. Jefferson was violently anti-British and pro-French. He saw all the schemes of his political opponents indeed as English plots. He was the man who introduced the bugaboo into American politics. His first acts after his inauguration were to abolish all ceremonial at the court of the Republic, and to abandon spoken discourses to Congress for written messages. That ceremonial which grew up under Washington was an imitation, he believed, of the formality of the abhorrent court of St. James. As for the speeches to Congress, they were palpably modeled upon the speeches from the throne of the English kings. Both reforms met with wide approval. The exactions of the English, particularly on the high seas, were beginning to break up the British party. But confidence in the solidarity and security of the new nation was still anything but universal. The surviving doubts, indeed, were strong enough to delay the ratification of the Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution, providing for more direct elections of President and Vice President, until the end of 1804. And even then, three of the five New England states rejected it and have never ratified it in fact, to this day. Footnote. Maine was not separated from Massachusetts until 1820. End footnote. Democracy was still experimental, doubtful, full of gunpowder. In so far as it had actually come into being, it had come as a boon conferred from above. Jefferson, its protagonist, was the hero of the populace, but he was not of the populace himself, nor did he ever quite trust it. It was reserved for Andrew Jackson, a man genuinely of the people, to lead and visualize the rise of the lower orders. Jackson, in his way, was the archetype of the new American, ignorant, pushy, impatient of restraint and precedent, an iconoclast, a philistine, 
an anglophobe in every fiber. He came from the extreme backwoods, and his youth was passed amid surroundings but little removed from downright savagery. Thousands of other young Americans like him were growing up at the same time, youngsters filled with a vast impatience of all precedent and authority, revilers of all that had come down from an elder day, incorrigible libertarians. They swarmed across the mountains and down the great rivers, wrestling with the naked wilderness and setting up a casual, impromptu sort of civilization where the Indians still menaced. Schools were few and rudimentary. There was not the remotest approach to a cultivated society. Any effort to mimic the amenities of the East or of the mother country in manner or even in speech met with instant derision. It was in these surroundings and at this time that the thoroughgoing American of tradition was born. Blatant, illogical, elate, greeting the embarrassed gods uproariously and matching with destiny for beers. Jackson was unmistakably of that company in his every instinct and idea, and it was his fate to give a new and unshakable confidence to its aspiration at the Battle of New Orleans. Thereafter all doubts began to die out. The new republic was turning out a success, and with success came a vast increase in the national egoism. The hordes of pioneers rolled down the western valleys and on to the Great Plains. Footnote. Indiana and Illinois were erected into territories during Jefferson's first term, and Michigan during his second term. Kentucky was admitted to the Union in 1792, Tennessee in 1796, Ohio in 1803. Lewis and Clark set out for the Pacific in 1804. The Louisiana Purchase was ratified in 1803 and Louisiana became a state in 1812. In footnote, America began to stand for something quite new in the world, in government, in law, in public and private morals, in customs and habits of mind, in the minutia of social intercourse. And simultaneously the voice of America began to take on its characteristic twang, and the speech of America began to differentiate itself boldly and unmistakably from the speech of England. The average Philadelphian or Bostonian of 1790 had not the slightest difficulty in making himself understood by a visiting Englishman. But the average Ohio boatman of 1810, or plainsman of 1815, was already speaking a dialect that the Englishman would have shrunk from as barbarous and unintelligible, and before long it began to leave its mark upon, and to get direction and support, from a distinctively national literature. That literature, however, was very slow in coming to a dignified, confident, and autonomous estate. Down to Jefferson's day it was almost wholly polemical, and hence lacking in the finer values. He himself, an insatiable propagandist and controversialist, was one of its chief ornaments. The novelists and the historians, the essayists and the poets, whose names come to mind when American literature is mentioned, says a recent literary historian, have all flourished since 1800. Pickering, so late as 1816, said that, in this country, we can hardly be said to have any authors by profession. It was a true saying, though the new day was about to dawn. Bryant had already written Thanatopsis and was destined to publish it the year following. Difficulties of communication hampered the circulation of the few native books that were written, it was easier for a man in the South to get books from London than to get them from Boston or New York, and the lack of a copyright treaty with England flooded the country with cheap English editions. It is much to be regretted, wrote Dr. David Ramsey of Charleston, South Carolina, to Noah Webster in 1806, that there is so little intercourse in a literary way between the states. As soon as a book of general utility comes out in any state, it should be for sale in all of them. Ramsey asked for little. The most he could imagine was a sale of 2,000 copies for an American work in America. But even that was far beyond the possibilities of the time. An external influence of great potency helped to keep the national literature scanned and timorous during those early and perilous days. It was the extraordinary animosity of the English critics, then at the zenith of their pontifical authority, to all books of American origin or flavor. This animosity culminating in Sidney Smith's famous sneer, footnote, in the four quarters of the globe, who reads an American book, or goes to an American play, or looks at an American picture or statue, 
Edinburgh Review, January 1820, in footnote, was but part of a larger hostility to all things American, from political theories to table manners. The American, after the War of 1812, became the pet abomination of the English, and the chief butt of the incomparable English talent for moral indignation. There was scarcely an issue of the Quarterly Review, the Edinburgh, the Foreign Quarterly, the British Review, or Blackwoods for a generation following 1814 in which he was not stupendously assaulted. Gifford, Sidney Smith, and the poet Southey became specialists in this business. It took on the character of a holy war. Even such mild men as Wordsworth were recruited for it. It was argued that the Americans were rogues and swindlers, that they lived in filth and squalor, that they were boors in social intercourse, that they were poltroons and savages in war that they were depraved and criminal, that they were wholly devoid of the remotest notion of decency or honor. The Foreign Quarterly, summing up in January 1884, pronounced them horn-handed and pig-headed, hard, persevering, unscrupulous, carnivorous with a genius for lying. Various Americans went to the defense of their countrymen, among them Irving, Cooper, Timothy Dwight, J. K. Paulding, John Neal, Edward Everett, and Robert Walsh. Paulding in John Bull in America, or The New Munchausen, published in 1825, attempted satire. Even an Englishman, James Sterling, warned his fellow Britons that if they continued their intolerant abuse, they would turn into bitterness the last drops of goodwill toward England that exist in the United States. But the avalanche of denunciation kept up, and even down to a few years ago, it was very uncommon for an Englishman to write of American politics or manners or literature without betraying his dislike. Not indeed until the Prussian began monopolizing the whole British talent for horror and invective did the Yankee escape the lash. This gigantic pummeling in the long run was destined to encourage an independent spirit in the national literature, if only by a process of mingled resentment and despair but for some time its chief effect was to make American writers of a more delicate aspiration extremely self-conscious and diffident. The educated classes, even against their will, were influenced by the torrent of abuse. They could not help finding in it an occasional reasonableness, an accidental true hit. The result, despite the efforts of Channing, Knapp, and other such valiant defenders of the native author, was uncertainty and skepticism in native criticism. The first step of an American entering upon a literary career, says Lodge, writing of the first quarter of the century, was to pretend to be an Englishman in order that he might win the approval not of Englishmen, but of his own countrymen. Cooper, in his first novel Precaution, chose an English scene, imitated English models, and obviously hoped to placate the critics thereby. Irving, too, in his earliest work, showed a considerable discretion and his history of New York, as every one knows, was first published anonymously. But this puerile spirit did not last long. The English onslaughts were altogether too vicious to be received lying down. Their very fury demanded that they be met with a united and courageous front. Cooper, in his second novel The Spy, boldly chose an American setting and American characters. And though the influence of his wife, who came of a loyalist family, caused him to avoid any direct attack upon the English, he attacked them indirectly, and with great effect, by opposing an immediate and honorable success to their derisions. The spy ran through three editions in four months. It was followed by his long line of thoroughly American novels. In 1834 he formally apologized to his countrymen for his earlier truancy and precaution. Irving, too, soon adopted a bolder tone, and despite his English predilections, he refused an offer of a hundred guineas for an article for the Quarterly Review, made by Gifford in 1828, on the ground that the review had been so persistently hostile to our country that I cannot draw a pen in its service. The same year saw the publication of the first edition of Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language, and a year later followed Samuel L. Knapp's Lectures on American Literature, the first history of the national letters ever attempted. Knapp, in his preface, thought it necessary to prove, first of all, that an American literature actually existed, and Webster, in his introduction, was properly apologetic, but there was no real need for timorousness in either case. 
for the American attitude toward the attack of the English was now definitely changing from uneasiness to defiance. The English critics, in fact, had overdone the thing, and though their clatter was to keep up for many years more, they no longer spread terror or had much influence. Of a sudden, as if in answer to them, doubts turned to confidence and then into the wildest sort of optimism, not only in politics and business, but also in what passed for the arts. Knapp boldly defied the English to produce a tuneful sister surpassing Mrs. Sigourney. More, he argued that the New World, if only by reason of its superior scenic grandeur, would eventually hatch a poetry surpassing even that of Greece and Rome. What are the Tibers and Scamanders, he demanded, measured by the Missouri and the Amazon? Or what the loveliness of Elysius or Avon by the Connecticut or the Potomac? In brief, the national feeling, long delayed at birth, finally leaped into being in amazing vigor. One can get an idea of the strength of that feeling, says R. O. Williams, by glancing at almost any book taken at random from the American publications of the period. Belief in the grand future of the United States is the keynote of everything said and done. All things American are to be grand, our territory, population, products, wealth, science, art, but especially our political institutions and literature. The unbounded confidence in the material development of the country, which now characterizes the extreme northwest of the United States, prevailed as strongly throughout the eastern part of the Union during the first thirty years of the century, and over and above a belief in and concern for materialistic progress, there were enthusiastic anticipations of achievements in all the moral and intellectual fields of national greatness. Nor was that vast optimism wholly without warrant. An American literature was actually coming into being, and with a wall of hatred and contempt shutting in England, the new American writers were beginning to turn to the continent for inspiration and encouragement. Irving had already drunk at Spanish Springs. Emerson and Bayard Taylor were to receive powerful impulses from Germany, following Tickner, Bancroft, and Everett before them. Bryant was destined to go back to the classics. Moreover, Cooper and John P. Kennedy had shown the way to native sources of literary material, and Longfellow was making ready to follow them. Novels in imitation of English models were no longer heard of. The ground was preparing for Uncle Tom's Cabin. Finally, Webster himself, as Williams demonstrated, worked better than he knew. His American dictionary was not only thoroughly American, it was superior to any of the current dictionaries of the English so much so that for a good many years it remained a sort of mine for British lexicography to exploit. Thus all hesitations disappeared, and there arose a national consciousness so soaring and so blatant that it began to dismiss all British usage and opinion as puerile and idiotic. William L. Marcy, when Secretary of State under Pierce, 1853 to 1857, issued a circular to all American diplomatic and consular officers loftily bidding them employ only the American language in communicating with him. The legislature of Indiana, in an act approved February 15, 1838, establishing the State University at Bloomington. Footnote. It is curious to note that the center of population of the United States, according to the last census, is now in southern Indiana, in the western part of Bloomington City, Monroe County. Can it be that this early declaration of literary independence laid the foundation for Indiana's recent preeminence in letters? Compare The Language We Use by Alfred Z. Reed, New York Sun, March 13, 1918, in footnote, provided that it should instruct the youth of the new commonwealth. It had been admitted to the Union in 1816 in the American learned and foreign languages and literature. Such grandiose pronunciamentos well indicate and explain the temper of the era. Footnote. Support also came from abroad. Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, smarting under his defeat in the Crimea, issued an order that his own state paper should be prepared in Russian and American, not English. End footnote. It was a time of expansion in braggadocio. The new republic would not only produce a civilization and a literature of its own, it would show the way for all other civilizations and literatures. Rufus Wilmot Griswold, the enemy of Poe, 
rose from his decorous Baptist pew to protest that so much patriotism amounted to insularity and absurdity. But there seems to have been no one to second the motion. It took indeed the vast shock of the Civil War to unhorse the optimists. While the Jackson influence survived, it was the almost unanimous national conviction that he who dallies is a dastard, and he who doubts is damned. End of chapter 3, part 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 3, part 2 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken, Chapter 3. The Period of Growth, Part 2. The Language in the Making. All this jingoistic bombast, however, was directed toward defending not so much the national vernacular as the national beautiful letters. True enough, an English attack upon a definite American locution always brought out certain critical Minutemen, but in the main they were anything but hospitable to the racy neologisms that kept crowding up from below, and most of them were eager to be accepted as masters of orthodox English and very sensitive to the charge that their writing was bestrewn with Americanisms. A glance through the native criticism of the time will show how ardently even the most uncompromising patriots imitated the Johnsonian jargon then fashionable in England. Fowler and Griswold followed pantingly in the footsteps of Macaulay. Their prose is extraordinarily ornate and self-conscious, and one searches it in vain for any concession to colloquialism. Poe, the master of them all, achieved a style so elephantine that many an English leader writer must have studied it with envy. A few bolder spirits, as we have seen, spoke out for the national freedom in language as well as in letters, among them Channing. But in the main, the Brahmins of the time were conservatives in that department, and it is difficult to imagine Emerson or Irving or Bryant sanctioning the innovations later adopted so easily by Howells. Lowell and Walt Whitman, in fact, were the first men of letters, properly so called, to give specific assent to the great changes that were firmly fixed in the national speech during the half-century between the War of 1812 and the Civil War. Lowell did so in his preface to the second series of the Bigelow Papers. Whitman made his declaration in an American primer. In discussing his own poetry, he said, it is an attempt to give the spirit, the body, and the man, new words, new potentialities of speech, an American, a cosmopolitan, for the best of America is the best cosmopolitanism, range of self-expression. And then, the Americans are going to be the most fluent and melodious voiced people in the world and the most perfect users of words. The new times, the new people, the new vistas need a new tongue according. Yes, and what is more, they will have such a new tongue. To which, as every one knows, Whitman himself forthwith contributed many daring, and still undigested novelties, e.g., Camarado, Romanza, Adamic, and These States. Meanwhile, in strong contrast to the lingering conservatism above, there was a wild and lawless development of the language below, and in the end it forced itself into recognition and profited by the literary declaration of independence of its very opponents. The use at Norma Locendi says w r morfill the english philologist do not depend upon scholars particularly in a country where scholarship is still new and wholly cloistered and the overwhelming majority of the people are engaged upon novel and highly exhilarating tasks far away from schools and with a gigantic cockiness in their hearts the remnants of the puritan civilization had been wiped out by the rise of the proletariat under jackson and whatever was fine and sensitive in it had died with it what remained of an urbane habit of mind and utterance began to be confined to the narrowing feudal areas of the South, and to the still narrower refuge of the Boston Brahmins, now for the first time a definitely recognized caste of intelligentsia, self-charged with carrying the torch of culture through a new dark age. The typical American, in Paulding's satirical phrase, became a bundling, gouging, impious fellow without either morals literature religion or refinement next to the savage struggle for land and dollars party politics was the chief concern of the people and with the disappearance of the old leaders and the entrance of pushing upstarts from the backwoods 
political controversy sank to an incredibly low level. Bartlett, in the introduction to the second edition of his glossary, describes the effect upon the language. First the enfranchised mob, whether in the city wards or along the western rivers, invented fantastic slang words and turns of phrase. Then they were seized upon by stump speakers at political meetings. Then they were heard in Congress. Then they got into the newspapers. And finally they came into more or less good usage. Much contemporary evidence is to the same effect. Fowler, in listing low expressions in 1850, described them as chiefly political. The vernacular tongue of the country, said Daniel Webster, has become greatly vitiated, depraved, and corrupted by the style of the congressional debates. Thornton, in the appendix to his glossary, gives some astounding specimens of congressional oratory between the twenties and the sixties, and many more will reward the explorer who braves the files of the congressional globe. This flood of racy and unprecedented words and phrases beat upon and finally penetrated the retreat of the literati but the purity of speech cultivated there had little compensatory influence upon the Vulgate. The newspaper was now enthroned, and bellettes were cultivated almost in private, and as a mystery. It is probable, indeed, that Uncle Tom's Cabin and Ten Nights in a Barroom, both published in the early fifties, were the first contemporary native books after Cooper's Day that the American people as a people ever read. Nor did the pulpit, now fast falling from its old high estate, lift a corrective voice. On the contrary, it joined the crowd, and Bartlett denounces it specifically for its bad example, and cites among its crimes against the language such inventions as to doxologize and to funeralize. To these novelties, apparently without any thought of their uncouthness, Fowler adds to missionate and consociational. As I say, the pressure from below broke down the defenses of the purists, and literally forced a new national idiom upon them. Pen in hand, they might still achieve laborious imitations of Johnson and Macaulay, but their mouths began to betray them. When it comes to talking, wrote Charles Astor Bristed for Englishmen in 1855, the most refined and best educated American, who has habitually resided in his own country, the very man who would write on some serious topic, volumes in which no peculiarity could be detected, will in half a dozen sentences use at least as many words that cannot fail to strike the inexperienced Englishman who hears them for the first time. Bristed gave a specimen of the American of that time, calculated to flabbergast his inexperienced Englishman. You will find it in the volume of Cambridge Essays, already cited. His aim was to explain and defend Americanisms, and so shut off the storm of English reviling, and he succeeded in producing one of the most thoughtful and persuasive essays on the subject ever written. But his purpose failed, and the attack kept up, and eight years afterward the very Reverend Henry Alford, D.D., Dean of Canterbury, led a famous assault. Look at those phrases, he said, which so amuse us in their speech and books at their reckless exaggeration and contempt for congruity. And then compare the character and history of the nation, its blunted sense of moral obligation and duty to man, its open disregard of conventional right where aggrandizement is to be obtained, and I may now say its reckless and fruitless maintenance of the most cruel and unprincipled war in the history of the world. In his American edition of 1866, Dr. Alford withdrew this reference to the Civil War, and somewhat ameliorated his indignation otherwise. But he clung to the main counts in his indictment, and most Englishmen, I dare say, still give them a certain support. The American is no longer a vain, egotistical, insolent, rodomontade sort of fellow. America is no longer the brigand confederation of the foreign quarterly, or the loathsome creature, maimed and lame, full of sores and ulcers of Dickens, but the Americanism is yet regarded with a bilious eye, and pounced upon viciously when found. Even the friendliest English critics seem to be daunted by the gargantuan copiousness of American inventions and speech. Their position, perhaps, was well stated by Captain Basil Hall, author of the celebrated Travels in North America in 1827. When he argued that surely such innovations are to be deprecated, an American asked him this question. If a word becomes universally current in America, why should it not take its station in the language? 
Because, replied Hall, in all seriousness, there are words enough in our language already. End of chapter 3, part 2. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 3, part 3 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 3. The Period of Growth. Part 3. The Expanding Vocabulary. A glance at some of the characteristic coinages of the time, as they are revealed in the Congressional Globe, in contemporary newspapers and political tracts, and in that grotesque small literature of humor, which began with Judge Thomas C. Halliburton's Sam Slick in 1835, is almost enough to make one sympathize with Dean Alford. Bartlett quotes, To Doxologize, from The Christian Disciple, a quite reputable religious paper of the 40s. To Citizenize was used and explained by Senator Young of Illinois in the Senate on February 1, 1841, and he gave Noah Webster as authority for it. To Funeralize and To Missionate, along with Consociational, were contributions of the backwoods pulpit. Perhaps it also produced Hell Roaring and Hellion, the latter of which was a favorite of the Mormons, and even got into a sermon by Henry Ward Beecher. To deacon, a verb of decent mien in colonial days, signifying to read a hymn line by line, responded to the rough humor of the time, and began to mean to swindle or adulterate, example to put the largest berries at the top of the box, to extend one's fences sub rosa, or to mix sand with sugar. A great rage for extending the vocabulary by the use of suffixes seized upon the corn-fed etymologists, and they produced a formidable new vocabulary in I-Z-E, A-T-E, I-F-Y, A-C-Y, O-U-S, and M-E-N-T. Such inventions as to obligate, to concertize, to questionize, retiracy, savageress, coatee, a sort of diminutive for coat, and citified, appeared in the popular vocabulary, and even got into more or less good usage. Fowler, in 1850, cited publishment and releasement with no apparent thought that they were uncouth. And at the same time, many verbs were made by the simple process of back formation, as to resurrect, to excurt, to resolute, to burgle. Footnote. J. R. Ware, in Passing English of the Victorian Era, says that to burgle was introduced to London by W. S. Gilbert in The Three Pirates of Penzance, April 3, 1880. It was used in America thirty years before. End footnote. And to enthuse. Footnote. This process, of course, is philologically respectable, however uncouth its occasional products may be. By it we have acquired many everyday words, among them to accept from acceptum, to exact from exactum, to darkle from darkling, and pea from peas, pois. End footnote. Some of these inventions, after flourishing for a generation or more, were retired with blushes during the period of aesthetic consciousness following the Civil War, but a large number have survived to our own day and are in good usage. Not even the most bilious purist would think of objecting to to affiliate, to itemize, to resurrect, or to Americanize today, and yet all of them gave grief to the judicious when they first appeared in the debates of Congress, brought there by statesmen from the backwoods, nor to such simpler verbs of the period as to corner, i.e. the market, to boss, and to lynch. Footnote. 
All authorities, save one, seem to agree that this verb is a pure Americanism and that it is derived from the name of Charles Lynch, a Virginia Justice of the Peace, who jailed many loyalists in 1780 without warrant in law. The dissentient, Bristed, says that to lynch is in various northern English dialects and means to beat or maltreat. End footnote. Nor perhaps to to boom, to boost, to kick in the sense of to protest, to coast on a sled, to engineer, to collide, to chink, i.e. logs, to fees, to splurge, to aggravate in the sense of to anger, to yank, and to crawfish. These verbs have entered into the very fiber of the American Vulgate, and so have many nouns derived from them. Example, boomer, boomtown, bouncer, kicker, kick, splurge, roller coaster. A few of them, example, to collide and to fees, were archaic English terms brought to new birth. A few others, example, to holler. Footnote. The correct form of this appears to be halloo or halloa, but in America it is pronounced holler and usually represented in print by hollow, H-O-L-L-O, or hollow, H-O-L-L-O-W. I have often encountered hallowed in the past tense, but the public printer frankly accepts holler. Veed the Congressional Record, May 12, 1917, page 2309. The word in the form of hollering is here credited to Honorable John J. Burnett of Alabama. There can be no doubt that the honorable gentleman said hollering and not hallowing halloa ing or holloa ing or hollowing or hallooing. Hello is apparently a variation of the same word. End footnote. And to muss were obviously mere corruptions. But a good many others, example, to bulldoze, to hornswoggle, and to scoot, were genuine inventions and redolent of the soil. With the new verbs came a great swarm of verb phrases, some of them short and pithy, and others extraordinarily elaborate, but all showing the true national talent for condensing a complex thought, and often a whole series of thoughts, into a vivid and arresting image. Of the first class are to fill the bill, to fizzle out, to make tracks, to peter out, to plank down, to go back on, to keep tab, to light out, and to backwater. Side by side with them we have inherited such common coins of speech as to make the fur fly, to cut a swath, to know him like a book, to keep a stiff upper lip, to cap the climax, to handle without gloves, to freeze on to, to go it blind, to pull wool over his eyes, to know the ropes, to get solid with, to spread oneself, to run into the ground, to dodge the issue, to paint the town red, to take a back seat, and to get ahead of. These are so familiar that we use them and hear them without thought. They seem as authentically parts of the English idiom as to be left at the post. And yet, as the labors of Thornton have demonstrated, all of them are of American nativity, and the circumstances surrounding the origin of some of them have been accurately determined. Many others are palpably the products of the great movement toward the West, for example, to pan out, to strike it rich, to jump or enter a claim, to pull up stakes, to rope in, to die with one's boots on, to get the dead wood on, to get the drop, to back and fill, a steamboat phrase used figuratively, and to get the bulge on. 
and in many others the authentic American is no less plain. For example, in To Kick the Bucket, To Put a Bug in His Ear, To See the Elephant, To Crack Up, To Do Up Brown, To Bark Up the Wrong Tree, To Jump On With Both Feet, To Go the Whole Hog, To Make a Kick, To Buck the Tiger, to let it slide, and to come out at the little end of the horn. To play possum belongs to this list. To it, Thornton adds, to knock into a cocked hat, despite its English sound, and to have an axe to grind. To go for, both in the sense of belligerency and in that of partisanship, is also American, and so is to go through i.e. to plunder. Of adjectives, the list is scarcely less long. Among the coinages of the first half of the century that are in good use today are non-committal, highfalutin, well-posted, downtown, played out, flat-footed, whole-souled, and true blue. The first appears in a Senate debate of 1841 highfalutin in a political speech of the same decade. Both are useful words. It is impossible not employing them to convey the ideas behind them without circumlocution. The use of slim in the sense of meager, as in slim chance, slim attendance, and slim support, goes back still further. The English use small in place of it. Other and less respectable contributions of the time are brash, brainy, peart, locoed, pesky, picayune, scary, well-heeled, hard shell, example Baptist, loaflong, codfish to indicate opprobrium, and go to meeting. The use of plum as an adjective, as in plum crazy, is an English archaism that was revived in the United States in the early years of the century. In the more orthodox adverbial form of plump, it still survives. For example, in she fell plump into his arms. But this last is also good English. The characteristic American substitution of mad for angry goes back to the 18th century and perhaps denotes the survival of an English provincialism. Witherspoon noticed it and denounced it in 1781, and in 1816 Pickering called it low, and said that it was not used except in very familiar conversation. But it got into much better odor soon afterward, and by 1840 it passed unchallenged. Its use is one of the peculiarities that Englishmen most quickly notice in American colloquial speech today. In formal written discourse, it is less often encountered, probably because the English marking of it has so conspicuously singled it out. But it is constantly met with in the newspapers and in the congressional record, and it is not infrequently used by such writers as Howells and Dreiser. In the familiar simile, as mad as a hornet, it is used in the American sense. But as mad as a March hare is English, and connotes insanity, not mere anger. The English meaning of the word is preserved in madhouse and mad dog, but I have often noticed that American rustics, employing the latter term, derive from it a vague notion, not that the dog is demented, but that it is in a simple fury. From this notion, perhaps, comes the popular belief that dogs may be thrown into hydrophobia by teasing and badgering them. It was not, however, among the verbs and adjectives that the American word coiners of the first half of the century achieved their gaudiest innovations, but among the substantives. Here they had temptation and excuse in plenty for innumerable new objects and relations demanded names, and here they exercised their fancy without restraint. Setting aside loan words, which will be considered later, three main varieties of new nouns were thus produced. 
The first consisted of English words rescued from obsolescence or changed in meaning. The second of compounds manufactured of the common materials of the mother tongue. And the third of entirely new inventions. Of the first class, good specimens are deck of cards, gulch, gully, and billion. The first three, old English words restored to usage in America, and the last, a sound English word changed in meaning. Of the second class, examples are offered by gumshoe, mortgage shark, dugout, shotgun, stag party, wheat pit, horse sense, chipped beef, oyster supper, buzz saw, chain gang, and hell box. And of the third, there are instances in bunkum, greaser, conniption, bloomer, campus, galoot, maverick, roustabout, bugaboo, and blizzard. Of these coinages, perhaps those of the second class are most numerous and characteristic. In them, American exhibits one of its most marked tendencies, a habit of achieving shortcuts in speech by a process of agglutination. Why explain laboriously, as an Englishman might, that the notes of a new bank, in a day of innumerable new banks, are insufficiently secure? Call them wildcat notes and have done. Why describe a gigantic rainstorm with the lame adjectives of every day? Call it a cloudburst and immediately a vivid picture of it is conjured up. Roughneck is a capital word. It is more apposite and savory than the English navvy, and it is overwhelmingly more American. Footnote. Roughneck is often cited in discussions of slang as a latter-day invention, but Thornton shows that it was used in Texas in 1836. End footnote. Square meal is another. Fire eater is yet another. And the same instinct for the terse, the eloquent, and the picturesque is in boiled shirt, blowout, big bug, claim jumper, spread eagle, Come down, back number, claw hammer, coat, bottom dollar, puppycock, cold snap, back talk, back taxes, calamity howler, cut off, firebug, grab bag, grip sack, grub steak, pay dirt, tender foot, stocking feet, ticket scalper, store clothes, small potatoes, cakewalk, prairie schooner, roundup, snake fence, flatboat, under the weather, on the hoof, and jumping off place. These compounds, there must be thousands of them, have been largely responsible for giving the language its characteristic tang and color. Such specimens as bellhop, semi-occasional, chair warmer, and down and out are as distinctively American as baseball or the quick lunch. The spirit of the language appears scarcely less clearly in some of the coinages of the other classes. There are, for example, the English words that have been extended or restricted in meaning. Example, docket for court calendar. Betterment for improvement to property. Collateral for security crank for fanatic, jumper for tunic, tickler for memorandum or reminder, footnote. This use goes back to 1839. End footnote. Carnival, in such phrases as carnival of crime, scrape for fight or difficulty, footnote. Thornton gives an example dated 1812. Of late, the word has lost its final e and shortened its vowel, becoming scrap. End footnote. Flurry, of snow or in the market. Suspenders, diggings, for habitation, and range. Again, 
There are the new assemblings of English materials, example, doggery, rowdy, teetotaler, goatee, tony, and cussedness. Yet again, there are the purely artificial words, example, sockdolager, hunky dory, scalawag, gyascutis, spondulix, slumgullion, rambunctious, scrumptious, to skedaddle, to absquatulate, and to exflunkticate. Footnote. Terms of Approbation and Eulogy by Elise L. Warnock, Dialect Notes, Volume 4, Part 1, 1913. Among the curious recent coinages cited by Miss Warnock are Scallywampus, Supergobusnoptious, Hyperformaceous, Scrumdiferous, and Swell Elegus. End footnote. In the use of the last named coinages, fashions change. In the 40s, to absquatulate was in good usage, but it has since disappeared. Most of the other inventions of the time, however, have to some extent survived, and it would be difficult to find an American of today who did not know the meaning of scalawag and rambunctious, and who did not occasionally use them. A whole series of artificial American words groups itself around the prefix K-E-R. For example, kerflop, kerslash, kerthump, kerbang, kerplunk, kerslam, and kerflummox. This prefix and its onomatopoeic daughters have been borrowed by the English, but Thornton and Ware agree that it is American. Its origin has not been determined. As Sace says, the native instinct of language breaks out wherever it has the chance, and coins words which can be traced back to no ancestors. In the first chapter, I mentioned the superior imaginativeness revealed by Americans in meeting linguistic emergencies, whereby, for example, in seeking names for new objects introduced by the building of railroads, they surpassed the English plow and crossing plate with cow-catcher and frog. That was in the 30s. Already at that early day, the two languages were so differentiated that they produced wholly distinct railroad nomenclatures. Such commonplace American terms as boxcar, caboose, airline, and ticket agent are still quite unknown in England. So are freight car, flagman, towerman, switch, switching engine, switch yard, switch man, track walker, engineer, baggage room, baggage check, baggage smasher, accommodation train, baggage master, conductor, express car, flat car, hand car, way bill, express man, express office, fast freight, wrecking crew, jerk water, commutation ticket, Commuter, round trip, mileage book, ticket scalper, depot, limited, hot box, iron horse, stopover, tie, rail, fish plate, run, train boy, chair car, club car, diner, sleeper, bumpers, mail clerk, passenger coach, day coach, excursionist, excursion train, railroad man, ticket office, truck, and right-of-way, not to mention the verbs to flag, to derail, to express, to deadhead, to sideswipe, to stop over, to fire, i.e. a locomotive, to switch, to sidetrack, to railroad, to commute, to telescope, and to clear the track. These terms are in constant use in America. Their meaning is familiar to all Americans. Many of them have given the language everyday figures of speech. Footnote. Example, single-track mind. To jump the rails. To collide head-on. Broad-gauge man. To walk the ties. Blind baggage. Underground railroad. Tank town. End footnote.
but the majority of them would puzzle an Englishman, just as the English luggage van, permanent way, goods wagon, guard, carrier, booking office, return ticket, railway rug, RSO, railway sub-office, tripper, line, points, shunt, metals, and bogey would puzzle the average untraveled American. In two other familiar fields, very considerable differences between English and American are visible. In both fields, they go back to the era before the Civil War. They are politics and that department of social intercourse which has to do with drinking. Many characteristic American political terms originated in revolutionary days and have passed over into English. Of such sort are caucus and mileage. But the majority of those in common use today were coined during the extraordinarily exciting campaigns following the defeat of Adams by Jefferson. Charles Ledyard Norton has devoted a whole book to their etymology and meaning. The number is far too large for a list of them to be attempted here, but a few characteristic specimens may be recalled. For example, the simple agglutinates, omnibus bill, banner state, favorite son, anxious bench, gag rule, office seeker, and straight ticket, the humorous metaphors, pork barrel, pie counter, wire puller, landslide, carpet bagger, lame duck, and on the fence. The old words put to new uses. Plank, platform, machine, precinct, slate, primary, floater, repeater, bolter, stalwart, filibuster, regular, and fences. The new coinages, gerrymander, healer, buncombe, roarback, mugwump, and to bulldoze. The new derivatives, abolitionist, candidacy, boss rule, per diem, to lobby, and boodler, and the almost innumerable verbs and verb phrases, to knife, to split a ticket, to go up Salt River, to bolt, to eat crow, to boodle, to divvy, to grab, and to run. An English candidate never runs, he stands. To run, according to Thornton, was already used in America in 1789. It was universal by 1820. Platform came in at the same time. Machine was first applied to a political organization by Aaron Burr. The use of mugwump is commonly thought to have originated in the Blaine campaign of 1884, but it really goes back to the 30s. Anxious bench, or anxious seat, at first designated only the place occupied by the penitent at revivals, but was used in its present political sense in Congress so early as 1842. Banner State appears in Niles' Register for December 5, 1840. Favorite Son appears in an ode addressed to Washington on his visit to Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1789, but it did not acquire its present ironical sense until it was applied to Martin Van Buren. Thornton has traced Bolter to 1812, Filibuster to 1863, Ruhr back to 1844, and Split Ticket to 1842. Regularity was an issue in Tammany Hall in 1822. There were primaries in New York City in 1827, and hundreds of repeaters voted. In 1829, there were lobby agents at Albany, and they soon became lobbyists. In 1832, lobbying had already extended to Washington. All of these terms are now as firmly embedded in the American vocabulary as election or congressman. In the Department of Conviviality, the imaginativeness of Americans has been shown in both the invention and the naming of new and often highly complex beverages. 
so vast has been the production of novelties in fact that england has borrowed many of them and their names with them and not only england one buys cocktails and gin fizzes in american bars that stretch from paris to yokohama cocktail stone fence and sherry cobbler were mentioned by irving in eighteen o nine by thackeray's day they were already well known in england thornton traces the sling to seventeen eighty eight and the stinky bus and antiphogmatic both now extinct to the same year the origin of the ricky fizz sour cooler skin shrub and smash and of such curious american drinks as the horse's neck mamie taylor tom and jerry tom collins john collins bishop stonewall gin fix brandy champerelle golden slipper harry carey locomotive whiskey daisy blue blazer black stripe white plush and brandy crusta is quite unknown the historians of alcoholism like the philologists have neglected them footnote extensive lists of such drinks with their ingredients are to be found in the hoffman house bartender's guide by charles mahoney fourth edition new york 1916 the up-to-date bartender's guide by harry montague baltimore 1913 and in wayman brothers bartender's guide new york 1912 an early list from the lancaster pennsylvania journal of january 26 1821 is quoted by thornton volume two page 985 End footnote. but the essentially american character of most of them is obvious despite the fact that a number have gone over into english the english in naming their drinks commonly display a far more limited imagination seeking a name for example for a mixture of whiskey and soda water the best they could achieve was whiskey and soda the americans introduced to the same drink at once gave it the far more original name of highball so with ginger ale and ginger pop so with minerals and soft drinks other characteristic americanisms a few of them borrowed by the english are red eye corn juice eye opener forty rod squirrel whiskey phlegm cutter moonshine hard cider applejack and corpse reviver and the auxiliary drinking terms speak easy sample room blind pig barrel house bouncer bung starter dive doggery schooner shell stick duck straight saloon finger pony and chaser thornton shows that jag bust bat and to crook the elbow are also americanisms so are bartender and saloon keeper to them might be added a long list of common american synonyms for drunk for example piffled pifflicated awry eyed tanked snooted stewed ossified slopped fiddled edged loaded het up frazzled jugged soused jiggered corned jagged and bunned farmer and henley list corned and jagged among english synonyms but the former is obviously an americanism derived from corn whiskey or corn juice and thornton says that the latter originated on this side of the atlantic also end of chapter three part three recording by linda johnson chapter three part four of the american language this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 3. The Period of Growth. Part 4. Loan Words. The Indians of the New West, it would seem, 
had little to add to the contributions already made to the American vocabulary by the Algonquins of the Northeast. The American people, by the beginning of the second quarter of the 19th century, knew almost all they were destined to know of the Aborigine, and they had names for all the new objects that he had brought to their notice and for most of his peculiar implements and ceremonies. A few translated Indian terms, example, squaw man, big chief, great white father, and happy hunting ground, represent the meager fresh stock that the Western pioneers got from him. Of more importance was the suggestive and indirect effect of his polysynthetic dialects, and particularly of his vivid proper names, example, rain in the face, young man afraid of his wife, and voice like thunder. These names and other word phrases like them made an instant appeal to American humor and were extensively imitated in popular slang. One of the surviving coinages of that era is Old Stick in the Mud, which Farmer and Henley note as having reached England by 1823. Contact with the French in Louisiana and along the Canadian border, and with the Spanish in Texas and further west, brought many more new words. From the Canadian French, as we have already seen, prairie, bateau, portage, and rapids had been borrowed during colonial days. To these French contributions, bayou, picayune, levee, chute, butte, crevasse, and lagnap were now added, and probably also shanty and canuck. The use of brave to designate an Indian warrior, almost universal until the close of the Indian Wars, was also of French origin. From the Spanish, once the Mississippi was crossed, and particularly after the Mexican War in 1846, there came a swarm of novelties, many of which have remained firmly embedded in the language. Among them were numerous names of strange objects, lariat, lasso, ranch, loco, weed, mustang, sombrero, canyon, desperado, poncho, chaparral, corral, bronco, plaza, peon, cayuse, burro, mesa, tornado, sierra, and adobe. To them, as soon as gold was discovered, were added bonanza, eldorado, placer, and vigilante. Cinch was borrowed from the Spanish cincha in the early Texas days, though its figurative use did not come in until much later. Ante, the poker term, though the etymologists point out its obvious origin in the Latin, probably came into American from the Spanish. Thornton's first example of its use in its current sense is dated 1857, but Bartlett reported it in the form of anti in 1848. Coyote came from the Mexican dialect of Spanish. Its first parent was the Aztec Coyotl. Tamale had a similar origin, and so did Frijole and tomato. None of these is good Spanish. As usual, derivatives quickly followed the newcomers, among them peonage, bronco buster, ranchmen, and ranch house, and the verbs to ranch, to lasso, to corral, to ante up, and to cinch. To vamos, from the Spanish vamos, let us go, came in at the same time. So did sabe, so did gazabo. This was also the period of the first great immigrations, and the American people now came into contact on a large scale with peoples of divergent race, particularly Germans, Irish Catholics from the south of Ireland, the Irish of colonial days were descendants of Cromwell's army and came from the north of Ireland and on the Pacific coast, Chinese, 
So early as the 20s, the immigration to the United States reached 25,000 in a year. In 1824, the legislature of New York, in alarm, passed a restrictive act. Footnote. Most of the provisions of this act, however, were later declared unconstitutional. Several subsequent acts met the same fate. End footnote. The know-nothing movement of the 50s need not concern us here. Suffice it to recall that the immigration of 1845 passed the 100,000 mark, and that that of 1854 came within sight of 500,000. These new Americans, most of them Germans and Irish, did not all remain in the East. A great many spread through the West and Southwest with the other pioneers. Their effect upon the language was not large, perhaps, but it was still very palpable, and not only in the vocabulary. Of words of German origin, sauerkraut and noodle, as we have seen, had come in during the colonial period, apparently through the so-called Pennsylvania Dutch, i.e. a mixture, much debased, of the German dialects of Switzerland, Swabia, and the Palatinate. The new immigrants now contributed pretzel, pumpernickel, hausfrau, lager beer, pinochle, wienerwurst, dumb for stupid, frankfurter, bock beer, schnitzel, laborwurst, blutwurst, rathskeller, schweitzer, cheese, delicatessen, hamburger, i.e. steak, kindergarten, and katzenjammer. Footnote. The majority of these words, it will be noted, relate to eating and drinking. They mirror the profound effect of German immigration upon American drinking habits and the American cuisine. It is a curious fact that loan words seldom represent the higher aspirations of the creditor nation. French and German have borrowed from English not words of lofty significance, but such terms as beefsteak, roast beef, pudding, grog, jockey, tourist, sport, five o'clock tea, cocktail, and sweepstakes. The contributions of England to European civilization, as tested by the English words in continental languages, says L. P. Smith, are not generally of a kind to cause much national self-congratulation. Nor would a German, I dare say, be very proud of the German contributions to American. End footnote. From them, in all probability, there also came two very familiar Americanisms, loafer and bum. The former, according to the standard dictionary, is derived from the German laufen. Another authority says that it originated in a German mispronunciation of lover, i.e. as loafer. Thornton shows that the word was already in common use in 1835. Bum was originally bummer, and apparently derives from the German bummler. Footnote. Thornton offers examples of this form ranging from 1856 to 1885. During the Civil War, the word acquired the special meaning of looter. The Southerners thus applied it to Sherman's men. Here is a popular rhyme that survived until the early 90s. Isidore, pisht, pisht, watch de stor, pisht, pisht, while I catch de bummer, what stole de suit of clothes. Bummelzug is common German slang for slow train. End footnote. Both words have produced derivatives. Loaf, noun, to loaf, corner loafer, common loafer, to bum, bum adjective, and bummery, not to mention on the bum. Loafer has migrated in England, but bum is still unknown there in the American sense. In English, indeed, bum is used to designate an unmentionable part of the body and is thus not employed in polite discourse. Another example of debased German 
is offered by the American Chris Kringle. It is from Christ Kindlein or Christ Kindle, and properly designates, of course, not the patron saint of Christmas, but the child in the manger. A German friend tells me that the form Chris Kringle, which is that given in the standard dictionary, and the form Chris Kingle, which is that most commonly used in the United States, are both quite unknown in Germany. Here, obviously, we have an example of a loan word in decay. Whole phrases have gone through the same process. For example, Nix com eros, from nichts kommt heraus, and raus mit ihm, from heraus mit ihm. These phrases, like wie geht's and ganz gut, are familiar to practically all Americans, no matter how complete their ignorance of correct German. Most of them know, too, the meaning of Gesundheit, Kummel, Seidel, Wanderlust, Stein, Speck, Menachor, Schutzenfest, Sangefest, Turnverein, Hock, Yodel, Zweibach, and Zwei, as in Zwei beer. I have found Snitz, Schnitz, in town topics. Prosit is in all American dictionaries. Footnote. Nevertheless, when I once put it into a night letter, a Western Union office refused to accept it, the rules requiring all night letters to be in plain English. Meanwhile, the English have borrowed it from American, and it is actually in the Oxford Dictionary. End footnote. Bauer, as used in cards, is an Americanism derived from the German Bauer, meaning the jack. The exclamation, ouch, is classed as an Americanism by Thornton, and he gives an example dated 1837. The New English Dictionary refers it to the German, ouch, and Thornton says that it may have come across with the Dunkers or the Mennonites. Ouch is not heard in English, save in the sense of a clasp or buckle set with precious stones. Noosh. And even in that sense, it is archaic. Scheister is very probably German also. Thornton has traced it back to the fifties. Footnote. The word is not in the Oxford Dictionary, but Castle gives it and says that it is German and an Americanism. The standard dictionary does not give its etymology. Thornton's first example, dated 1856, shows a variant spelling, S-H-U-Y-S-T-E-R, thus indicating that it was then recent. All subsequent examples show the present spelling. It is to be noted that the suffix S-T-E-R is not uncommon in English and that it usually carries a deprecatory significance, as in trickster, punster, gamester, etc. End footnote. Rum dumb is grounded upon the meaning of dumb borrowed from the German. It is not listed in the English slang dictionaries. Footnote. The use of dumb for stupid is widespread in the United States. Dumbhead, obviously from the German Dummkopf, appears in a list of Kansas words collected by Judge J.C. Ruppenthal of Russell, Kansas. It is also noted in Nebraska and the Western Reserve, and is very common in Pennsylvania. Urgucker, Urgucken, is also on the Kansas list of Judge Ruppenthal. End footnote. Bristed says that the American meaning of wagon, which indicates almost any four-wheeled, horse-drawn vehicle in this country, but only the very heaviest in England, was probably influenced by the German wagen. He also says that the American use of hold on for stop was suggested by the German halt an, and White says that the substitution of standpoint for point of view long opposed by all purists, was first made by an American professor who sought an anglicized form of the German Standpunkt.
The same German influence may be behind the general facility with which American forms compound nouns. In most other languages, for example, Latin and French, the process is rare, and even English lags far behind American. But in German, it is almost unrestricted. It is, says L. P. Smith, a great step in advance toward that ideal language in which meaning is expressed not by terminations, but by the simple method of word position. The immigrants from the south of Ireland during the period under review exerted an influence upon the language that was vastly greater than that of the Germans, both directly and indirectly, but their contributions to the actual vocabulary were probably less. They gave American, indeed, relatively few new words. Perhaps chilele, colleen, spalpeen, smithereens, and poteen exhaust the unmistakably Gaelic list. Lollapalooza is also probably an Irish loan word, though it is not Gaelic. It apparently comes from Ale Fuzi, a Mayo provincialism signifying a sturdy fellow. Ale Fuzi, in its turn, comes from the French Ale Fusil, meaning forward the muskets, a memory, according to P. W. Joyce, of the French landing at Killala in 1798. Such phrases as Erin go bra and such expletives as Begob and Begori may perhaps be added. They have got into American, though they are surely not distinctive Americanisms. But of far more importance than these few contributions to the vocabulary were certain speech habits that the Irish brought with them, habits of pronunciation, of syntax, and even of grammar. These habits were, in part, the fruit of efforts to translate the idioms of Gaelic into English, and, in part, borrowings from the English of the age of James I. The latter, preserved by Irish conservatism in speech, footnote, Our people, says Dr. Joyce, are very conservative in retaining old customs and forms of speech. Many words, accordingly, that are discarded as old-fashioned or dead and gone in England are still flourishing, alive and well in Ireland. They represent the classical English of Shakespeare's time. End footnote. Came into contact in America with habits surviving, with more or less change, from the same time, and so gave those American habits an unmistakable reinforcement. The Yankees, so to speak, had lived down such Jacobian pronunciations as tay for tea and deceive for deceive, and these forms on Irish lips struck them as uncouth and absurd, but they still clung in their common speech to such forms as hist for hoist, bile for boil, chaw for chew, jine for join, footnote. Pope rhymed join with mine, divine, and line. Dryden rhymed toil with smile. William Kenrick in 1773 seems to have been the first English lexicographer to denounce this pronunciation. Tay survived in England until the second half of the 18th century. Then it fell into disrepute, and certain purists, among them Lord Chesterfield, attempted to change the E-A sound to E-E -E in all words, including even great. End footnote. Sass for sauce, height for height, and wrench for rinse, and lep for leap, and the employment of precisely the same forms by the thousands of Irish immigrants who spread through the country undoubtedly gave them a certain support, and so protected them, in a measure, from the assault of the purists. And the same support was given to drowned for drowned, once it for once, catch for catch, again for against, and honorary 
for ordinary. Certain usages of Gaelic, carried over into the English of Ireland, fell upon fertile soil in America. One was the employment of the definite article before nouns, as in French and German. An Irishman does not say, I am good at Latin, but I am good at the Latin. In the same way, an American does not say, I had measles, but I had the measles. There is again the use of the prefix a before various adjectives and gerunds, as in a going and a riding. This usage, of course, is native to English, as a board and a foot demonstrate, but it is much more common in the Irish dialect on account of the influence of the parallel Gaelic form, as in a n ace, a near, and it is also much more common in American. There is, yet again, a use of intensifying suffixes, often set down as characteristically American, which was probably borrowed from the Irish. Examples are no siree and yes indeedy, and the later kiddo and skidoo. As Joyce shows, such suffixes in Irish English tend to become whole phrases. The Irishman is almost incapable of saying plain yes or no. He must always add some extra and gratuitous asseveration. Footnote. Amusing examples are to be found in Don Levy's Irish Catechism. To the question, is the sun God? The answer is not simply yes, but yes, certainly he is. And to the question, will God reward the good and punish the wicked? The answer is, certainly there is no doubt he will. End footnote. The American is in like case. His speech bristles with intensives. Bet your life, not on your life. Well, I guess, and no mistake, and so on. The Irish extravagance of speech struck a responsive chord in the American heart. The American borrowed not only occasional words, but whole phrases, and some of them have become thoroughly naturalized. Joyce, indeed, shows the Irish origin of scores of locutions that are now often mistaken for Native Americanisms. For example, great shakes, dead as an intensive, thank you kindly, to split one's sides, i.e. laughing, and the tune the old cow died of, not to mention many familiar similes and proverbs. Certain Irish pronunciations, Gaelic rather than archaic English, got into American during the 19th century. Among them, one recalls Bahoy, which entered our political slang in the middle 40s and survived into our own time. Again, there is the very characteristic American word ballyhoo, signifying the harangue of a ballyhoo man, or spieler, that is, barker, before a cheap show, or by metaphor, any noisy speech. It is from ballyhooly, the name of a village in Cork, once notorious for its brawls. Finally, there is shebang. Chaldevier derives it from the French caban, but it seems rather more likely that it is from the Irish shebeen. The propagation of Irishisms in the United States was helped during many years by the enormous popularity of various dramas of Irish peasant life, particularly those of Dion Boussicot. So recently as 1910, an investigation made by the dramatic mirror showed that some of his pieces, notably Kathleen Maverneen, the Colleen Bawn, and the Chagron, were still among the favorites of popular audiences. Such plays at one time were presented by dozens of companies, and a number of Irish actors, among them Andrew Mack, Chauncey Alcott, and Boussico himself, made fortunes appearing in them. An influence also to be taken into account is that of Irish songs, once in great vogue. 
But such influences, like the larger matter of American borrowings from Anglo-Irish, remain to be investigated. So far as I have been able to discover, there is not a single article in print upon the subject. Here, as elsewhere, our philologists have wholly neglected a very interesting field of inquiry. From other languages, the borrowings during the period of growth were naturally less. Down to the last decades of the 19th century, the overwhelming majority of immigrants were either Germans or Irish. The Jews, Italians, and Slavs were yet to come. But the first Chinese appeared in 1848, and soon their speech began to contribute its inevitable loanwords. These words, of course, were first adopted by the miners of the Pacific coast, and a great many of them have remained California localisms, among them such verbs as to yen, to desire strongly, as a Chinaman desires opium, and to flop-flop, to lie down, and such nouns as fun, a measure of weight. But a number of others have got into the common speech of the whole country. Example, fantan, kowtow, chop suey, ginseng, joss, yokami, and tong. Contrary to the popular opinion, dope and hop are not from the Chinese. Neither, in fact, is an Americanism, though the former has one meaning that is specially American, i.e. that of information or formula, as in racing dope and to dope out. Most etymologists derive the word from the Dutch doop, a sauce. In English, as in American, it signifies a thick liquid, and hence the viscous cooked opium. Hop is simply the common name of the humulus lupulus. The belief that hops have a soporific effect is very ancient, and hop pillows were brought to America by the first English colonists. The derivation of poker, which came into American from California in the days of the gold rush, has puzzled etymologists. It is commonly derived from primero, the name of a somewhat similar game popular in England in the 16th century, but the relation seems rather fanciful. It may possibly come indirectly from the Danish word poker, signifying the devil. Pokerish, in the sense of alarming, was a common adjective in the United States before the Civil War. Thornton gives an example dated 1827. Schiel de Vere says that poker, in the sense of a hobgoblin, was still in use in 1871, but he derives the name of the game from the French poche, push, pocket. He seems to believe that the bank or pool in the early days was called the poke. Barrea and Leyland, rejecting all these guesses, derive poker from the Yiddish poker, which comes in turn from the verb pochgen, signifying to conceal winnings or losses. This pochgen is obviously related to the German pocher, boaster, braggart. There were a good many German Jews in California in the early days, and they were ardent gamblers. If Barrea and Leyland are correct, then poker enjoys the honor of being the first loan word taken into American from the Yiddish. End of Chapter 3, Part 4 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 3, Part 5 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 3. The Period of Growth. Part 5. Pronunciation. Noah Webster, as we saw in the last chapter, sneered at the broad A in 1789 as an Anglomaniac affectation. In the course of the next 25 years, however, he seems to have suffered a radical change of mind, for in The American Spelling Book, published in 1817, he ordained it in ask, last, mass, ant, grant, glass, and their analogues, 
and in his 1829 revision he clung to this pronunciation, beside adding master, pastor, amass, quaff, laugh, craft, etc., and even massive. There is some difficulty, however, in determining just what sound he proposed to give the A, for there are several A sounds that pass as broad, and the two main ones differ considerably. One appears in all, and may be called the A-W sound. The other is in art, and may be called the ah sound. A quarter of a century later, Richard Grant White distinguished between the two and denounced the former as a British peculiarity. Frank H. Visitelli, writing in 1917, still noted the difference, particularly in such words as daunt, saunter, and laundry. It is probable that Webster, in most cases, intended to advocate the ah sound as in father, for this pronunciation now prevails in New England. Even there, however, the a often drops to a point midway between ah and a, ah, though never actually descending to the flat aa as in an, at, and anatomy. But the imprimatur of the Yankee Johnson was not potent enough to stay the course of nature, and, save in New England, the flat A swept the country. He himself allowed it in stamp and vase. His successor and rival, Lyman Cobb, decided for it in pass, draft, stamp, and dance, though he kept to the ah sound in laugh, path, daunt, and saunter. By 1850, the flat A was dominant everywhere west of the Berkshires and south of New Haven, and had even got into such proper names as Lafayette and Nevada. Footnote. Richard Mead Bach denounced it in Lafayette during the 60s. Vide his vulgarisms and other errors of speech, second edition, Philadelphia, 1869, page 65. End footnote. Webster failed in a number of his other attempts to influence American pronunciation. His advocacy of deaf for deaf had popular support while he lived, and he dredged up authority for it out of Chaucer and Sir William Temple. But the present pronunciation gradually prevailed, though deaf remains familiar in the common speech. Joseph E. Worcester and other rival lexicographers stood against many of his pronunciations, and he took the field against them in the prefaces to the successive editions of his spelling books. Thus, in that to the elementary spelling book, dated 1829, he denounced the affectation of inserting a Y sound before the U in such words as gradual and nature with its compensatory change of D into a French J, and of T into CH. The English lexicographer John Walker had argued for this affectation in 1791, but Webster's prestige, while he lived, remained so high in some quarters that he carried the day, and the older professors at Yale, it is said, continued to use nature down to 1839. He favored the pronunciation of either and neither as either and neither, and so did most of the English authorities of his time. The original pronunciation of the first syllable in England probably made it rhyme with bay, but the ee -E sound was firmly established by the end of the 18th century. Toward the middle of the following century, however, there arose a fashion of an A-I sound, and this affectation was borrowed by certain Americans. Gould, in the 50s, put the question, why do you say either and neither to various Americans? The reply he got was, the words are so pronounced by the best educated people in England. This imitation still prevails in the cities of the East. All of us, says Lounsbury, 
are privileged in these latter days frequently to witness painful struggles put forth to give to the first syllable of these words the sound of I by those who have been brought up to give it the sound of E. There is apparently an impression on the part of some that such a pronunciation establishes on a firm foundation an otherwise doubtful social standing. But the vast majority of Americans continue to say either and not either. White and Bizzatelli, like Lounsbury, argue that they are quite correct in doing so. The use of either, says White, is no more than a copy of a second-rate British affectation. End of Chapter 3, Part 5 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 4, Part 1 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 4, American and English Today. Part 1, The Two Vocabularies. By way of preliminary to an examination of the American of today, I offer a brief list of terms in common use that differ in American and English. Here are two hundred of them, all chosen from the simplest colloquial vocabularies, and without any attempt at plan or completeness. American Ashcan English Dustbin American Baby Carriage English Pram American Backyard English, garden. American, baggage. English, luggage. American, baggage car. English, luggage van. American, ballast, railroad. English, metals. American, bathtub. English, bath. American, beat. English, Beet root. American bid, noun. English tender. American billboard. English hoarding. American border. English paying guest. American boardwalk, seaside. English promenade. American bond, finance. English, debenture. American, boot. English, blucher or wellington. American, brakeman. English, brakesman. American, bucket. English, pail. American, bumper. Car. English, buffer. American, bureau. English, chest of drawers. American, calendar, court. English, cause list. American, campaign, political. English, canvas. American, can, noun. English, tin. American, candy. English, sweets. American, cane. English stick. American canned goods. English tinned goods. American car, railroad. English carriage, van, or wagon. American checkers, game. English drafts. American chicken yard. English foul run. American chief clerk. English head clock. American city editor. English chief reporter. American city ordinance. English bylaw. American clipping newspaper. English cutting. American coal oil. English paraffin. American coal scuttle. English coal hod. American Commission Merchant English Factor American Conductor of a Train 
English guard. American corn. English maize or Indian corn. American corner of a street. English crossing. American corset. English stays. American counterfeiter. English coiner. American cowcatcher. English plow. American cracker. English biscuit. American cross tie. English sleeper. American delicatessen store. English Italian warehouse. American department store. English stores. American derby hat. English bowler. American dime novel. English shilling shocker. American druggist. English chemist. American drugstore. English chemist's shop. American drummer. English bagman. American dry goods store. English draper's shop. American editorial. English leader or leading article. American elevator. English lift. American elevator boy. English lift man. American excursionist. English tripper. American express company. English carrier. American filing cabinet. English nest of drawers. American fire department. English fire brigade. American fish dealer. English fishmonger. American floor walker. English shop walker. American fraternal order. English friendly society. American freight. English goods. American freight agent. English goods manager. American freight car. English goods wagon. American frog railway. English crossing plate. American garters, men's. English sock suspenders. American gasoline. English petrol. American grade railroad. English gradient. American grain. English corn. American grain broker. English corn factor. American grip. English hold all. American groceries. English stores. American hardware dealer. English ironmonger. American haystack. English haycock. American headliner. English top liner. American hod carrier. English hodman. American hog pen. English piggery. American hospital private. English nursing home. American huckster. English coster monger. American hunting. English shooting. American Indian. English Red Indian. American Indian Summer. English St. Martin's Summer. American Installment Business. English Credit Trade. American Installment Plan. English Higher Purchase Plan. American Janitor. English Caretaker. American Legal Holiday. English Bank Holiday. American Letter Box. English Pillar Box. American Letter Carrier. English Postman. American Livery Stable. English Muse. Footnote. It should be noted that Muse is used only in the larger cities. In the small towns, Livery Stable is commoner. Muse is quite unknown in America, save as an occasional archaism. End footnote.
American, locomotive engineer. English, engine driver. American, lumber. English, deals. American, mad. English, angry. American, Methodist. English, Wesleyan. American, molasses. English, treacle. American, monkey wrench. English, spanner. American, moving picture theater. English, cinema. American, napkin, dinner. English, serviette. American, necktie. English, tie or cravat. American, news dealer. English, news agent. American, newspaper man. English, pressman or journalist. American, oatmeal. English, porridge. American, office holder. English, public servant. American, orchestra, seats in a theater. English, stalls. American, overcoat. English, greatcoat. American, package. English, parcel. American, parlor. English, drawing room. American, parlor car. English, saloon carriage. American, patrolman, police. English, constable. American, payday. English, wage day. American, peanut. English, monkey nut. American, pie, fruit. English, tart. American, pitcher. English, jug. American, poorhouse. English, workhouse. American, postpaid. English, post free. American, pot pie. English, pie. American, prepaid. English, carriage paid. American, press, printing. English, machine. American, program of a meeting. English, agenda. American, proofreader. English, corrector of the press. American, public school. English, board school. American, quotation marks. English, inverted commas. American, railroad. English, railway. American, railroad man. English, railway servant. American, rails. English, line. American, rare, of meat. English, underdone. American, receipts, in business. English, takings. American, Rhine wine. English, hawk. American, roadbed, railroad. English, permanent way. American, road repairer. English, road mender. American, roast. English, joint. American, roll call. English, division. American, rooster. English, cock. American, round trip ticket. English, return ticket. American, rutabaga. English, mangle wurzel. American, saleswoman. English, shop assistant. American, saloon. English, public house. American, scarf pin. English, tie pin. American, scow. English, lighter. American, sewer. English, drain. American, shirtwaist. English, blouse. American, shoe. English, boot. American, shoemaker. English, bootmaker. American, shoestring. English, bootlace. American, shoe tree. English, boot form. American, sick. English, ill. American, sidewalk. English, pavement. American, silver, collectively. English, 
plate. American sled. English sledge. American sleigh. English sledge. American soft drinks. English minerals. American spigot. English tap. American squash. English vegetable marrow. American stem winder. English keyless watch. American stockholder. English shareholder. American stocks. English shares. American store fixtures. English shop fittings. American street cleaner. English crossing sweeper. American street railway. English tramway. American subway. English tube or underground. American suspenders, men's. English braces. American sweater. English jersey. American switch, noun, railway. English points. American switch, verb, railway. English shunt. American taxes, municipal. English rates. American taxpayer, local. English ratepayer. American tenderloin of beef. English undercut. American ten pins. English nine pins. American thumbtack. English drawing pin. American ticket office. English booking office. American tenor. English tinker. American tin roof. English leads. American track. Railroad. English line. American trained nurse. English hospital nurse. American transom of door. English fanlight. American trolley car. English tram car. American truck vehicle. English lorry. American truck of a railroad car. English bogey. American trunk. English box. American typewriter operator. English typist. American typhoid fever. English enteric. American undershirt. English vest. American vaudeville theater. English music hall. American vegetables. English greens. American vest. English waistcoat. American warden of a prison. English governor. American warehouse. English stores. American wash rag. English face cloth. American washstand. English wash hand stand. American wash wringer. English mangle. American waste basket. English waste paper basket. American whipple tree. Footnote. Sometimes whiffle tree. End footnote. English splinter bar. American witness stand. English witness box. American wood alcohol. English methylated spirits. End of chapter 4, part 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 4, part 2 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 4, American and English Today, Part 2, Differences in Usage. The differences here listed most of them between words in everyday employment are but examples of a divergence in usage which extends to every department of daily life. 
in his business, in his journeys from his home to his office, in his dealings with his family and servants, and in his sports and amusements, in his politics, and even in his religion, the American uses not only words and phrases, but whole syntactical constructions that are unintelligible to the Englishman, or intelligible only after laborious consideration. A familiar anecdote offers an example in miniature. It concerns a young American woman living in a region of prolific orchards who is asked by a visiting Englishman what the residents do with so much fruit. Her reply is a pun, quote, we eat all we can and what we can't, we can, end quote. This answer would mystify nine Englishmen out of ten, for in the first place it involves the use of the flat American A in can, and in the second place it applies an unfamiliar name to the vessel that every Englishman knows as a tin, and then adds to the confusion by deriving a verb from the substantive. There are no such things as canned goods in England. Over there they are tinned. The can that holds them is a tin. To can them is to tin them, and they are counted not as groceries, but as stores, and advertised not on billboards, but on hoardings. And the cook who prepares them for the table is not Nora or Maggie, but cook. And if she does other work in addition, she is not a girl for general housework, but a cook general, and not help, but a servant. And the boarder who eats them is not a boarder at all, but a paying guest, though he is said to board. And the grave of the tin, once it is emptied, is not the trash can, but the dust bin. And the man who carries it away is not the garbage man, or the ash man, or the white wings, but the dust man. An Englishman entering his home does not walk in upon the first floor, but upon the ground floor, which he calls the first floor, or more commonly first story, not forgetting the penultimate E, is what we call the second floor, and so on up to the roof, which is covered not with tin, but with slate, tiles, or leads. He does not take a paper, he takes in a paper. He does not ask his servant, is there any mail for me, but are there any letters for me? For mail, in the American sense, is a word he seldom uses, save in such compounds as mail van and mail train. He always speaks of it as the post. The man who brings it is not a letter carrier, but a postman. It is posted, not mailed, at a pillar box, not a mailbox. It never includes postal cards, but only postcards, never money orders, but only postal orders. The Englishman dictates his answers not to a typewriter, but to a typist. A typewriter is merely the machine. If he desires the recipient to call him by telephone, he doesn't say phone me at quarter of eight, but ring me up at quarter to eight. And when the call comes in, he says, are you there? When he gets home, he doesn't find his wife waiting for him in the parlor or living room, but in the drawing room or in her sitting room, and the tale of domestic disaster that she has to tell does not concern the hired girl, but the slavey and the scullery maid. He doesn't bring her a box of candy, but a box of sweets. He doesn't leave a derby hat in the hall, but a bowler. His wife doesn't wear shirt waists, but blouses. When she buys one, she doesn't say charge it, but put it down. When she orders a tailor-made suit, she calls it a coat and skirt. When she wants a spool of thread, she asks for a reel of cotton. Such things are bought not in the department stores, but at the stores, which are substantially the same thing. In these stores, calico means a plain cotton cloth. In the United States, it means a printed cotton cloth. Things bought on the installment plan in England are said to be bought on the higher purchase plan or system. The installment business itself is the credit trade, goods ordered by post, not mail, on which the dealer pays the cost of transportation, are said to be sent not postpaid or prepaid, 
but post-free or carriage-free paid. An Englishman does not wear suspenders and neckties, but braces and cravats. Suspenders are his wife's garters. His own are sock suspenders. The family does not seek sustenance in a rare tenderloin and squash, but in underdone undercut and vegetable marrow. It does not eat beets, but beet greens. The wine on the table, if miraculously German, is not Rhine wine, but hock. The maid who laces the stays of the mistress of the house is not Maggie, but Robinson. The nursemaid is not Lizzie, but nurse. And so, by the way, is a trained nurse in a hospital, whose full style is not Miss Jones, but Nurse Jones. And the hospital itself, if private, is not a hospital at all, but a nursing home. And its trained nurses are plain nurses, or hospital nurses, or maybe nursing sisters. And the white-clad young gentlemen who make love to them are not studying medicine, but walking the hospitals. Similarly, an English law student does not study law, but the law. If an English boy goes to a public school, it is not a sign that he is getting his education free, but that his father is paying a good round sum for it and is accepted as a gentleman. A public school over there corresponds to our prep school. It is a place maintained chiefly by endowments, wherein boys of the upper classes are prepared for the universities. What we know as a public school is called a board school in England, not because the pupils are boarded, but because it is managed by a school board. English schoolboys are divided not into classes or grades, but into forms, which are numbered, the lowest being the first form. The benches they sit on are also called forms. The principal of an English school is a headmaster or headmistress. The lower pedagogues used to be ushers, but they are now assistant masters or mistresses. The head of a university is a chancellor. He is always some eminent public man, and a vice-chancellor performs his duties. The head of a mere college may be a president, principal, rector, dean, or provost. At the universities, the students are not divided into freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, as with us, but are simply first-year men, second-year men, and so on. Such distinctions, however, are not as important in England as in America. Members of the university, they are called members, not students, do not flock together according to seniority. An English university man does not study, he reads. He knows nothing of frats, class days, senior proms, and such things. Save at Cambridge and Dublin, he does not even have a commencement. On the other hand, his daily speech is full of terms unintelligible to an American student. For example, Wrangler, Tripos, Head, Pass Degree, and Don. The upkeep of board schools in England comes out of the rates, which are the local taxes levied upon householders. For that reason, an English municipal taxpayer is called a rate payer. The functionaries who collect and spend his money are not office holders, but public servants. The head of the local police is not a chief of police, but a chief constable. The fire department is the fire brigade. The street cleaner is a crossing sweeper. The parish poorhouse is a workhouse. If it is maintained by two or more parishes jointly, it becomes a union. A pauper who accepts his hospitality is said to be on the rates. A policeman is a bobby, familiarly and constable officially. He is commonly mentioned in the newspapers, not by his surname, but as PC643A, that is Police Constable number 643A. The fire laddie, the ward executive, the roundsman, the strong arm squad, and other such objects of American devotion are unknown in England. An England saloon keeper is officially a licensed victualler. His saloon is a public house, or colloquially a pub. He does not sell beer by the bucket, or can, or growler, or schooner, but by the pint. He and his brethren taken together are the licensed trade. 
His back room is a parlor. If he has a few upholstered benches in his place, he usually calls it a lounge. He employs no bartenders or mixologists. Barmaids do the work, maybe with a barman to help. The American language, as we have seen, has begun to take in the English boot and shop, and is showing hospitality to headmaster, haberdasher, and weekend. But subaltern, civil servant, porridge, moor, draper, treacle, tram, and mufti are still strangers in the United States. As bleachers, picayune, airline, campus, chore, scoot, stogie, and hoodoo are in England. A subaltern is a commissioned officer in the army, under the rank of captain. A civil servant is a public servant in the National Civil Service. If he is of high rank, he is usually called a permanent official. Porridge, moor, scullery, draper, treacle, and tram, though unfamiliar, still need no explanation. Mufti means ordinary male clothing. An army officer out of uniform is said to be in mufti. To this officer, a sack suit or business suit is a lounge suit. He carries his clothes not in a trunk or grip or suitcase, but in a box. He does not miss a train. He loses it. He does not ask for a round-trip ticket, but for a return ticket. If he proposes to go to the theater, he does not reserve or engage seats. He books them and not at the box office, but at the booking office. If he sits downstairs, it is not in the orchestra, but in the stalls. If he likes vaudeville, he goes to a music hall, where the headliners are the top liners. If he has to stand in line, he does it not in a line, but in a queue. In England, a corporation is a public company or limited liability company. The term corporation over there is applied to the mayor, aldermen, and sheriffs of a city, as in the London Corporation. An Englishman writes LTD, period, after the name of an incorporated bank or trading company, as we write INC. He calls its president its chairman or managing director. Its stockholders are its shareholders and hold shares instead of stock in it. Its bonds are debentures. The place wherein such companies are floated and looted, the Wall Street of England, is called the City, with a capital C. Bankers, stock jobbers, promoters, directors, and other such leaders of its business are called the City Men. The financial editor of a newspaper is its City Editor. Government bonds are consoles or stocks or the funds. To have money in the stocks is to own such bonds. Promissory notes are bills. An Englishman hasn't a bank account, but a banking account. He draws checks, C-H-E-Q-U-E-S, not checks not on his bank, but on his bankers. In England, there's a rigid distinction between a broker and a stockbroker. A broker means not a dealer in securities, as in our Wall Street broker, but a dealer in second-hand furniture. To have the brokers in the house means to be bankrupt, with one's very household goods in the hands of one's creditors. Tariff reform in England does not mean a movement toward free trade, but one toward protection. The word government, meaning what we call the administration, is always capitalized and plural, that is, the government are considering the advisability, etc. Vestry, committee, council, ministry, and even company are also plural, though sometimes not capitalized. A member of parliament does not run for office, he stands. He does not make a campaign, but a canvas. He does not represent a district, but a division or constituency. He never makes a stumping trip, but always a speaking tour. When he looks after his fences, he calls it nursing the constituency. At a political meeting, they are often rough in England, the bouncers are called stewards. 
suffragettes used to delight in stabbing them with hairpins. A member of Parliament is not afflicted by the numerous bugaboos that menace an American congressman. He knows nothing of lame ducks, pork barrels, gag rules, junkets, gerrymanders, omnibus bills, snakes, niggers in the woodpile, salt river, crow, bosses, ward healers, men higher up, silk stockings, repeaters, ballot box stuffers, and straight and split tickets. He always calls them ballots or voting papers. He has never heard of direct primaries, recall, or the initiative and referendum. A roll call in Parliament is a division. A member speaking is said to be up on his legs. When the House adjourns, it is said to rise. A member referring to another in the course of debate does not say the gentleman from Manchester, but the honorable gentleman, written H-O-N period gentleman. Or if he happens to be a privy councillor, the right honorable gentleman. Or if he is a member for one of the universities, the honorable and learned gentleman. If the speaker chooses to be intimate or facetious, he may say my honorable friend. In the United States, a pressman is a man who runs a printing press. In England, he is a newspaper reporter, or as the English usually say, a journalist. This journalist works not at space rates, but at lineage rates. A printing press is a machine. An editorial in a newspaper is a leading article or leader. An editorial photograph is a leaderette. A newspaper clipping is a cutting. A proofreader is a corrector of the press. A pass to the theater is an order. The room clerk of a hotel is the secretary. A real estate agent or dealer is an estate agent. The English keep up most of the odd distinctions between physicians and surgeons, barristers, and solicitors. A surgeon is often plain mister and not doctor. Neither he nor a doctor has an office, but always a surgery or consulting room. A barrister is greatly superior to a solicitor. He alone can address the higher courts and the parliamentary committees. A solicitor must keep to office work and the courts of the first instance. A man with a grievance goes first to his solicitor, who then instructs or briefs a barrister for him. If that barrister in the course of the trial wants certain evidence removed from the record, he moves that it be struck out, not stricken out, as an American lawyer would say. Only barristers may become judges. An English barrister, like his American brother, takes a retainer when he's engaged. But the rest of his fee does not wait upon the termination of the case. He expects and receives a refresher from time to time. A barrister is never admitted to the bar, but is always called. If he becomes a king's counsel, or K.C., a purely honorary appointment, he is said to have taken silk. The common objects and phenomena of nature are often differently named in English and American. As we saw in a previous chapter, such Americanisms as creek and run for small streams are practically unknown in England, and the English moor and downs early disappeared from American. The Englishman knows the meaning of sound, that is, Long Island sound, but he nearly always uses channel in place of it. In the same way, the American knows the meaning of the English bog, but rejects the English distinction between it and swamp, and almost never uses swamp or marsh, often elided to mosh. The Englishman seldom, if ever, describes a severe storm as a hurricane, a cyclone, a tornado, or a blizzard. He never uses cold snap, cloud burst, or under the weather. He does not say that the temperature is 29 degrees Fahrenheit, or that the thermometer or the mercury is at 29 degrees, but there are three degrees of frost. He calls ice water iced water. He knows nothing of bluegrass country or of penny y'all, what we call the mining regions he knows as the black country. He never, of course, uses down east or upstate. Many of our names for common fauna and flora are unknown to him, 
save as strange Americanisms, that is, terrapin, moose, persimmon, gumbo, eggplant, alfalfa, sweet corn, sweet potato, and yam. Until lately, he called the grapefruit a shaddock. He still calls the beet a beetroot and the rutabaga a mangle wurzel. He is familiar with many fish that we seldom see, that is, the turbo. He also knows the hare, which is seldom heard of in American, but he knows nothing of deviled crabs, crab cocktails, clam chowder, or oyster stew, and he never goes to oyster suppers, clam bakes, or bur burgaloo picnics. He doesn't buy peanuts when he goes to the circus. He calls them monkey nuts, and to eat them publicly is infra dig. The common American use of peanut as an adjective of disparagement, as in peanut politics, is incomprehensible to him. In England, a hack is not a public coach, but a horse let out at hire, or one of similar quality. A life insurance policy is usually not an insurance policy at all, but an assurance policy. What we call the normal income tax is the ordinary tax, and what we call the surtax is the super tax. An Englishman never lives on a street, but always in it. He never lives in a block of houses, but in a row. It is never in a section of the city, but always in a district. Going home by train, he always takes the down train, no matter whether he is proceeding southward to Wimbledon, westward to Shepherd's Bush, northward to Tottenham, or eastward to Noakes Hill. A train headed toward London is always an up train, and the track it runs on is the up line. Eastbound and westbound tracks and trains are unknown in England. When an Englishman boards a bus, it is not at a street corner, but at a crossing, though he is familiar with such forms as Hyde Park Corner. The place he is bound for is not three squares or blocks away, but three turnings. Square in England always means a small park. A backyard is a garden. A subway is always a tube or the underground, as in the metro. But an underground passage for pedestrians is a subway. English streets have no sidewalks. They always call them pavements or footways. An automobile is always a motor car or motor. Auto is almost unknown, and with it the verb to auto. So is machine. So is joyride. An Englishman always calls russet yellow or tan shoes, brown shoes, or if they cover the ankle, boots. He calls a pocketbook a purse and gives the name of pocketbook to what we call a memorandum book. His walking stick is always a stick, never a cane. By cord, he means something strong, almost what we call twine. A thin cord he always calls a string. His twine is the lightest sort of string. When he applies the adjective homely to a woman, he means that she is simple and home-loving, not necessarily that she is plain. He uses dessert not to indicate the whole last course at dinner, but to designate the fruit only. The rest is ices or sweets. He uses vest, not in place of waistcoat, but in place of undershirt. Similarly, he applies pants, not to his trousers, but to his drawers. An Englishman who inhabits bachelor quarters is said to live in chambers. If he has a flat, he calls it a flat, not an apartment. Flat houses are often mansions. The janitor or superintendent thereof is a caretaker. The scoundrels who snoop around in search of divorce evidence are not private detectives, but private inquiry agents. The Englishman is naturally unfamiliar with baseball and in consequence his language is bare of the countless phrases and metaphors that it has applied to American. Many of these phrases and metaphors are in daily use among us. For example, fan, rooter, bleachers, batting average, doubleheader, pennant winner, gate money, busher, minor leaguer, glass arm, to strike out, to foul, to be shut out, to coach, to play ball, on the bench, on to his curves, and three strikes and out. The national game of draw poker has also greatly enriched American with terms 
that are either quite unknown to the Englishman or known to him only as somewhat dubious Americanisms. Among them, Cold Deck, Kitty, Full House, Divvy, A Card Up His Sleeve, Three of a Kind, To Ante Up, To Pony Up, To Hold Out, To Cash In, To Go It One Better, To Chip In, and For Keeps. But the Englishman uses many more racing terms and metaphors than we do, and he has got a good many phrases from other games, particularly cricket. The word cricket itself has a definite figurative meaning. It indicates in general good sportsmanship. To take unfair advantage of an opponent is not cricket. The sport of boating, so popular on the Thames, has also given colloquial English some familiar terms, almost unknown in the United States. That is punt and weir. Contrarywise, pungy, bateau, and scow are unheard of in England, and canoe is not long emerged from the estate of an Americanism. The game known as Ten Pins in America is called Nine Pins in England, and once had that name over here. The Puritans forbade it, and its devotees changed its name in order to evade the prohibition. Finally, there is soccer, a form of football quite unknown in the United States. What we call simply football is rugby or rugger to the Englishman. The word soccer is derived from association. The rules of the game were established by the London Football Association. Soccer is one of the relatively few English experiments in ellipsis. Another is to be found in Baker Lou, the name of one of the London underground lines from Baker Street and Waterloo, its termini. The English have an ecclesiastical vocabulary with which we are almost unacquainted, and it is in daily use. The church bulks large in public affairs over there. Such terms as vicar, canon, verger, prebendary, primate, curate, nonconformist, dissenter, convocation, minister, chapter, crypt, living, presentation, glebe, benefice, locum tenens, suffragan, almoner, dean, and pluralist are to be met in the English newspapers constantly, but on this side of the water they are seldom encountered. Nor do we hear much of matins, louds, lay readers, ritualism, and the liturgy. The English use of holy orders is also strange to us. They do not say that a young man is studying for the ministry, but that he is reading for holy orders. They do not say that he is ordained, but that he takes orders. Save he be in the United Free Church of Scotland, he is never a minister. Save he be nonconformist, he is never a pastor. A clergyman of the establishment is always either a rector, a vicar, or a curate, and colloquially a parson. In American, chapel simply means a small church, usually the branch of some larger one. In English, it has a special sense of place of worship, unconnected with the establishment. Though three-fourths of the people of Ireland are Catholics, in Munster and Connaught, more than nine-tenths, and the Protestant Church of Ireland has been disestablished since 1871, a Catholic place of worship in the country is still a chapel, not a church. So is a Methodist whaling place in England, however large it may be, though now and then a tabernacle is substituted. In the same way, the English Catholics sometimes vary chapel with oratory, as in Brompton Oratory. A Methodist in Great Britain is not a Methodist, but a Wesleyan. Contrarywise, what the English call simply a churchman is an Episcopalian in the United States. What they call the church always capitalized, is the Protestant Episcopal Church. What they call a Roman Catholic is simply a Catholic, and what they call a Jew is usually softened, if he happens to be an advertiser, to a Hebrew. The English Jews have no such idiotic fear of the plain name as that which afflicts the more pushing and obnoxious of the race in America. News of Jewry is a common headline in the London Daily Telegraph, which is owned by Lord Burnham, a Jew, 
and has had many Jews on its staff, including Judah P. Benjamin, the American. The American language, of course, knows nothing of dissenters, nor of such gladiators of dissent as the Plymouth Brethren, nor of the nonconformist conscience, though the United States suffers from it even more damnably than England. The English, to make it even, get on without circuit riders, holy rollers, drunkards, Seventh-day Adventists, and other such American ferret nature, and are born, live, die, and go to heaven without the aid of either the uplift or the Chautauqua. In music, the English cling to an archaic and unintelligible nomenclature long since abandoned in America. Thus they call a double whole note a brave, a whole note a semi-brave, and a half note a minim, a quarter note a crotchet, an eighth note a quaver, a sixteenth note a semi-quaver, a thirty-second note a demi-semi-quaver, and a sixty-fourth note hemi demi semi quaver or semi demi sem quaver if by any chance an english musician should write a one hundred twenty eighth note he probably wouldn't know what to call it this clumsy terminology goes back to the days of plain chant with its longa brevis semi brevis minima and semi minima the french and italians cling to a system almost as confusing but the Germans use Gans, Halbe, Vertel, Achtel, etc. I have been unable to discover the beginnings of the American system, but it would seem to be borrowed from the German, since the earliest times the majority of music teachers in the United States have been Germans, and most of the rest have had German training. In the same way, the English hold fast to a clumsy and inaccurate method of designating the sizes of printers' types. In America, the simple point system makes the business easy. A line of 14-point type occupies exactly the vertical space of two lines of 7-point. But the British still indicate differences in size by such arbitrary and confusing names as brilliant, diamond, small pearl, pearl, ruby, ruby non pareil, non pareil, Minion non perel, emerald, minion, brevier, bourgeois, long premer, small pica, pica, English, the great premer, and double pica. They also cling to a fossil system of numerals in stating ages. Thus an Englishman will say that he is seven and forty, not that he is forty-seven. This is probably a direct survival preserved by more than a thousand years of English conservatism of the Anglo-Saxon Saofan and Feotwig. He will also say that he weighs 11 stone instead of 154 pounds. A stone is 14 pounds, and it is always used in stating the heft of a man. Finally, he employs some designations of time as fortnight and twelve month, a great deal more than we do and has certain special terms of which we know nothing. For example, quarter day, bank holiday, long vacation, lady day, and Michaelmas. Per contra, he knows nothing whatever of our Thanksgiving, arbor, labor, and decoration days, or of legal holidays, or of Yom Kippur. In English usage, to proceed the word directly, is always used to signify immediately. In American, a contingency gets into it, and it may mean no more than soon. In England, quite means completely, wholly, entirely, altogether, to the utmost extent, nothing short of, in the fullest sense, positively, absolutely. In America, it is conditional, and means only nearly, approximately, substantially, as in, he sings quite well. An Englishman does not say, I will pay you up for an injury, but I will pay you back. He doesn't look up a definition in the dictionary. He looks it out. He doesn't say, being ill, I am getting on well, but I am going on well. He doesn't use the American different from or different than. He uses different to. He never adds the pronoun in such locutions as it hurts me, 
but says simply, it hurts. He never catches up with you on the street. He catches you up. He never says, are you through, but have you finished? He never uses to notify as a transitive verb. An official act may be notified, but not a person. He never uses gotten as the perfect participle of to get. He always uses plain got. An English servant never washes the dishes. She always washes the dinner or tea things. She doesn't live out, but goes into service. She smashes not the mirror, but the looking glass. Her beau is not her fellow, but her young man. She does not keep company with him, but walks out with him. That an Englishman always calls out, I say, and not simply say, when he desires to attract a friend's attention or register a protestation of incredulity, this perhaps is too familiar to need notice. His here, here, and oh, oh are also well known. He is much less prodigal with goodbye than the American. He uses good day and good afternoon far more often. A shop assistant would never say goodbye to a customer. To an Englishman, it would have a subtly offensive smack. Good afternoon would be more respectful. Another word that makes him flinch is dirt. He never uses it as we do to describe the soil in the garden. He always says earth. Various very common American phrases are quite unknown to him. For example, over his signature, on time and planted to corn. The first named he never uses and he has no equivalent for it. An Englishman who issues a signed statement simply makes it in writing. He knows nothing of our common terms of disparagement, such as kike, wop, yap, and rube. His pet name for a tiller of the soil is not rube or sigh, but hodge. When he goes gunning, he does not call it hunting, but shooting. Hunting is reserved for the chase of the fox. An intelligent Englishwoman coming to America to live told me that the two things which most impeded her first communications with untraveled Americans, even above the gross differences between England and American pronunciation and intonation, were the complete absence of the general utility adjective jolly from the American vocabulary and the puzzling omnipresence and versatility of the American verb to fix. In English colloquial usage, jolly means almost anything. It intensifies all other adjectives, even including miserable and homesick. An Englishman is jolly tired, jolly hungry, or jolly well tired. His wife is jolly sensible. His dog is jolly keen. The prices he pays for things are jolly dear never stiff or high, all Americanism. But he has no noun to match the American proposition meaning proposal, business affair, case, consideration, plan, theory, solution, and what not. Only the German zug can be ranged beside it. And he has no verb in such wide practice as to fix. In his speech, it means only to make fast or to determine. In American, it may mean to repair, as in the plumber fixed the pipe, to dress, as in Mary fixed her hair, to prepare, as in the cook is fixing the gravy, to bribe, as in the judge was fixed, to settle, as in the quarrel was fixed up, to heal, as in the doctor fixed his boil, to finish, as in Murphy fixed Sweeney in the third round, to be well-to-do, as in John is well-fixed, to arrange as in I fixed up the quarrel, to be drunk as in the whiskey fixed him, to punish as in I'll fix him, and to correct as in he fixed my bad Latin. Moreover, it is used in all its English senses. An Englishman never goes to a dentist to have his teeth fixed. He does not fix the fire. He makes it up or mends it. He is never well fixed, either in money or by liquor. The English use quite a great deal more than we do, and as we have seen in a different sense. Quite rich in American means tolerably rich, richer than most. Quite so in English is identical in meaning with exactly so. In American, just is almost equivalent to the English quite, as in just lovely. Thornton shows that this use of just 
goes back to 1794. The word is also used in place of exactly, in other ways as just in time, just how many, and just what do you mean. End of chapter 4, part 2. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 4, part 3 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 4, American and English Today. Part 3. Honorifics. Among the honorifics and euphemisms in everyday use, one finds many notable divergences between the two languages. On one hand, the English are almost as diligent as the Germans in bestowing titles of honor upon their men of mark, and on the other hand, they are very careful to withhold such titles from men who do not legally bear them. In America, every practitioner of any branch of healing art, even a chiropodist or an osteopath, is a doctor, ipso facto. But in England, as we have seen, many good surgeons lack the title, and it is not common in the lesser ranks. Even graduate physicians may not have it, but here there is a yielding of the usual meticulous exactness, and it is customary to address a physician in the second person as doctor, although his card may show that he is only medicine baccalaureus, a degree quite unknown in America. Thus, an Englishman, when he is ill, always sends for the doctor as we do. But a surgeon is usually plain mister, an English veterinarian, or dentist, or druggist, or masseur, is never doctor, nor professor. In all, save a few large cities of America, every male pedagogue is a professor, and so is every band leader, dancing master, and medical consultant. But in England the title is very rigidly restricted to men who hold chairs in the university, a necessarily small body. Even here, a superior title always takes precedence. Thus, it used to be Professor Almuth Wright, but now it is always Sir Almuth Wright. Huxley was always called Professor Huxley until he was appointed to the Privy Council. This appointment gave him the right to have Right Honorable put before his name, and thereafter it was customary to call him simply Mr. Huxley, with the Right Honorable, so to speak, floating in the air. The combination to an Englishman was more flattering than professor, for the English always esteem political dignities far more than the dignities of learning. This explains, perhaps, why their universities distribute so few honorary degrees. In the United States, every respectable Protestant clergyman is a D.D., and it is almost impossible for a man to get into the papers without becoming an L.L.D., but in England such honors are granted only grudgingly. So with military titles, to promote a war veteran from sergeant to colonel by acclamation, as is often done in the United States, is unknown over there. The English have nothing equivalent to the gaudy tin soldiers of our governor's staffs, nor to the bespangled colonels and generals of the Knights Templar and Patriarchs Militant, nor to the nondescript captains and majors of our country towns. An English railroad conductor, railway guard, is never captain as he always is in the United States, nor are military titles used by the police, nor is it the custom to make every newspaper editor a colonel, as is done south of the Potomac, nor is an attorney general or postmaster general called general, nor are the glories of public office, after they have officially come to an end, embalmed in such clumsy quasi-titles as ex-United States Senator, ex-Judge of the Circuit Court of Appeals, ex-Federal Trade Commissioner, and former Chief of the Fire Department. But perhaps the greatest difference between English and American usage is presented by the Honorable. In the United States, the title is applied loosely to all public officials of apparent respectability, from senators and ambassadors to the mayors of fifth-rate cities and the members of state legislatures and with some show of official sanction to many of them, especially congressmen. But it is questionable whether this application has any actual legal standing, 
save perhaps in the case of certain judges. Even the President of the United States, by law, is not the Honorable, but simply the President. In the first Congress, the matter of his title was exhaustively debated. Some members wanted to call him the Honorable, and others proposed His Excellency and even His Highness. But the two houses finally decided it was not proper to annex any style or title other than that expressed by the Constitution. Congressmen themselves are not honorables. True enough, the Congressional record in printing a set speech calls it Speech of Honorable John Jones, without the the before the honorable, a characteristic Americanism. But in reporting the ordinary remarks of a member, it always calls him plain Mr. Nevertheless, a country congressman would be offended if his partisans, in announcing his appearance on the stump, did not prefix honorable to his name. So would a state senator. So would a mayor or governor. I have seen the sergeant-at-arms of the United States Senate, referred to as honorable, in the records of that body. Moreover, the prefix is actually usurped by the superintendent of state prisons of New York. In England, the thing is more carefully ordered, and all bogus honorables are unknown. The prefix is applied to both sexes and belongs by law inter alia to all present or past maids of honor, to all justices of the high court during their terms of office, to the Scotch lords of session, to the sons and daughters of viscounts and barons, to the younger sons and daughters of all earls, and to the members of the legislative and executive councils of the colony, but not to members of parliament, though each is in debate an honorable gentleman. Even a member of the cabinet is not an honorable, though he is a right honorable by virtue of membership in the Privy Council, of which the cabinet is legally merely a committee. The last honorific belongs not only to Privy Councillors, but also to all peers lower than Marquesas. Those above are most honorable. To Lord Mayors during their terms of office, to the Lord Advocate, and to the Lord Provosts of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Moreover, a peeress, whose husband is a right honorable, is a right honorable herself. The British colonies follow the jealous usage of the mother country. Even in Canada, the lawless American example is not imitated. I have before me a, quote, table of titles to be used in Canada, close quote, laid down by royal warrant, which lists those who are honorables and those who are not honorables in the utmost detail. Only Privy Councillors of Canada, not to be confused with Imperial Privy Councillors, are permitted to retain the prefix after going out of office. Though ancients who were legislative councillors at the time of the Union, July 1, 1867, may still use it by sort of a courtesy, and former speakers of the Dominion Senate and House of Commons and various retired judges may do so on application to the king, countersigned by the governor general. The following are lawfully the honorable, but only during their tenure of office. The solicitor general, the speaker of the House of Commons, the presidents and speakers of the provincial legislatures, members of the executive councils of the provinces, the chief justice, the judges of the Supreme and Exchequer Courts, the judges of the Supreme Courts of Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, British Columbia, Prince Edward Island, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, the judges of the Courts of Appeal of Manitoba and British Columbia, and the Chancery Court of Prince Edward Island, and the Circuit Court of Montreal, these and no more. A lieutenant governor of a province is not the honorable, but his honor. The Governor General is His Excellency, and so is his wife, but in practice they usually have superior honorifics and do not forget to demand their use. But though an Englishman, and following him a colonial, is thus very careful to restrict the honorable to proper uses, he always insists, when he serves without pay as an officer of any organization, to indicate his volunteer character by writing honorable before the name of his office. If he leaves it off, it is a sign that he is a hireling. Thus, the agent of the New Zealand government in London, a paid officer, is simply the agent. But the agents at Brisbane and Adelaide 
in Australia who serve for the glory of it are honorable agents. In writing to a Briton, one must be careful to put Esquire behind his name and not Mr. before it. The English make a clear distinction between the two forms. Mr. on an envelope indicates that the sender holds the receiver to be his inferior. One writes to Mr. John Jackson, one's greengrocer, but to James Thompson, Esquire, one's neighbor. Any man who is entitled to the Esquire is a gentleman, by which an Englishman means a man of sound connections and dignified occupation, in brief, of ponderable social position. Thus, a dentist, a shopkeeper, or a clerk can never be a gentleman in England, even by courtesy, and the qualifications of an author, a musical conductor, a physician, or even a member of parliament have to be established. But though he is thus enormously watchful of his masculine dignity, an Englishman is quite careless in the use of lady. He speaks glibly of lady clerks, lady typists, lady doctors, and lady inspectors. In America, there is a strong disposition to use the word less and less, as is revealed by the substitution of saleswoman and salesgirl for the saleslady of yesteryear. But in England, lady is still invariably used instead of woman in such compounds as lady golfer, lady secretary, and lady champion. The women's singles in English tennis are always ladies' singles. Women's wear in English shops is always ladies' wear. Perhaps the cause of this distinction between lady and gentleman has been explained by Price Collier in, quote, England and the English, close quote. In England, according to Collier, the male is always first. His comfort goes before his wife's comfort and maybe his dignity also. Gentleman clerk or gentleman author would make an Englishman howl, though he uses gentleman writer. So would the growing American custom of designating successive heirs of a private family by the numerals proper to royalty. John Smith III and William Simpson IV are gravely received at Harvard. At Oxford, they would be ragged unmercifully. An Englishman in speaking or writing of public officials avoids those long and clumsy combination of title and name, which figure so copiously in American newspapers. Such locutions as Assistant Secretary of the Interior Jones, Fourth Assistant Postmaster General Brown, Inspector of Boilers Smith, Judge of the Appeal Tax Court Robinson, Chief Clerk of the Treasury Williams, and collaborating epidermiologist White are quite unknown to him. When he mentions a high official, such as the Secretary for Foreign Affairs, he does not think it necessary to add the man's name. He says simply, the Secretary for Foreign Affairs, or the Foreign Secretary. And so with the Lord Chancellor, the Chief Justice, the Prime Minister, the Bishop of Carlisle, the Chief Rabbi, the First Lord of the Admiralty, the Master of Pembroke College, the Italian Ambassador, and so on. Certain ecclesiastical titles are sometimes coupled to surnames in the American manner, such as Dean Stanley and Canon Wilberforce. But Prime Minister Lord George would seem heavy and absurd. But in other directions, the Englishman has a certain clumsiness of his own. Thus, in writing a letter to a relative stranger, he sometimes begins it not, My dear Mr. Jones, but My dear John Joseph Jones. He may even use such a form as my dear secretary for war in place of the American my dear Mr. Secretary. In English usage, incidentally, my dear is more formal than simply dear. In America, of course, this distinction is lost, and such forms as my dear John Joseph Jones appear only as conscious imitations of English usage. I have spoken of the American custom of dropping the definite article before honorable. It extends to reverend and the like, and has the authority of very respectable usage behind it. The opening sentence of the congressional record is always, The chaplain, Reverend blank, D.D., offered the following prayer. When chaplains for the Army or Navy are confirmed by the Senate, 
they always appear in the record as reverends, never as the reverend. I also find the honorific without the article in the New International Encyclopedia and in a widely popular American grammar book. So long ago as 1867, Gould protested against this elison as barbarous and idiotic and drew up the following reducto ad absurdum. At the last annual meeting of the Black Book Society, Honorable John Smith took the chair, assisted by Reverend John Brown and Venerable John White. The office of secretary would have been filled by late John Green, but for his decease which rendered him ineligible. His place was supplied by inevitable John Black. In the course of the evening eulogies were pronounced on distinguished John Gray and notorious Joseph Brown. Marked compliment was also paid to able historian Joseph White, discriminating philosopher Joseph Green, and learned professor Joseph Black. But conspicuous speech of the evening was witty Joseph Gray's apostrophe to eminent astronomer Jacob Brown, subtle logician Jacob White, etc., etc. Richard Grant White, a year or two later, joined the attack in the New York Galaxy, and William Cullen Bryant included the omission of the article in his Index Expurgatorius. But these anathemas were ineffective as Gould's irony. The more careful American journals, of course, incline to the the, and I note that it is specifically ordained on the style sheet of Century Magazine, but the overwhelming majority of American newspapers get along without it, and I have often noticed its omission on the sign boards at church entrances. In England, it is never omitted. End of Chapter 4, Part 3 Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 4, Part 4 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Austin Lim, www.austinlim.com. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 4, American and English Today Part 4, Euphemisms and Forbidden Words Euphemisms and Forbidden Words But such euphemisms as Lady Clerk are, after all, much rarer in English than in American usage. The Englishman seldom tries to gloss menial occupations with sonorous names. On the contrary, he seems to delight in keeping their menial character plain. He says, servants, not help. Even his railways and banks have servants. The chief trades union of the English railroad men is the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants. He uses employé in place of clerk, workman, or laborer much less often than we do. True enough, he calls a boarder a paying guest but that is probably because even a boarder may be a gentleman. Just as he avoids calling a fast train the limited, the flyer, or the cannonball, so he never calls an undertaker a funeral director or mortician, or a dentist a dental surgeon or ontologist, or an optician an optometrist, or a barber shop, he always makes it a barber's shop, a tonsorial parlor, or a common public house, a cafe, a restaurant, an exchange, a buffet, or a hotel, or a tradesman, a storekeeper, or a merchant, or a freshwater college, a university. Footnote. In the 60s, an undertaker was often called an embalming surgeon in America. End footnote. A university in England always means a collection of colleges. Footnote. In a list of American universities, I find the Christian of Canton, Missouri, with 125 students, the Lincoln of Pennsylvania, with 184, the Southwestern Presbyterian of Clarksville, Tennessee, with 86, and the Newton Theological, with 77. Most of these, of course, are merely country high schools. End footnote. 
he avoids displacing terms of a disparaging or disagreeable significance with others less brutal, or thought to be less brutal. Example given, ready to wear, or ready tailored, for ready made, used or slightly used, for second hand, mahoganized, for imitation mahogany, aisle manager, for floor walker, he makes it a shop walker, loan office for pawn shop. Also, he is careful not to use such words as rector, deacon, and baccalaureate in merely rhetorical senses. Footnote. The Reverend John C. Stevenson in the New York Sun, July 10, 1914. That empty courtesy of addressing every clergyman as doctor. And let us abolish the abuse of baccalaureate sermons for sermons before graduating classes of high school and the like. End footnote. When we come to words that, either intrinsically or by usage, are improper, a great many curious differences between English and American reveal themselves. The Englishman, on the whole, is more plain-spoken than the American, and such terms as bitch, mare, and in full do not commonly daunt him, largely, perhaps, because of his greater familiarity with country life. But he has a formidable index of his own, and it includes such essentially harmless words as sick, stomach, bum, and bug. The English use of ill for sick I have already noticed, and the reasons for the English avoidance of bum. Sick over there means nauseated, and when an Englishman says that he was sick, he means that he vomited, or, as an American would say, was sick at the stomach. The older and still American usage, however, survives in various compounds. Sick list, for example, is official in the Navy, and sick leave is known in the Army, though it is more common to say of a soldier that he has invalided home. Sick room and sick bed are also in common use, and sick flag is used in place of the American quarantine flag. But an Englishman hesitates to mention his stomach in the presence of ladies, though he discourses freely about his liver. To avoid the necessity, he employs such euphemisms as Little Mary. As for bug, he restricts its use very rigidly to the cymax lectularius, or the common bed bug, and hence the word has a highly impolite connotation. All other crawling things he calls insects. An American of my acquaintance once greatly offended an English friend by using bug for insect. The two were playing billiards one summer evening in the Englishman's house, and various flying things came through the window and alighted on the cloth. The Englishman, essaying a shot, remarked that he had killed a bug with his cue. To the Englishman, this seemed a slanderous reflection upon the cleanliness of his house. Footnote. Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug is called The Golden Beetle in England. Twenty-five years ago, an Englishman named Buggy, laboring under the odium attached to the name, had it changed to Norfolk Howard, a compound made up of the title and family name of the Duke of Norfolk. The wits of London at once doubled his misery by adopting Norfolk Howard as a euphemism for bedbug. End footnote. The Victorian era saw a great growth of absurd euphemisms in England, including second wing for the leg of a fowl, but it was in America that the thing was carried farthest. Bartlett hints that rooster came into place of cock as a matter of delicacy, the latter word having acquired an indecent significance, and tells us that, at one time, even bull was banned as too vulgar for refined ears. In place of it, the early purists used cow creature, male cow, and even gentleman cow. Footnote. A recent example of the use of male cow was quoted in the Journal of the American Medical Association, November 17, 1917, advertising, page 24. End footnote. Bitch, ram, buck, and sow went the same way as there was a day when even mare was prohibited. Bachi tells us that Pissmeyer was also banned, Antmeyer being substituted for it. 
In 1847, the word chair was actually barred out, and seat was adopted in its place. Footnote, New York, Oregon, a family journal devoted to temperance, morality, education, and general literature. May 29, 1847. One of the editors of this delicate journal was T.S. Arthur, author of Ten Nights in a Bar Room. End footnote. These were the palmy days of euphemism. The delicate female was guarded from all knowledge, and even from all suspicion, of evil. To utter aloud in her presence the word shirt, says one historian, was an open insult. Mrs. Trollope, writing in 1832, tells of a young German gentleman of perfectly good manners, who offended one of the principal families by having pronounced the word corset before the ladies of it. The word woman, in those sensitive days, became a term of reproach, comparable to the German mensch. The uncouth female took its place. Footnote. Female, of course, was epidemic in England, too, but White says that it was not a Briticism, and so early as 1839, the legislature of Maryland expunged it from the title of a bill to protect the reputation of unmarried females, substituting women on the ground that female was an Americanism in that application. End footnote. In the same way the legs of the fair became limbs, and their breasts bosoms, and lady was substituted for wife. Stomach, under the ban in England, was transformed by some unfathomable magic into a euphemism denoting the whole region from the nipples to the pelvic arch. It was during this time that the newspapers invented such locutions as interesting or delicate condition, criminal operation, house of ill or questionable repute, disorderly house, sporting house, statutory offense, fallen woman, and criminal assault. Servant girls ceased to be seduced and began to be betrayed. Various French terms, enceinte and accouchement among them, were imported to conceal the fact that lawful wives occasionally became pregnant and had lyings in. White, between 1867 and 1870, launched various attacks upon these ludicrous gossamers of speech, and particularly upon enceinte, limb, and female, but only female succumbed. The passage of the notorious Comstock Postal Act in 1873 greatly stimulated the search for euphemisms. Once that act was upon the statute books, and Comstock himself was given the amazingly inquisitorial powers of a post office inspector, it became positively dangerous to print certain ancient and essentially decent English words. To this day, the effects of that old reign of terror are still visible. We yet use toilet and public comfort station in place of better terms, and such idiotic forms as red light district, disorderly house, blood poison, social evil, social disease, and white slave ostensibly conceal what every flapper is talking about. Footnote. The French pissoir, for instance, is still regarded as indecent in America, and is seldom used in England, but it has gone into most of the continental languages. It is curious to note, however, that these languages also have their pruderies. Most of them, for example, use WC, an abbreviation of the English water closet, as a euphemism. The whole subject of national pruderies, in both act and speech, remains to be investigated. End footnote. The word cadet, having a foreign smack and an innocent native meaning, is preferred to the more accurate procurer. Even prostitutes shrink from the forthright pimp and employ a characteristic American abbreviation PI, a curious brother to SOB and 2 o'clock. Nevertheless, a movement toward honesty is getting on its legs. The vice crusaders, if they have accomplished nothing else, have at least forced the newspapers to use the honest terms syphilis, prostitute, brothel, and venereal disease, albeit somewhat gingerly. It is, perhaps, significant of the change going on that the New York Evening Post recently authorized its reporters to use Streetwalker. Footnote. Even the Springfield Republican, 
the last stronghold of Puritan culture, printed the word on October 11, 1917, in a review of New Adventures by Michael Monaghan. End footnote. But in certain quarters, the change is viewed with alarm, and curious traces of the old prudery still survive. The Department of Health of New York City, in April 1914, announced that its efforts to diminish venereal disease were much handicapped because, in most newspaper offices, the words syphilis and gonorrhea are still tabooed, and without the use of these terms, it is almost impossible to correctly state the problem. The Army Medical Corps, in the early part of 1918, encountered the same difficulty. Most newspapers refused to print its bulletins regarding venereal disease in the Army. One of the newspaper trade journals thereupon sought the opinions of editors upon the subject, and all of them, save one, declared against the use of the two words. One editor put the blame upon the post office, which still cherishes the Comstock tradition. Another reported that, at a recent conference of the Scripps Northwest League editors, it was decided that the use of such terms as gonorrhea, syphilis, and even venereal diseases would not add to the tone of the papers, and that the term vice diseases can be readily substituted. The Scripps papers are otherwise anything but distinguished for their tone, but in this department they yield to the Puritan habit. An even more curious instance of prudery came to my notice in Philadelphia several years ago. A one-act play of mine, The Artist, was presented at the Little Theater there, and during its run, on February 26, 1916, the public ledger reprinted some of the dialogue. One of the characters in the piece is a virgin. At every occurrence, a change was made to a young girl. Apparently, even virgin is still regarded as too frank for Philadelphia. Footnote. Perhaps the Quaker influence is to blame. At all events, Philadelphia is the most Pecksniffian of American cities, and thus probably leads the world. Early in 1918, when a patriotic moving picture entitled To Hell with the Kaiser was sent on tour under government patronage, the word hell was carefully toned down on the Philadelphia billboards to H dash dash. End footnote. Fifty years ago, the very word decent was indecent in the South. No respectable woman was supposed to have any notion of the difference between decent and indecent. In their vocabularies of opprobrium and profanity, English and Americans diverge sharply. The English rotter and blighter are practically unknown in America, and there are various American equivalents that are never heard in England. A guy, in the American Vulgate, simply signifies a man. There is not necessarily any disparaging significance. But in English, high or low, it means one who is making a spectacle of himself. The derivative verb, to guy, is unknown in English. Its nearest equivalent is to spoof, which is unknown in American. The average American, I believe, has a larger vocabulary of profanity than the average Englishman, and swears a good deal more. But he attempts an amelioration of many of his oaths by softening them to forms with no apparent meaning. Darn, dern, dern, for damn, is apparently of English origin, but it is heard 10,000 times in America to once in England. So is doggone. Such euphemistic written forms as damn fool and damn fino are also far more common in this country. All fired for hell fired, gee whiz for Jesus, tarnal for eternal, tarnation for damnation, cuss for curse, gold darned for God damned, by gosh, for by God, and great Scott, for great God, are all Americanisms. Thornton had traced all fired to 1835, Tarnation to 1801, and Tarnal to 1790. By golly has been found in the English literature so early as 1843, but it probably originated in America. Down to the Civil War, it was the characteristic oath of the Negro slaves. Such terms as bonehead, pinhead, and boob have been invented, perhaps to take the place of the English ass, 
which has a flavor of impropriety in America on account of its identity and sound with the American pronunciation of arse. At an earlier day, ass was always differentiated by making it jackass. Another word that is improper in America, but not in England, is tart. To an Englishman, the word connotes sweetness, and so, if he be of the lower orders, he may apply it to his sweetheart. But, to the American, it signifies a prostitute, or, at all events, a woman of too ready an amiability. But the most curious disparity between the profane vocabulary of the two tongues is presented by bloody. This word is entirely without improper significance in America, but in England it is regarded as the vilest of indecencies. The sensation produced in London when George Bernard Shaw put it into the mouth of a woman character in his play, Pygmalion, will be remembered. The interest in the first English performance, said the New York Times, centered in the heroine's utterance of this banned word. It was waited for with trembling, heard shudderingly, and presumably, when the shock subsided, interest dwindled. But in New York, of course, it failed to cause any stir. Just why it is regarded as profane and indecent by the English is one of the mysteries of the language. The theory that it has some blasphemous reference to the blood of Christ is disputed by many etymologists. It came in during the latter half of the 17th century, and at the start it apparently meant no more than in the manner of a blood, i.e., a rich young roisterer of the time. Thus, bloody drunk was synonymous with as drunk as a lord. The adjective remained innocuous for 200 years. Then, it suddenly acquired its present abhorrent significance. It is regarded with such aversion by the English that even the lower orders often substitute bleeding as a euphemism. So far, no work devoted wholly to the improper terms of English and American has been published, but this lack may soon be remedied by a compilation made by a Chicago journalist. It is entitled The Slang of Venery and Its Analogues, and runs to two large volumes. A small edition, mimeographed for private circulation, was issued in 1916. I have examined this work and found it of great value. If the influence of Comstockery is sufficient to prevent its publication in the United States, as seems likely, it will be printed in Switzerland. End of chapter 4, part 4. Recording by Austin Lim, www austinlim.com Chapter 5, Part 1 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 5, Tendencies in American. Part 1, International Exchanges. More than once during the preceding chapters, we encountered Americanisms that had gone over into English, and English locutions that had begun to get a foothold in the United States. Such exchanges are made very frequently, and often very quickly, and though the guardians of English still attack every new Americanism vigorously, even when, as in the case of scientist, it is obviously sound and useful, they are often routed by public pressure, and have to submit in the end with the best grace possible. For example, consider caucus. It originated in Boston at some indeterminate time before 1750, and remained so peculiarly American for more than a century following, that most of the English visitors before the Civil War remarked its use. But, according to J. Redding Ware, it began to creep into English political slang about 1870, and in the 80s it was lifted to good usage by the late Joseph Chamberlain. Ware, writing in the first years of the present century, said that the word had become very important in England, but was not admitted into dictionaries. But in the concise Oxford Dictionary dated 1914, it is given as a sound English word, though its American origin is noted. The English, however, use it in a sense that has become archaic in America, 
thus preserving an abandoned american meaning in the same way that many abandoned british meanings have been preserved on this side in the united states the word means and has meant for years a meeting of some division large or small of a political or legislative body for the purpose of agreeing upon a united course of action in the mean assembly in england it means the managing committee of a party or fraction something corresponding to our national committee or state central committee or steering committee or to the half-forgotten congressional caucuses of the twenties it has a disparaging significance over there almost equal to that of our words organization and machine moreover it has given birth to two derivatives of like quality both unknown in america caucusdom meaning machine control and caucuser meaning a machine politician footnote the oxford dictionary following the late j h trumbull the well-known authority on indian languages derives the word from the algonquin kakaasu one who advises but most other authorities following pickering derive it from cockers the first caucuses it would appear were held in a cockers shop in boston and were called cockers meetings the rev william gordon in his history of the rise and independence of the united states including the late war published in london in seventeen eighty eight said that more than fifty years ago mr samuel adams father and twenty others one or two from the north end of the town boston where the ship business is carried on used to meet make a caucus and lay their plans for introducing certain persons into places of trust and power End of footnote. A good many other Americanisms have got into good usage in England, and new ones are being exported constantly. Farmer describes the process of their introduction and assimilation. American books, newspapers, and magazines, especially the last, circulate in England in large number, and some of their characteristic locutions pass into colloquial speech. Then they get into print and begin to take on respectability. The phrase, as the Americans say, he continues, might in some cases be ordered from the type foundry as a logotype, so frequently does it do introduction duty. Where shows another means of ingress? The argo of sailors. Many of the Americanisms he notes as having become naturalized in England, for example, boodle, boost and walk out are credited to liverpool as a sort of halfway station travel brings in still more england swarms with americans and englishmen themselves visiting america bring home new and racy phrases bishop cox says that dickens in his american notes gave english currency to reliable influential talented and lengthy Bristed, writing in 1855, said that talented was already firmly fixed in the English vocabulary by that time. All four words are in the concise Oxford Dictionary, and only lengthy is noted as originally an Americanism. Finally, there is the influence of the moving pictures. Hundreds of American films are shown in England every week and the american words and phrases appearing in their titles subtitles and other explanatory legends thus become familiar to the english the patron of the picture palace says w g faulkner in an article in the london daily mail learns to think of his railway station as a depot he has alternatives to one of our newest words hooligan in hoodlum and tough he watches a dive which is a thieves kitchen or a room in which bad characters meet and whether the villain talks of dough or sugar he knows it is money to which he is referring the musical ring of the word tramp gives way to the stodgy hobo or deadbeat it may be that the plot reveals an attempt to deceive some simple-minded person if it does the innocent one is spoken of as a sucker a come-on a boob or a lobster if he is stupid into the bargain 
Mr. Faulkner goes on to say that a great many other Americanisms are constantly employed by Englishmen who have not been affected by the avalanche which has come upon us through the picture palace. Thus today, he says, we hear people speak of the fall of the year, a stunt they have in hand, their desire to boost a particular business, a peach when they mean a pretty girl, a scab, a common term among strikers, the glad eye, junk when they mean worthless material, their efforts to make good, the elevator in the hotel or office, the boss or manager, the crook or swindler, and they will tell you that they have the goods, that is, they possess the requisite qualities for a given position. The venerable Frederick Harrison, writing in the Fortnightly Review in the spring of 1918, denounced this tendency with a vigor recalling the classical anathemas of Dean Alford and Sidney Smith. Stale American phrases, he said, are infecting even our higher journalism and our parliamentary and platform oratory. A statesman is now out for victory. He is up against pacifism. He has a card up his sleeve by which the enemy are at last to be euchred. Then a fierce fight in which hundreds of noble fellows are mangled or drowned is a scrap. To criticize a politician is to call for his scalp. The other fellow is beaten to a frazzle. And so on. Bolshevism, concluded Harrison sadly, is ruining language as well as society. But though there are still many such alarms by constables of the national speech, the majority of Englishmen continue to make borrowings from the tempting and ever-widening American vocabulary. What is more, some of these loan words take root and are presently accepted as sound English, even by the most watchful. The two fowlers in The King's English separate Americanisms from other current vulgarisms, but many of the latter on their list are actually American in origin, though they do not seem to know it. For example, to demean and to transpire. More remarkable still, the Cambridge History of English Literature lists backwoodsman, know-nothing, and yellowback as English compounds, apparently in forgetfulness of their American origin, and adds skunk, squaw, and toboggan as direct importations from the Indian tongues, without noting that they came through American and remained definite Americanisms for a long while. It even adds musquash, a popular name for the fiber zabethicus, borrowed from the Algonquin musquesu, but long since degenerated to muskrat in America. Musquash has been in disuse in this country, indeed, since the middle of the last century, save as a stray localism, but the English have preserved it, and it appears in the Oxford Dictionary. Footnote. In this connection it is curious to note that, though the raccoon is an animal quite unknown in England, there was until lately a destroyer called the raccoon in the British Navy. This ship was lost with all hands off the Irish coast, January 9, 1918. End of footnote. A few weeks in London, or a month's study of the London newspapers, will show a great many other American pollutions of the well of English. The argo of politics is full of them. Many beside caucus were introduced by Joseph Chamberlain, a politician skilled in American campaign methods and with an American wife to prompt him. He gave the English their first taste of to belittle, one of the inventions of Thomas Jefferson. Graft and to graft crossed the ocean in their nonage. To bluff has been well understood in England for thirty years. It is in Cassell's and the Oxford Dictionaries, and has been used by no less a Magnifico than Sir Almroth Wright. Footnote. To bluff has also gone into other languages, notably the Spanish. During the Cuban Revolution of March 1917, the newspapers of Havana, objecting to the dispatches sent out by American correspondents, denounced the latter as Las Bluffistas. 
meanwhile to bluff has been shouldered out in the country of its origin at least temporarily by a verb borrowed from the french to camouflage this first appeared in the spring of nineteen seventeen end of footnote to stump in the form of stump oratory is in carlyle's latter-day pamphlets circa eighteen fifty and caucus appears in his frederick the great though as we have seen on the authority of ware it did not come into general use in england until ten years later bunkum usually spelled b u n k u m is in all the later english dictionaries in the london stock market and among english railroad men various characteristic americanisms have got a foothold the meaning of bucket shop and to water for example is familiar to every london broker's clerk english trains are now telescoped and carry deadheads and in nineteen thirteen a rival to the amalgamated order of railway servants was organized under the name of the national union of railway men the beginnings of a movement against the use of servant are visible in other directions and the american help threatens to be substituted at all events help wanted advertisements are now occasionally encountered in english newspapers but it is american verbs that seem to find the way into english least difficult particularly those compounded with prepositions and adverbs such as to pan out and to swear off most of them true enough are still used as conscious americanisms but used they are and with increasing frequency the highly typical american verb to loaf is now naturalized and ware says that the loaferies is one of the common nicknames of the whitechapel workhouse it is curious reading the fulminations of american purists of the last generation to note how many of the americanisms they denounced have not only got into perfectly good usage at home but even broken down all guards across the ocean to placate and to antagonize are examples the oxford dictionary distinguishes between the english and american meanings of the latter in england a man may antagonize only another man in america he may antagonize a mere idea or thing but as the brothers fowler show even the english meaning is of american origin and no doubt a few more years we'll see the verb completely naturalized in britain to placate attacked vigorously by all native grammarians down to but excepting white now has the authority of the spectator and is accepted by cassell to donate is still under the ban but to transpire has been used by the london times other old bugaboos that have been embraced are gubernatorial presidential and standpoint white labored long and valiantly to convince americans that the adjective derived from president should be without the i in its last syllable following the example of incidental regimental monumental governmental oriental experimental and so on but in vain for presidential is now perfectly good english to demean is still questioned but english authors of the first rank have used it and it will probably lose its dubious character very soon the flow of loan words in the opposite direction meets with little impediment for social distinction in america is still largely dependent upon english recognition and so there is an eager imitation of the latest english fashions in speech this emulation is most noticeable in the large cities of the east and particularly in what Shield de vere called boston and the boston dependencies new york is but little behind the small stores there if they are of any pretensions are now almost invariably called shops shoes for the well-to-do are no longer shoes but boots and they are sold in boot shops one encounters too in the side streets off fifth avenue a multitude of gift shops tea shops and haberdashery shops in fifth avenue itself there are several luggage shops 
in august nineteen seventeen signs appeared in the new york surface cars in which the conductors were referred to as guards this effort to be english and correct was exhibited over the sign manual of theodore p chance president of the interborough a gentleman of teutonic name but evidently a faithful protector of the king's english on the same cars however painted notices surviving from some earlier regime mentioned the guards as conductors to let signs are now as common in all our cities as for rent signs we all know the charwoman and have begun to forget our native modification of char to wit chore every apartment house has a tradesman's entrance in charles street in baltimore some time ago the proprietor of a fashionable stationery store directed me not to the elevator but to the lift occasionally some uncompromising patriot raises his voice against these importations but he seldom shows the vigorous indignation of the english purists and he seldom prevails white in eighteen seventy warned americans against the figurative use of nasty as a synonym for disagreeable this use of the word was then relatively new in england though according to white the saturday review and the spectator had already succumbed his objections to it were unavailing nasty quickly got into american and has been there ever since in eighteen eighty three gilbert m tucker protested against good form traffic in the sense of travel to bargain and to tub as Briticisms that we might well do without but all of them took root and are perfectly sound american today there is indeed no intelligible reason why such english inventions and improvements should not be taken in even though the motive behind the welcome to them may occasionally cause a smile english after all is the mother of american and the child until lately was still at nurse the english confronted by some of our fantastic innovations may well regard them as impudences to be put down but what they offer in return often fits into our vocabulary without offering it any outrage american indeed is full of lingering briticisms all maintaining a successful competition with native forms if we take back shop it is merely taking back something that store has never been able to rid us of we use shop worn shop lifter shopping shopper shop girl and to shop every day in the same way the word penny has survived among us despite the fact that there has been no american coin of that name for more than a hundred and twenty-five years we have nickel in the slot machines but when they take a cent we call them penny in the slot machines we have penny arcades and penny whistles we do not play cent ante but penny ante we still turn an honest penny and say a penny for your thoughts the pound and the shilling became extinct a century ago but the penny still binds us to the mother tongue end of chapter five part one Chapter Five, Part Two of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter Five: Tendencies in American. Part Two: Points of Difference. These exchanges and coalescences, however though they invigorate each language with the blood of the other and are often very striking in detail are neither numerous enough nor general enough to counteract the centrifugal force which pulls them apart the simple fact is that the spirit of english and the spirit of american have been at odds for nearly a century and that the way of one is not the way of the other the lone words that fly to and fro when examined closely are found to be few in number both relatively and absolutely they do not greatly affect the larger movements of the two languages 
many of them indeed are little more than temporary borrowings they are not genuinely adopted but merely momentarily fashionable the class of englishmen which affects american phrases is perhaps but little larger taking one year with another than the class of americans which affects english phrases this last class it must be plain is very small leave the large cities and you will have difficulty finding any members of it it is circumscribed not because there is any very formidable prejudice against english locutions as such but simply because recognizably english locutions in a good many cases do not fit into the american language the american thinks in american and the englishman in english and it requires a definite effort usually but defectively successful for either to put his thoughts into the actual idiom of the other the difficulties of this enterprise are well exhibited though quite unconsciously by w l george in a chapter entitled litany of the novelist in his book of criticism literary chapters this chapter it is plain by internal evidence was written not for englishmen but for americans a good part of it in fact is in the second person we are addressed and argued with directly and throughout there is an obvious endeavor to help out comprehension by a studied use of purely american phrases and examples one hears not of the east end but of the east side not of the city but of wall street not of belgravia or the west end but of fifth avenue not of bowler hats but of derbies not of idlers in pubs but of saloon loafers not of pounds shillings and pence but of dollars and cents in brief a gallant attempt upon a strange tongue and by a writer of the utmost skill but a hopeless failure none the less in the midst of his best american george drops into briticism after briticism some of them quite as unintelligible to the average american reader as so many gallicisms on page after page they display the practical impossibility of the enterprise back garden for backyard perambulator for baby carriage corn market for grain market coal owner for coal operator post for mail and so on and to top them there are english terms that have no american equivalents at all for example kitchen fender the same failure perhaps usually worse is displayed every time an english novelist or dramatist essays to put an american into a novel or a play and to make him speak american however painstakingly it is done the englishman invariably falls into capital blunders and the result is derided by americans as mark twain derided the miner's lingo of bret hart and for the same reason the thing lies deeper than vocabulary and even than pronunciation and intonation the divergences show themselves in habits of speech that are fundamental and almost indefinable and when the transoceanic gesture is from the other direction they become even plainer an englishman in an american play seldom shows the actual speech habit of the sassenach what he shows is the speech habit of an american actor trying to imitate george alexander there are not five playwrights in america said channing pollock one day who can write english that is the english of familiar discourse why should there be replied lewis sherwin there are not five thousand people in america who can speak english the elements that enter into the special character of american have been rehearsed in the first chapter a general impatience of rule and restraint a democratic enmity to all authority an extravagant and often grotesque humor an extraordinary capacity for metaphor in brief all the natural marks of what van wyck brooks calls a popular life which bubbles with energy and spreads and grows and slips away ever more and more from the control of tested ideas a popular life with the lid off this is the spirit of america and from it the american language is nourished brooks perhaps generalizes a bit too lavishly 
Below the surface there is also a curious conservatism, even a sort of timorousness. In a land of manumitted peasants the primary trait of the peasant is bound to show itself now and then. As Wendell Phillips once said, more than any other people we Americans are afraid of one another, that is, afraid of opposition, of derision, of all the consequences of singularity. But in the field of language, as in that of politics, this suspicion of the new is often transformed into a suspicion of the merely unfamiliar, and so its natural tendency toward conservatism is overcome. It is of the essence of democracy that it remain a government by amateurs, and under a government by amateurs it is precisely the expert who is most questioned, and it is the expert who commonly stresses the experience of the past. And in a democratic society, it is not the iconoclast who seems most revolutionary, but the purest. The derisive designation of highbrow is thoroughly American in more ways than one. It is a word put together in an unmistakably American fashion, it reflects an habitual American attitude of mind, and its potency in debate is peculiarly national, too. I dare say it is largely a fear of the weapon in it. There are many others of like effect in the arsenal, which accounts for the far greater prevalence of idioms from below in the formal speech of America than in the formal speech of England. There is surely no English novelist of equal rank whose prose shows so much of colloquial looseness and ease as one finds in the prose of Howells. To find a match for it one must go to the prose of the Neo-Celts, professedly modelled upon the speech of peasants, and almost proudly defiant of English grammar and syntax, and to the prose of the English themselves before the Restoration. Nor is it imaginable that an Englishman of comparable education and position would ever employ such locutions as those I have hitherto quoted from the public addresses of Dr. Wilson that is, innocently, seriously, as a matter of course. The Englishman, when he makes use of coinages of that sort, does so in conscious relaxation, and usually with a somewhat heavy sense of doggishness. They are proper to the paddock, or even to the dinner-table, but scarcely to serious scenes and occasions. But in the United States their use is the rule rather than the exception, it is not the man who uses them, but the man who doesn't use them, who is marked off. Their employment, if high example counts for anything, is a standard habit of the language, as their diligent avoidance is a standard habit of English. A glance through the congressional record is sufficient to show how small is the minority of purists among the chosen leaders of the nation. Within half an hour, turning the pages at random, I find scores of locutions that would paralyze the stenographers in the House of Commons, and they are in the speeches not of wild mavericks from the West, but of some of the chief men of the two houses. Surely no senator occupied a more conspicuous position during the first year of the war than Lee S. Overman of North Carolina chairman of the Committee on Rules, and commander of the administration forces on the floor. Well, I find Senator Overman using to enthuse in a speech of the utmost seriousness and importance, and not once but over and over again. I turn back a few pages and encounter it again, this time in the mouth of General Sherwood of Ohio. A few more, and I find a fit match for it, to wit, to biograph. The speaker here is Senator L. Y. Sherman of Illinois. In the same speech he uses to resolute. A few more and various other characteristic verbs are unearthed. To demagogue, to dope out, to fall down in the sense of to fail, to jack up, to phone, to peeve, to come across, to hike, to butt in, to backpedal, to get solid with, to hooverize to trustify, to feature, to insurge, to haze, to reminisce, to camouflage, to play for a sucker, and so on, almost ad infinitum. 
and with them a large number of highly american nouns chiefly compounds all pressing upward for recognition tin lizzy brainstorm come down pinhead trustification pork barrel buck private doughboy cow country and adjectives jitney bush for rural balled up dolled up phony tax paid footnotes balled up and its verb to ball up were originally somewhat improper no doubt on account of the slang significance of ball but of late they have made steady progress toward polite acceptance after the passage of the first war revenue act cigar boxes began to bear this inscription the contents of this box have been taxed paid as cigars of class b as indicated by the internal revenue stamp affixed even tax paid which was later substituted is obviously better than this clumsy double inflection End of footnotes. and phrases dollars to doughnuts on the job that gets me one best bet and back formations ad movie photo and various substitutions and americanized inflections over for more than gotten for got in the present perfect rile for royal bust for burst this last in truth has come into a dignity that even grammarians will soon hesitate to question who in america would dare to speak of bursting a bronco or of a trust burster footnote bust seems to be driving out burst completely when used figuratively even in the literal sense it creeps into more or less respectable usage thus i find a busted tire in a speech by general sherwood of ohio in the house january twenty fourth nineteen eighteen the familiar american derivative buster as in buster brown is unknown to the english End of footnote. End of chapter five, part two. Chapter five, part three of the American language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter five. Tendencies in American. Part three lost distinctions this general iconoclasm reveals itself especially in a disdain for most of the niceties of modern english the american like the elizabethan englishman is usually quite unconscious of them and even when they have been instilled into him by the hard labor of pedagogues he commonly pays little heed to them in his ordinary discourse the English distinction between will and shall offers a salient case in point. This distinction, it may be said at once, is far more a confection of the grammarians than a product of the natural forces shaping the language. It has indeed little etymological basis, and is but imperfectly justified logically. One finds it disregarded in the authorized version of the Bible, in all the plays of Shakespeare, in the essays of the reign of Anne, and in some of the best examples of modern English literature. The theory behind it is so inordinately abstruse that the Fowlers, in the King's English, require twenty pages to explain it, and even then they come to the resigned conclusion that the task is hopeless. The idiomatic use of the two auxiliaries, they say, is so complicated that those who are not to the manner born can hardly acquire it. Footnote. L. Pearson Smith in the English language, page 29, says that the differentiation is so complicated that it can hardly be mastered by those born in parts of the British islands in which it has not yet been established, for example, all of Ireland and most of Scotland end of footnote well even those who are to the manner born seem to find it difficult for at once the learned authors cite blunder in the writings of richardson stevenson gladstone jowett oscar wilde and even henry sweet author of the best existing grammar of the english language in american the distinction is almost lost 
no ordinary american save after the most laborious reflection would detect anything wrong in this sentence from the london times denounced as corrupt by the fowlers we must reconcile what we would like to do with what we can do nor in this by w b yeats the character who delights us may commit murder like macbeth and yet we will rejoice in every happiness that comes to him half a century ago impatient of the effort to fasten the english distinction upon american george p marsh attacked it as of no logical value or significance whatever and predicted that at no very distant day this verbal quibble will disappear and one of the auxiliaries will be employed with all persons of the nominative exclusively as the sign of the future and the other only as an expression of purpose or authority footnote quoted by white in words and their uses pages two sixty four to five white however dissented vigorously and devoted ten pages to explaining the difference between the two auxiliaries most of the other authorities of the time were also against marsh for example richard mead Bache, see his vulgarisms and other errors of speech page ninety two and following Sir Edmund Head, Governor-General of Canada from 1854 to 1861, wrote a whole book upon the subject, Shall and Will, or Two Chapters on Future Auxiliary Verbs, London, 1856. End of footnote. This prophecy has been substantially verified. Will is sound American with all persons of the nominative, and shall is almost invariably an expression of purpose or authority. Footnote. The probable influence of Irish immigration upon the American usage is not to be overlooked. Joyce says flatly, English as we speak it in Ireland, page 77, that, like many another Irish idiom, this is also found in American society chiefly through the influence of the Irish at all events the irish example must have reinforced it in ireland will i light the fire ma'am is colloquially sound End of footnote. and so though perhaps not to the same extent with who and whom now and then there arises a sort of panicky feeling that whom is being neglected and so it is trotted out footnote often with such amusing results as whom is your father and whom spoke to me the exposure of excesses of that sort always attracts the wits especially franklin p adams End of footnote. but in the main the american language tends to dispense with it at least in its least graceful situations noah webster always the pragmatic reformer denounced it so long ago as seventeen eighty three Common sense, he argued, was on the side of who did he marry. Today, such a form as whom are you talking to would seem somewhat affected in ordinary discourse in America. Who are you talking to is heard a thousand times oftener and is doubly American, for it substitutes who for whom and puts a preposition at the end of a sentence, two crimes that most English purists would seek to avoid. It is among the pronouns that the only remaining case inflections in English are to be found, if we forget the possessive, and even here these survivors of an earlier day begin to grow insecure. Lounsbury's defense of it is me, as we shall see in the next chapter, has support in the history and natural movement of the language, and that movement is also against the preservation of the distinction between who and whom footnote it is i is quite as unsound historically the correct form would be it am i or i am it compare the german ich bin es not es ist ich and a footnote the common speech plays hob with both of the orthodox inflections despite the protests of grammarians and in the long run no doubt they will be forced to yield to its pressure as they have always yielded in the past between the dative and accusative on the one side and the nominative on the other there has been war in the english language for centuries and it has always tended to become a war of extermination 
our now universal use of you for ye in the nominative shows the dative and accusative swallowing the nominative and the practical disappearance of hither thither and whither whose place is now taken by here there and where shows a contrary process in such wars a posse comitatus marches ahead of the disciplined army american stands to english in the relation of that posse to that army it is incomparably more enterprising more contemptuous of precedent and authority more impatient of rule a shadowy line often separates what is currently coming into sound usage from what is still regarded as barbarous no self-respecting american i dare say would defend ain't as a substitute for isn't say in he ain't the man and yet ain't is already tolerably respectable in the first person where english countenances the even more clumsy aren't aren't has never got a foothold in the american first person when it is used at all which is very rarely it is always as a conscious Briticism. facing the alternative of employing the unwieldy am i not in this the american turns boldly to ain't i in this it still grates a bit perhaps but aren't grates even more here as always the popular speech is pulling the exacter speech along and no one familiar with its successes in the past can have much doubt that it will succeed again soon or late in the same way it is breaking down the inflectional distinction between adverb and adjective so that i feel bad begins to take on the dignity of a national idiom and sure to go big and run slow become almost respectable footnote a common direction to motormen and locomotive engineers the english form is slow down i note however that drive slowly is in the taxicab shed at the pennsylvania station in new york and a footnote when on the entrance into the war the marine corps chose treat em rough as its motto no one thought to raise a grammatical objection and the clipped adverb was printed upon hundreds of thousands of posters and displayed in every town in the country always with the imprimatur of the national government so again american in its spoken form tends to obliterate the distinction between nearly related adjectives for example healthful and healthy tasteful and tasty and to challenge the somewhat absurd textbook prohibition of terminal prepositions so that where are we at loses its old raciness and to dally with the double negative as in i have no doubt but that footnote i quote from a speech made by senator sherman of illinois in the united states senate on june twentieth nineteen eighteen vide congressional record for that day page eight seven four three two days later there is no question but that appeared in a letter by john lee coulter a m p h d dean of west virginia university it was read into the record of june twenty second by mr ashwell one of the louisiana representatives even the pedantic senator henry cabot lodge oozing harvard from every pore uses but that vide the record for may fourteenth nineteen eighteen page six nine nine six End of footnote. But these tendencies, or at least the more extravagant of them, belong to the next chapter. How much influence they exert, even indirectly, is shown by the American disdain of the English precision in the use of the indefinite pronoun. I turn to the Saturday Evening Post, and in two minutes find, one feels like an atom when he begins to review his own life and deeds. The error is very rare in English. The Fowlers, seeking examples of it, could get them only from the writings of a third-rate woman novelist, Scotch to boot. But it is so common in American that it scarcely attracts notice. Neither does the appearance of a redundant S in such words as towards, downwards, afterwards, and heavenwards. 
in england this s is used relatively seldom and then it usually marks a distinction in meaning as it does on both sides of the ocean between beside and besides in modern standard english says smith though not in the english of the united states a distinction which we feel but many of us could not define is made between forward and forwards forwards being used in definite contrast to any other direction as if you move at all you can only move forwards while forward is used where no such contrast is implied as in the common phrase to bring a matter forward footnote this phrase of course is a Briticism and seldom used in america the american form is to take a matter up End of footnote this specific distinction despite smith probably retains some force in the united states too but in general our usage allows the s in cases where english usage would certainly be against it gould in the fifties noted its appearance at the end of such words as somewhere and anyway and denounced it as vulgar and illogical thornton has traced anyways back to eighteen forty two and shown that it is an archaism and to be found in the book of common prayer circa 1560 perhaps it has been preserved by analogy with sideways henry james in the question of our speech attacked such forms of impunity as somewheres else and nowheres else a good ways on and a good ways off as vulgarisms with what a great deal of general credit for what we good-naturedly call refinement appears so able to coexist towards and afterwards though frowned upon in england are now quite sound in american i find the former in the title of an article in dialect notes which plainly gives it scholastic authority more and with no little humor i find it in the deed of a fund given to the american academy of arts and letters to enable the gifted philologues of that sanhedrin to consider its duty towards the conservation of the english language in its beauty and purity both towards and afterwards finally are included in the new york evening post's list of words no longer disapproved when in their proper places along with over for more than and during for in the course of in the last chapter we glanced at several salient differences between the common coin of english and the common coin of american that is the verbs and adjectives in constant colloquial use the rubber stamps so to speak of the two languages america has two adverbs that belong to the same category they are right and good neither holds the same place in english thornton shows that the use of right as in right away right good and right now was already widespread in the united states early in the last century his first example is dated eighteen eighteen he believes that the locution was possibly imported from the southwest of ireland whatever its origin it quickly attracted the attention of english visitors dickens noted right away as an almost universal americanism during his first american tour in eighteen forty two and poked fun at it in the second chapter of american notes right is used as a synonym for directly as in right away right off right now and right on time for moderately as in right well right smart right good and right often and in place of precisely as in right there some time ago in an article on americanisms an english critic called it that most distinctively american word and concocted the following dialogue to instruct the english in its use how do i get to blank go right along and take the first turning sick on the right and you are right there right 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 like w l george this englishman failed in his attempt to write correct american despite his fine pedagogical passion no american would ever say take the first turning he would say turn at the first corner as for right away 
r o williams argues that so far as analogy can make good english it is as good as one could choose nevertheless the oxford dictionary admits it only as an americanism and avoids all mention of the other american uses of right as an adverb good is almost as protean it is not only used as a general synonym for all adjectives and adverbs connoting satisfaction as in to feel good to be treated good to sleep good but also as a reinforcement to other adjectives and adverbs as in i hit him good and hard and i am good and tired of late some has come into wide use as an adjective adverb of all work indicating special excellence or high degree as in some girl some sick going some etc it is still below the salt but threatens to reach a more respectable position one encounters it in the newspapers constantly and in the congressional record and not long ago a writer in the atlantic monthly hymned it ecstatically as some word a true super word in fact and argued that it could be used in a sense for which there is absolutely no synonym in the dictionary basically it appears to be an adjective but in many of its common situations the grammarians would probably call it an adverb it gives no little support to the growing tendency already noticed to break down the barrier between the two parts of speech end of chapter five part three chapter five part four of the american language this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the american language by h l mencken chapter five tendencies in american Part Four, Foreign Influences Today No other great nation of today supports so large a foreign population as the United States, either relatively or absolutely. None other contains so many foreigners forced to an effort, often ignorant and ineffective, to master the national language. Since 1820 nearly 35 million immigrants have come into the country and of them probably not ten million brought any preliminary acquaintance with English with them. The census of 1910 showed that nearly 1,500,000 persons then living permanently on American soil could not speak it at all, that more than 13 million had been born in other countries, chiefly of different language, and that nearly 20 million were the children of such immigrants and hence under the influence of their speech habits. Altogether there were probably at least 25 million whose house language was not the Vulgate, and who thus spoke it in competition with some other language. No other country houses so many aliens. In Great Britain the alien population for a century past has never been more than 2% of the total population, and since the passage of the Alien Act of 1905 it has tended to decline steadily. In Germany in 1910 there were but 1,259,873 aliens and a population of more than 60 million, and of these nearly a half were German-speaking Austrians and Swiss. In France in 1906 there were a million foreigners and a population of 39 million, and a third of them were French-speaking Belgians, Luxembourgese, and Swiss. In Italy in 1911 there were but 350,000 in a population of 35 million. This large and constantly reinforced admixture of foreigners has naturally exerted a constant pressure upon the national language, for the majority of them at least in the first generation have found it quite impossible to acquire it in any purity, and even their children have grown up with speech habits differing radically from those of correct English. The effects of this pressure are obviously twofold. On the one hand, the foreigner, struggling with a strange and difficult tongue, makes efforts to simplify it as much as possible, and so strengthens the native tendency to disregard all niceties and complexities, and on the other hand he corrupts it with words and locutions from the language he has brought with him, and sometimes with whole idioms and grammatical forms. We have seen in earlier chapters how the Dutch and French of colonial days enriched the vocabulary of the colonists how the German immigrants of the first half of the nineteenth century enriched it still further, and how the Irish of the same period influenced its everyday usages. The same process is still going on. 
the Italians, the Slavs, and above all the Russian Jews make steady contributions to the American vocabulary and idiom. And though these contributions are often concealed by quick and complete naturalization, their foreignness to English remains none the less obvious. I should worry, in its way, is correct English, but in essence it is as completely Yiddish as kosher, ganov, shadchen, oyoy, matzah, or mazuma. Black hand, too, is English in form, but it is nevertheless as plainly an Italian loanword as spaghetti, mafia, or padrone. The extent of such influences upon American, and particularly upon spoken American, remains to be studied. In the whole literature I can find but one formal article upon the subject. That article deals specifically with the suffix F-E-S-T, fest, which came into American from the German and was probably suggested by familiarity with Songerfest. There is no mention of it in any of the dictionaries of Americanisms, and yet, in such forms as Talkfest and Gabfest, it is met with almost daily. So too with Heimer, Inski, and Bund. Several years ago Heimer had a great vogue in slang and was rapidly done to death, but Weisenheimer remains, in colloquial use, as a facetious synonym for smart aleck, and after a while it may gradually acquire dignity. Far lowlier words, in fact, have worked their way in. But Inski, perhaps, is going the same route. As for the words in Bund, many of them are already almost accepted. Plunderbund is now at least as good as Pork Barrel, and Slush Fund, and Money Bund is frequently heard in Congress. Such locutions creep in stealthily, and are secure before they are suspected. Current slang, out of which the more decorous language dredges a large part of its raw materials, is full of them. Nix and Nixi, for no, are debased forms of the German Nix. Abernicht, once popular as camouflage, is obviously Abernicht. And a steady flow of nouns, all needed to designate objects introduced by immigrants, enriches the vocabulary. The Hungarians not only brought their national condiment with them, they also brought its name, paprika, and that name is now thoroughly American. Footnote. Paprika is in the standard dictionary, but I have been unable to find it in any English dictionary. Another such word is kimono, from the Japanese. In footnote. In the same way, the Italians brought in camara, padrone, spaghetti, and a score of other substantives, and the Jews made contributions from Yiddish and Hebrew, and greatly reinforced certain old borrowings from German. Once such a loan word gets in, it takes firm root. During the first year of American participation in the World War, an effort was made on patriotic grounds to substitute Liberty Cabbage for sauerkraut, but it quickly failed, for the name had become as completely Americanized as the thing itself. And so Liberty Cabbage seemed affected and absurd. In the same way, a great many other German words survived the passions of the time. Nor could all the influence of the professional patriots obliterate that German influence which is fastened upon the American yes, something of the quality of ja. Constant familiarity with such contributions from foreign languages and with the general speech habits of foreign peoples has made American a good deal more hospitable to loan words than English, even in the absence of special pressure. Let the same word knock at the gates of the two languages, and American will admit it more readily, and give it at once a wider and more intimate currency. Examples are afforded by café, vaudeville, employee, boulevard, cabaret, toilette, exposé, kindergarten, depot, fate, and menu. Café in American is a word of much larger and more varied meaning than in English and is used much more frequently and by many more persons. So is employé in the naturalized form of employee. So is toilet. We have even seen it as a euphemism for native terms that otherwise would be in daily use. So is kindergarten. I read lately of a kindergarten for the elementary instruction of conscripts. Such words are not unknown to the Englishman, but when he uses them it is with a plain sense of their foreignness. 
In American, they are completely naturalized, as is shown by the spelling and pronunciation of most of them. An American would no more think of attempting the French pronunciation of depot, or of putting the French accents upon it, than he would think of spelling toilet with the final T-E, or of essaying to pronounce Anheuser in the German manner. Often curious battles go on between such loan words and their English equivalents, and with varying fortunes. In 1895, Weber and Fields tried to establish Music Hall in New York, but it quickly succumbed to vaudeville theater, as variety had succumbed to vaudeville before it. In the same way, lawn fate, without the circumflex accent and commonly pronounced feet, has elbowed out the English garden party. But now and then, when the competing loan word happens to violate American speech habits, a native term ousts it. The French crash offers an example. It has been entirely displaced by day nursery. The English in this matter display their greater conservatism very plainly. Even when a loan word enters both English and American simultaneously, a sense of foreignness lingers about it on the other side of the Atlantic much longer than on this side, and it is used with far more self-consciousness. The word matinee offers a convenient example. To this day the English commonly printed in italics give it its French accent and pronounce it with some attempt at the French manner. But in America it is entirely naturalized, and the most ignorant man uses it without any feeling that it is strange. The same lack of any sense of linguistic integrity is to be noticed in many other directions. For example, in the freedom with which the Latin per is used with native nouns, one constantly sees per day, per dozen, per hundred, per mile, etc. in American newspapers, even the most careful. But in England the more seemly ah is almost always used, or the noun itself is made Latin, as in per diem. Per, in fact, is fast becoming an everyday American word. Such phrases as per your letter or order of the fifteenth instant are incessantly met with in business correspondence. The same greater hospitality is shown by the readiness with which various un-English prefixes and affixes come into fashion, for example, super and itis. The English accept them gingerly. The Americans take them in with enthusiasm and naturalize them instanter. The same deficiency in reserve is to be noted in nearly all other colonialized dialects. The Latin American variants of Spanish, for example, have adopted a great many words which appear in true Castilian only as occasional guests. Thus in Argentina, matinee, menu, debut, toilette, and femme de chambre are perfectly good Argentine, and in Mexico, sandwich and club have been thoroughly naturalized. The same thing is to be noted in the French of Haiti, in the Portuguese of Brazil, and even in the Danish of Norway. Once a language spreads beyond the country of its origin and begins to be used by people born in the German phrase to a different Sprachgefühl, the sense of loyalty to its vocabulary is lost along with the instinctive feeling for its idiomatic habits. How far this destruction of its forms may go in the absence of strong contrary influences is exhibited by the rise of the Romance languages from the vulgar Latin of the Roman provinces, and here at home, by the decay of foreign languages in competition with English. The Yiddish that the Jews from Russia bring in is German debased with Russian, Polish, and Hebrew. In America it quickly absorbs hundreds of words and idioms from the speech of the streets. Various conflicting German dialects among the so-called Pennsylvania Dutch, and in the German areas of the Northwest combine in a patois that in its end forms shows almost as much English as German. Classical examples of it are Es gibt gar kein Jus, Ich kann es nicht standen, and Mein Stallion hat über die Fens geschumpt, und dem Nachbar sein Wiet abschulich gedemacht. The use of Gleich for to like by false analogy from Gleich, like, similar, is characteristic. In the same way the Scandinavians in the Northwest corrupt their native Swedish and Dano-Norwegian. 
Thus American Norwegian is heavy with such forms as Stritkar, Rydiva, Nektoy, and Statesprusen, for streetcar, right away, necktie, and states prison, and admits such phrases as det maker engine differens. The changes that Yiddish has undergone in America, though rather foreign to the present inquiry, are interesting enough to be noticed. First of all, it has admitted into its vocabulary a large number of everyday substantives, among them boy, chair, window, carpet, floor, dress, hat, watch, ceiling, consumption, property, trouble, bother, match, change, party, birthday, picture, paper, only in the sense of newspaper, gambler, show, hall, kitchen, store, bedroom, key, mantelpiece, closet, lounge, broom, tablecloth, paint, landlord, fellow, tenant, shop, wages, foreman, sleeve, collar, cuff, button, cotton, thimble, needle, pocket, bargain, sale, remnant, sample, haircut, razor, waist, basket, school, scholar, teacher, baby, mustache, butcher, grocery, dinner, street, and walk. And with them, many characteristic Americanisms, for example, bluffer, faker, boodler, grafter, gangster, crook, guy, kike, piker, squealer, bum, cadet, boom, bunch, pants, vest, loafer, jumper, stoop, sales lady, icebox, and raise, with their attendant verbs and adjectives. These words are used constantly. Many of them have quite crowded out the corresponding Yiddish words. For example, Engel, meaning boy, it is a Slavic loan word in Yiddish, has been obliterated by the English word. A Jewish immigrant almost invariably refers to his son as his boy, though strangely enough he calls his daughter his Mädel. Die boys mit die Mädlach haben a good time is excellent American Yiddish. In the same way, Finster has been completely displaced by window, though Tour, door, has been left intact. Tisch, table, also remains, but chair is always used, probably because few of the Jews had chairs in the old country. There the Benkel, a bench without a back, was in use. Chairs were only for the well-to-do. Floor has apparently prevailed because no invariable corresponding word was employed at home. In various parts of Russia and Poland a floor is a dill, a podloge, or a brick. So with ceiling. There were six different words for it. Yiddish inflections have been fastened upon most of these loan words. Thus, erhadem ebgefecht is he cheated him. Zubunt is the American gone to the bad. Fixin' is to fix, usin' is to use, and so on. The feminine and diminutive suffix k is often added to nouns. Thus, bluffer gives rise to bluffer k, hypocrite. And one also notes dress k, hat k, watched k, and bummer k. Oi, is she a bluffer k? Is good American Yiddish for isn't she a hypocrite? The suffix nick, signifying agency, is also freely applied. All right nick means an upstart, an offensive boaster, one of whom his fellows would say he is all right with a sneer. Similarly, consumption nick means a victim of tuberculosis. Other suffixes are chick and idge, the first exemplified in boy chick, a diminutive of boy, and the second in next storage meaning the woman next door, an important person in ghetto social life. Some of the loan words, of course, undergo changes on Yiddish-speaking lips. Thus landlord becomes lindler, lounge becomes lunch, tenant becomes tenor, and whiskers loses its final s. Wie gefällt der sein Whisker, how do you like his beard, is good Yiddish ironically intended. Fellow, of course, changes to the American feller, as in Rosie Hotschon the Feller, 
Rosie has got a feller, i.e. a sweetheart. Show, in the sense of chance, is used constantly, as in, get him a show, give him a chance. Bad boy is adopted bodily, as in, or is a bad boy. To shut up is inflected as one word, as in, or hocknick gewalt shut upen, he wouldn't shut up. To catch is used in the sense of to obtain, as in catchin' a gemil of chesed, to raise a loan. Here, by the way, gemilath, chesed, is excellent biblical Hebrew. To bluff, unchanged in form, takes on the new meaning of to lie. A bluffer is a liar. Scores of American phrases are in constant use, among them all right, never mind, I bet you, no sir, and I'll fix you. It is curious to note that sure Mike, borrowed by the American Vulgate from Irish English, has gone over into American Yiddish. Finally, to make an end, here are two complete and characteristic American Yiddish sentences. Sivet cleanin' de rooms, scrubbin' dem floor, washin' de windows, dressin' dem boy, un gin in butcher store, un in grocery. Der nag visi makin' dinner, un gay in street for a walk. American itself in the Philippines and to a lesser extent in Puerto Rico and on the Isthmus has undergone similar changes under the influence of Spanish and the native dialects. Maurice P. Dunlap offers the following specimen of a conversation between two Americans long resident in Manila. Hola, amigo. Como esta cayo? Por qué were you hablaing with esa señorita? She wanted a job as lavandera. Cuando? Ten cents, cona de piece. So I told her no carry. Have you had chow? Well, spare it till I sign this chit and I'll take a paseo with you. Here we have an example of Philippine American that shows all the tendencies of American Yiddish. It retains the general forms of America, but in the short conversation embracing but 41 different words, there are eight loan words from the Spanish, hola, amigo, porque, esa, señorita, lavandera, cuando, and paseo. Two Spanish locutions in a debased form, spera for espera, and no carry for no quiero. Two loan words from the Tagalog, comusta and keo. Two from Pidgin English, chow and chit. One Philippine American localism, conant, and a Spanish verb with an English inflection, hablaing. The immigrant, in the midst of a large native population, of course, exerts no such pressure upon the national language as that exerted upon an immigrant language by the native, but nevertheless, his linguistic habits and limitations have to be reckoned with in dealing with him. And the concessions thus made necessary have a very ponderable influence upon the general speech. In the usual sense, as we have seen, there are no dialects in American. Two natives, however widely their birthplaces may be separated, never have any practical difficulty understanding each other. But there are at least quasi-dialects among the immigrants, the Irish, the German, the Scandinavian, the Italian, the Jewish, and so on. And these quasi-dialects undoubtedly leave occasional marks not only upon the national vocabulary, but also upon the general speech habits of the country as in the case, for example, of the pronunciation of yes, already mentioned, and in that of the substitution of the diphthong oi for the er sound in such words as world, journal, and burn. A Yiddishism now almost universal among the lower classes of New York and threatening to spread. Footnote. Compare the English of the lower classes in New York City and vicinity, Dialect Notes, Volume 1, Part 9, 1896, it is curious to note that the same corruption occurs in the Spanish spoken in Santo Domingo. The Dominicans thus change porque into boyque. Compare Santo Domingo by Otto Schoenrich, New York, 1918, page 172. End footnote. More important, however, is the support given to a native tendency by the foreigners in capacity for employing or even comprehending syntax of any complexity, or words not of the simplest. This is the tendency toward succinctness and clarity at whatever sacrifice of grace. One English observer, Sidney Lowe, puts the chief blame for the general explosiveness of American upon the immigrant, who must be communicated with in the plainest words available, and is not socially worthy of the suavity of circumlocution anyhow. 
In his turn the immigrant seizes upon these plainest words as upon a sort of convenient lingua franca. His quick adoption of damn as a universal adjective is traditional, and throws his influence upon the side of the underlying speech habit when he gets on in the Vulgate. Many characteristic Americanisms of the sort to stagger lexicographers, for example, near silk, have come from the Jews, whose progress in business is a good deal faster than their progress in English. Others, as we have seen, have come from the German immigrants of half a century ago, from the so-called Pennsylvania Dutch, who are notoriously ignorant and uncouth, and from the Irish who brought with them a form of English already very corrupt. The same and similar elements greatly reinforce the congenital tendencies of the dialect, toward the facile manufacture of compounds, toward a disregard of the distinction between parts of speech, and above all, toward the throwing off of all etymological restraints. End of chapter 5, part 4 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 5, part 5 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 5 Tendencies in American Part 5 Processes of Word Formation Some of these tendencies, it has been pointed out, go back to the period of the first growth of American, and were inherited from the English of the time. They are the products of a movement which, reaching its height in the English of Elizabeth, was dammed up at home, so to speak, by the rise of linguistic self-consciousness toward the end of the reign of Anne, but continued almost unobstructed in the colonies. For example, there is what philologists call the habit of back formation, a sort of instinctive search, etymologically unsound, for short roots in long words. This habit in Restoration Days precipitated a quasi-English word, mobile, from the Latin mobile vulgus, and in the days of William and Mary it went a step further by precipitating mob from mobile. Mob is now sound English, but in the 18th century it was violently attacked by the new sect of purists, and though it survived their onslaught, they undoubtedly greatly impeded the formation and adoption of other words of the same category. But in the colonies, the process went on unimpeded, save for the feeble protests of such stray pedants as Witherspoon and Boucher. Rattler for rattlesnake, pike for turnpike, draw for drawbridge, coon for raccoon, possum for opossum, cuss for customer, cute for acute, squash for aska to squash. These American back formations are already antique. Sabbath day for Sabbath day has actually reached the dignity of an archaism. To this day they are formed in great numbers. Scarcely a new substantive of more than two syllables comes in without bringing one in its wake. We have thus witnessed, within the past two years, the genesis of scores now in wide use and fast taking on respectability. Phone for telephone, gas for gasoline, co-ed for co-educational, pop for populist, frat for fraternity, gym for gymnasium, movie for moving picture, prep school for preparatory school, auto for automobile, aero for aeroplane. Some linger on the edge of vulgarity, pep for pepper, flu for influenza, plut for plutocrat, pen for penitentiary, con for confidence, as in con man, con game, and to con, convict and consumption, Defy for defiance, butte for beauty, rep for reputation, stenog for stenographer, ambish for ambition, vag for vagrant, champ for champion, 
pard for partner coke for cocaine simp for simpleton diff for difference others are already in perfectly good usage smoker for smoking car diner for dining car sleeper for sleeping car oleo for oleomargarine hypo for hyposulfate of soda yank for yankee confab for confabulation memo for memorandum pop concert for popular concert ad for advertisement is struggling hard for recognition some of its compounds that is ad writer want ad display ad ad card ad rate column ad and ad man are already accepted in technical terminology boob for booby promises to become sound american in a few years its synonyms are no more respectable than it is at its heels is bow for hobo an altogether fit successor to bum for bummer a parallel movement shows itself in the great multiplication of common abbreviations americans as a rule says farmer employ abbreviations to an extent unknown in europe this trait of the american character is discernible in every department of the national life and thought ok cod ng gop which is get out and push and pdq are almost national hallmarks the immigrant learns them immediately after damn and go to hell thornton traces ng to 1840 cod and pdq are probably as old as for ok it was in use so early as 1790 but it apparently did not acquire its present significance until the twenties originally it seems to have meant ordered recorded during the presidential campaign of eighteen twenty eight jackson's enemies seeking to prove his illiteracy alleged that he used it for all correct o l l k o r r e c t of late the theory has been put forward that it is derived from an indian word ok signifying so be it and dr woodrow wilson is said to support this theory and to use ok in endorsing government papers but i am unaware of the authority upon which the etymology is based bartlett says that the figurative use of a number one as in a number one man also originated in america but this may not be true there can be little doubt, however, TB for tuberculosis, GB for grand bounce, 23 on the QT, and D&D &D for drunken disorderly. The language breeds such short forms of speech prodigiously. Every trade and profession has a host of them. They are innumerable in the slang of sport. What one sees under all this, account for it as one will, is a double habit the which is at bottom sufficient explanation of the gap which begins to yawn between english and american particularly on the spoken plane on the one hand it is a habit of verbal economy a jealous disinclination to waste two words on what can be put into one a natural taste for the brilliant and succinct a disdain of all grammatical and lexicographical daintiness born partly perhaps of ignorance but also in part of a sound sense of their imbecility and on the other hand there is a high relish and talent for metaphor in brander matthews phrase a figurative vigor that the elizabethans would have realized and understood just as the american rebels instinctively against such parliamentary circumlocutions as i am not prepared to say and so much by way of being just as he would fret under the forms of english journalism with its reporting empty of drama its third person smothering of speeches and its complex and unintelligible jargon just so in his daily speech and writing he chooses terseness and vividness 
whenever there is a choice, and seeks to make one when it doesn't exist. Footnote. The classic example is in a parliamentary announcement by Sir Robert Peel. When that question is made to me in a proper time, in a proper place, under proper qualifications, and with proper motives, I will hesitate long before I will refuse to take it into consideration. End footnote. There is more than mere humorous contrast between the famous placard in the washroom of the British Museum. These basins are for casual ablutions only and the familiar sign at American railroad crossings. Stop, look, listen. Between the two lies an abyss, separating two cultures, two habits of mind, two diverging tongues. It is almost unimaginable that an Englishman, journeying up and down in elevators, would ever have stricken the teens out of their speech, turning sixteenth into simple six and twenty-fourth into four. The clipping is almost as far from their way of doing things as the climbing so high in the air. Nor have they the brilliant facility of Americans for making new words, of grotesque but penetrating tropes, as in corn-fed, tightwad, bonehead, bleachers, and juice for electricity. When they attempt such things, the result is often lugubrious. Two hundred years of schoolmastering has dried up their inspiration. Nor have they the fine American hand for devising new verbs. To Mafic and to Limehouse are their best specimens in twenty years, and both have an almost pathetic flatness. Their business with the language indeed is not in this department. They are not charged with its raids and scoutings, but with the organization of its conquests and the guarding of its accumulated stores. For the student interested in the biology of language, as opposed to its paleontology, there is endless material in the racy neologisms of American, and particularly in its new compounds and novel verbs. Nothing could exceed the brilliancy of such inventions as joyride, highbrow, road louse, sob sister, nature faker, stand patter, lounge lizard, hash foundry, buzz wagon, has been, end seat hog, shoot the shoots, and grape juice diplomacy. They are bold, they are vivid, they have humor, they meet genuine needs. Joyride, I note, is already going over into English, and no wonder. There is absolutely no synonym for it. To convey its idea in orthodox English would take a whole sentence. And so too with certain single words of metaphorical origin. Barrel, for large and illicit wealth. Pork for unnecessary and dishonest appropriations of public money, joint for illegal liquor house, tenderloin for gay and dubious neighborhood. Most of these, and of the new compounds with them, belong to the vocabulary of disparagement. Here, an essential character of the American shows itself, his tendency to combat the disagreeable with irony to heap ridicule upon what he is suspicious of or doesn't understand. The rapidity with which new verbs are made in the United States is really quite amazing. Two days after the first regulations of the Food Administration were announced, to Hooverize appeared, spontaneously, in scores of newspapers, and a week later it was employed without any visible sense of its novelty in the debates of Congress, and had taken on a respectability equal to that of to Byronize, to Fletcherize, and to Oslerize. To Electrocute appeared inevitably in the first public discussion of capital punishment by electricity. To Taxi came in with the first taxicabs. 
to commute no doubt accompanied the first commutation ticket to insurge attended the birth of the progressive balderdash of late the old affix eyes i z e once fecund of such monsters as to funeralize has come into favor again and i note among its other products to belgiumize to vacationize to picturize and to scenarioize in a newspaper headline i even find to sos in the form of its gerund many characteristic american verbs are compounds of common verbs and prepositions or adverbs with new meanings imposed compare for example to give and to give out to go back and to go back on to beat and to beat it to light and to light out to butt and to butt in to turn and to turn down to show and to show up to put and to put over to wind and to wind up sometimes however the addition seems to be merely rhetorical as in to start off to finish up to open up and to hurry up to hurry up is so commonplace in america that everyone uses it and no one notices it but it remains rare in england up seems to be essential to many of these latter-day verbs for example to pony up to doll up to ball up without it they are without significance nearly all of them are attended by derivative adjectives or nouns cut up show down kick in come down hang out start off run in balled up dolled up wind up bang up turn down jump off in many directions the same prodigal fancy shows itself for example in the free interchange of parts of speech in the bold inflection of words not inflected in sound english and in the invention of wholly artificial words the first phenomenon has already concerned us would an english literary critic of any pretensions employ such a locution as all by her lonesome i have doubt of it and yet i find that phrase in a serious book by the critic of the new republic would an english m p use he has another thing coming in debate again i doubt it but even more anarchistic dedications of verbs and adjectives to substantival use are to be found in the congressional record every day jitney is an old american substantive lately revived a month after its revival it was also an adjective and before long it may also be a verb and even an adverb to lift up was turned tail first and made a substantive and is now also an adjective and a verb joyride became a verb the day after it was born as a noun and what of livest an astounding inflection indeed but with quite sound american usage behind it the metropolitan magazine of which colonel roosevelt is an editor announces on its letter paper that it is the livest magazine in america and poetry the organ of the new poetry movement prints at the head of its content page the following encomium from the new york tribune the livest art in america today is poetry and the livest expression of that art is in this little chicago monthly now and then the spirit of american shows a transient faltering and its inventiveness is displaced by a banal extension of meaning so that a single noun comes to signify discrete things thus laundry meaning originally a place where linen is washed has come to mean also the linen itself so again gun has come to mean firearms of all sorts and has entered into such compounds as gunman and gunplay and in the same way party has been borrowed from the terminology of the law 
and made to do colloquial duty as a synonym for person. But such evidences of poverty are rare and abnormal. The whole movement of the language is toward the multiplication of substantives. A new object gets a new name, and that new name enters into the common vocabulary at once. Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-E, and Hokum are late examples. Their origin is dubious and disputed, but they meet genuine needs, and so they seem to be secure. A great many more such substantives are deliberate inventions. For example, Kodak, Protectograph, Conductorette, Bevo, Klaxon, Vaseline, Japalac, Resinol, Autocar, Postum, Crisco, Electrolier, Adressograph, Alabastine, Orangeade, Pianola, Victrola, Dictograph, Kitchenette, Crispet, Celeret, Unita, Trisket, and Peptomint. Some of these indicate attempts at description. Oleomargarine, Phonograph, and Gasoline are older examples of that class. Others represent efforts to devise designations that will meet the conditions of advertising psychology and the trademarks law. To wit, that they be A. New, B. Easily remembered, and C. Not directly descriptive. Probably the most successful invention of this sort is Kodak, which was devised by George Eastman, inventor of the portable camera so-called. Kodak has so far won acceptance as a common noun that Eastman is often forced to assert his proprietary right to it. Vaseline is in the same position. The annual crop of such inventions in the United States is enormous. The majority die, but a hearty few always survive. Of analogous character are artificial words of the scalawag and rambunctious class the formation of which constantly goes on. Some of them are shortened compounds, grandificent, from grand and magnificent, so delicious, from soda and delicious, and orphanage, from war and orphanage. Footnote. This conscious shortening, of course, is to be distinguished from the shortening that goes on in words by gradual decay as in Christmas from Christ's Mass, and Daisy from Day's Eye. End footnote. Others are made up of common roots and grotesque affixes. Swell Doodle, Splendiferous, and Picherino. Yet others are mere extravagant inventions. Scallywampus, Super Gobsloptious, and Floozy. Most of these are devised by advertisement writers or college students, and belong properly to slang. But there is a steady movement of selected specimens into the common vocabulary. The words in doodle hint at German influences, and those in eno owe something to Italian, or at least to popular burlesques of what is conceived to be Italian. End of chapter 5 Part 5. Chapter 5, Part 6 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 5 Tendencies in American Pronunciation. Part 6. Language, said Sace in 1879, does not consist of letters, but of sounds, and until this fact has been brought home to us, our study of it will be little better than an exercise of memory. The theory at that time was somewhat strange to English grammarians and etymologists, despite the investigations of A. J. Ellis and the massive lesson of Grimm's Law, their labors were largely wasted upon deductions from the written word. But since then, 
chiefly under the influence of continental philologists, and particularly of the Dane J. O. H. Jesperson, they have turned from orthographical futilities to the actual sounds of the tongue, and the latest and best grammar of it, that of sweet, is frankly based upon the spoken English of educated Englishmen, not, remember, of conscious purists, but of the general body of cultivated folk. Unluckily, this new method also has its disadvantages. The men of a given race and time usually write a good deal alike, or, at all events, attempt to write alike, but in their oral speech there are wide variations. No two persons, says a leading contemporary authority upon English phonetics, pronounce exactly alike. Moreover, even the best speaker commonly uses more than one style. The result is that it is extremely difficult to determine the prevailing pronunciation of a given combination of letters at any time and place. The persons whose speech is studied pronounce it with minute shades of difference, and admit other differences according as they are conversing naturally or endeavoring to exhibit their pronunciation. Worse, it is impossible to represent a great many of these shades in print. Sweet, trying to do it, found himself in the end with a preposterous alphabet of 125 letters. Prince L. L. Bonaparte more than doubled this number, and Ellis brought it to 390. Other phonologists, English and Continental, have gone floundering into the same bog. The dictionary makers, forced to a far greater economy of means, are brought into obscurity. The difficulties of the enterprise, in fact, are probably unsurmountable. It is, as White says, almost impossible for one person to express to another, by signs, the sound of any word. Only the voice, he goes on, is capable of that. For the moment a sign is used, the question arises, what is the value of that sign? The sounds of words are the most delicate, fleeting, and inapprehensible things in nature. Moreover, the question arises as to the capability to apprehend and distinguish sounds on the part of the person whose evidence is given. Certain German orthoepists, despairing of the printed page, have turned to the phonograph, and there is a Deutsche Grammophon Gesellschaft in Berlin, which offers records of specimen speeches in a great many languages and dialects, including English. The phonograph has also been put to successful use in language teaching by various American correspondence schools. In view of all this, it would be hopeless to attempt to exhibit in print the numerous small differences between English and American pronunciation for many of them are extremely delicate and subtle, and only their aggregation makes them plain. According to a recent and very careful observer, the most important of them do not lie in pronunciation at all, properly so called, but in intonation. In this direction, he says, one must look for the true characters of the English accent. I incline to agree with White, that the pitch of the English voice is somewhat higher than that of the American, and that it is thus more penetrating. The nasal twang which Englishmen observe in the Vox Americana, though it has high overtones, is itself not high-pitched, but rather low-pitched, as all constrained and muffled tones are apt to be. The causes of that twang have long engaged phonologists, and in the main they agree that there is a physical basis for it, that our generally dry climate and rapid changes of temperature produce an actual thickening of the membranes concerned in the production of sound. We are, in brief, a somewhat snuffling people, and much more given to catars and corizas than the inhabitants of damp Britain. Perhaps this general impediment to free and easy utterance subconsciously apprehended, is responsible for the American tendency to pronounce the separate syllables of a word 
with much more care than an Englishman bestows upon them. The American, in giving extraordinary six distinct syllables instead of the Englishman's grudging four, may be seeking to make up for his natural disability. Marsh, in his Lectures on the English Language, sought two other explanations of the fact. On the one hand, he argued that the Americans of his day read a great deal more than the English, and were thus much more influenced by the spelling of words. And on the other hand, he pointed out that our flora shows that the climate of even our northern states belongs to a more southern type than that of England, and that in southern latitudes, articulation is generally much more distinct than in northern regions. In support of the latter proposition, he cited the pronunciation of Spanish, Italian, and Turkish, as compared with that of English, Danish, and German, rather unfortunate examples, for the pronunciation of German is at least as clear as that of Italian. Swedish would have supported his case far better. The Swedes debase their vowels and slide over their consonants even more markedly than the English. Marsh believed that there was a tendency among southern peoples to throw the accent back, and that this helped to bring out all the syllables. One finds a certain support for this notion in various American peculiarities of stress. Advertisement offers an example. The prevailing American pronunciation, despite incessant pedagogical counterblasts, puts the accent on the penult, whereas the English pronunciation stresses the second syllable. Paresis illustrates the same tendency. The English accent the first syllable, but, as Krapp says, American usage clings to the accent on the second syllable. There are again pianist, primarily, and telegrapher. The English accent the first syllable of each. We commonly accent the second. In temporarily, they also accent the first. We accent the third. Various other examples might be cited, but when one had marshaled them, their significance would be at once set at naught by four very familiar words, mama, papa, inquiry, and ally. Americans almost invariably accent each on the first syllable. Englishmen stress the second. For months during 1918, the publishers of the Standard Dictionary, advertising that work in the streetcars, explained that a lie should be accented on the second syllable and pointed out that owners of their dictionary were safeguarded against the vulgarism of accenting it on the first. Nevertheless, this free and highly public instruction did not suffice to exterminate ally. I made note of the pronunciations overheard, with the word constantly on all lips, but one man of my acquaintance regularly accented the second syllable, and he was an eminent scholar professionally devoted to the study of language. Thus it is unsafe, here as elsewhere, to generalize too facilely, and particularly unsafe to exhibit causes with too much assurance. Man frage nicht warum, says Philip Karl Batman, der Sprachgebrauch lässt sich nur beobachten. But the greater distinctness of American utterance whatever its genesis and machinery, is palpable enough in many familiar situations. The typical American accent, says Visitelli, is often harsh and unmusical, but it sounds all of the letters to be sounded, and slurs, but does not distort the rest. An American, for example, almost always sounds the first L in fulfill. An Englishman, makes the first syllable foo. An American sounds every syllable in extraordinary, literary, military, secretary, and the other words of the airy group, 
an Englishman never pronounces the A of the penultimate syllable. Kindness, with the D silent, would attract notice in the United States. In England, according to Jones, the D is very commonly, if not usually, omitted. Often, in America, commonly retains a full T. In England, it is actually and officially often. Let an American and an Englishman pronounce program me. Though the Englishman retains the long form of the last syllable in writing, he reduces it in speaking to a thick triple consonant. Grum. The American enunciates it clearly, rhyming it with dam. Or try the two with any word ending in G, say sporting or ripping. Or with any word having R before a consonant, say card, harbor, lord, or preferred. The majority of Englishmen, says Menner, certainly do not pronounce the R. Just as certainly, the majority of educated Americans pronounce it distinctly. Henry James, visiting the United States after many years of residence in England, was much harassed by this persistent R sound, which seemed to him to resemble a sort of morose grinding of the back teeth. So sensitive to it did he become that he began to hear where it was actually non-existent, save as an occasional barbarism, for example, in Cuber, Vanilla, and California. He put the blame for it, and for various other departures from the strict canon of contemporary English, upon the American common school, the American newspaper, and the American Dutchman and Dago. Unluckily for his case, the full voicing of the R came into American long before the appearance of any of these influences. The early colonists, in fact, brought it with them from England, and it still prevailed there in Dr. Johnson's day, for he protested publicly against the rough, snarling sound, and led the movement which finally resulted in its extinction. Today, extinct, it is mourned by English purists, and the poet laureate denounces the clergy of the established church for saying, the sod of the laud, instead of the sword of the lord. But even in the matter of elided consonants, American is not always the conservator. We cling to the R. We preserve the final G. We give nephew a clear F sound instead of the clouded English V sound, and we boldly nationalize trait and pronounce its final T, but we drop the second P from pumpkin and change the M to N. We change the F sound to plain P in diphtheria, diphthong, and naphtha. We relieve rind of its final D, and in the complete sentence, we slaughter consonants by assimilation. I have heard Englishmen say brand new, but on American lips it is almost invariably brand new. So nearly universal is this nasalization in the United States that certain American lexicographers have sought to found the term upon bran and not upon brand. Here the national speech is powerfully influenced by southern dialectical variations, which in turn probably derive partly from French example and partly from the linguistic limitations of the Negro. The latter, even after two hundred years, has great difficulties with our consonants, and often drops them. A familiar anecdote well illustrates his speech habit. On a train stopping at a small station in Georgia, a darkie threw up a window and yelled, Wee! The reply from a black on the platform was, Wee! A northerner aboard the train, puzzled by this inarticulate dialogue, sought light from a southern passenger who promptly translated the first question as, Where is he? and the second as, 
Where is who? A recent viewer with alarm argues that this conspiracy against the consonants is spreading and that English printed words no longer represent the actual sounds of the American language. Like the French, he says, we have a marked liaison, the borrowing of a letter from the preceding word. We invite one another to come here, come here. Who's that? Who is that? has as good a liaison as the French voix avez. This critic believes that American tends to abandon T for D, as in sad day, Saturday, and sit up, sit up, and to get rid of H, as in where Z, where is he. But here we invade the vulgar speech, which belongs to the next chapter. Among the vowels, the most salient difference between English and American pronunciation, of course, is marked off by the flat American A. This flat A, as we have seen, has been under attack at home for nearly a century. The New Englanders, very sensitive to English example, substitute a broad A that is even broader than the English, and an A of the same sort survives in the South in a few words. Example, master, tomato, and tassel. But everywhere else in the country, the flat A prevails. Fashion and the example of the stage oppose it, and it is under the ban of an active wing of schoolmasters, but it will not down. To the average American, indeed, the broad A is a banner of affectation, and he associates it unpleasantly with spats, Harvard, male tea drinking, wristwatches, and all the other objects of his social suspicion. He gets the flat sound, not only into such words as last, calf, dance, and pastor, but even into piano and drama. Drama is sometimes drama, west of Connecticut, but almost never drama or drama. Tomato, with the A of bat, may sometimes borrow the A of plate, but tomato is confined to New England and the South. Hurrah, in American, has also borrowed the A of plate. One hears hooray much oftener than hurrah. Even amen frequently shows that A though not when sung. Curiously enough, it is displaced in patent by the true flat A. The English rhyme the first syllable of the word with rate. In America, it always rhymes with rat. The broad A is not only almost extinct outside of New England, it begins to show signs of decay even there. At all events, it has gradually disappeared from many words, and is measurably less sonorous in those in which it survives than it used to be. A century ago, it appeared not only in dance, aunt, gloss, past, etc., but also in Daniel, imagine, rational, and travel. And in 1857, Oliver Wendell Holmes reported it in Matter, handsome, caterpillar, apple, and satisfaction. It has been displaced in virtually all of these, even in the most remote reaches of the back country, by the national flat A. Grandgent says that the broad A is now restricted in New England to the following situations. 1. When followed by S or NS, as in lost and dance. 2. When followed by R, preceding another consonant, as in cart. 3. When followed by LM, as in calm. 4. When followed by F, S, or TH, as in laugh, pass, and path. The U sound also shows certain differences between English and American usage. 
the English reduce the last syllable of figure to ger. The educated American preserves the U sound as in nature. The English make the first syllable of courteous rhyme with fort. The American standard rhymes it with hurt. The English give an oo sound to the U of brusque. In America, the word commonly rhymes with tusk. A U sound, as everyone knows, gets into the American pronunciation of clerk by analogy with insert. The English cling to a broad A sound by analogy with hearth. Even the latter, in the United States, is often pronounced to rhyme with dearth. The American, in general, is much less careful than the Englishman to preserve the shadowy Y sound before U in words of the Duke class. He retains it in few, but surely not in new, nor in duke, blue, stew, do, duty, and true, nor even in Tuesday. Purists often attack the simple oo sound. In 1912, for example, the Department of Education of New York City warned all the municipal high school teachers to combat it. But it is doubtful that one pupil in a hundred was thereby induced to insert the Y in induced. Finally, there is lieutenant. The Englishman pronounces the first syllable left. The American invariably makes it lute. White says that the prevailing American pronunciation is relatively recent. I never heard it, he reports, in my boyhood. He was born in New York in 1821. The I sound presents several curious differences. The English make it long in all words of the hostile class. In America, it is commonly short, even in puerile. The English also lengthen it in sliver. In America, the word usually rhymes with liver. The short I in England is almost universally substituted for the E in pretty, and this pronunciation is also inculcated in most American schools. But I often hear an unmistakable E sound in the United States, making the first syllable rhyme with bet. Contrarywise, most Americans put the short I into bin, making it rhyme with sin. In England, it shows a long E sound, as in seen. A recent poem by an English poet makes the word rhyme with submarine, queen, and unseen. The O sound in American tends to convert itself into an aw sound. Cog still retains a pure O, but one seldom hears it in log or dog. Henry James denounces this flatly drawling group in The Question of Our Speech and cites God, Dog, Soft, Loft, Gone, Lost, and Frost as horrible examples. But the English themselves are not guiltless of the same fault. Many of the accusations that James levels at American, in truth, are echoed by Robert Bridges in A Tract on the Present State of English Pronunciation. Both spend themselves upon opposing what, at bottom, are probably natural and inevitable movements. For example, the gradual decay of all the vowels to one of neutral color represented by the E of danger, the U of suggest, the second O of common, and the A of prevalent. This decay shows itself in many languages. In both English and High German, during their middle periods, all the terminal vowels degenerated to E, now sunk to the aforesaid neutral vowel in many German words, and expunged from English altogether. 
The same sound is encountered in languages so widely differing otherwise as Arabic, French, and Swedish. Its existence, says Sace, is a sign of age and decay. Meaning has become more important than outward form, and the educated intelligence no longer demands a clear pronunciation in order to understand what is said. All these differences between English and American pronunciation, separately considered, seem slight, but in the aggregate they are sufficient to place serious impediments between mutual comprehension. Let an Englishman and an American, not of New England, speak a quite ordinary sentence. My aunt can't answer for my dancing the Lancers even passably. And at once the gap separating the two pronunciations will be manifest. Here only the A is involved. Add a dozen everyday words, military, schedule, trait, hostile, bin, lieutenant, patent, nephew, secretary, advertisement, and so on, and the strangeness of one to the other is augmented. Every Englishman visiting the States for the first time, said an English dramatist some time ago, has a difficulty in making himself understood. He often has to repeat a remark or a request two or three times to make his meaning clear, especially on railroads, in hotels, and at bars. The American visiting England for the first time has the same trouble. Despite the fact that American actors imitate English pronunciation to the best of their skill, this visiting Englishman asserted that the average American audience is incapable of understanding a genuinely English company, at least when the speeches are rattled off in conversational style. When he presented one of his own plays with an English company, he said, many American acquaintances, after witnessing the performance, asked him to lend them the manuscript, that they might visit it again with some understanding of the dialogue. End of Chapter 5, Part 6 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 6, Part 1 of The American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 6, The Common Speech Part 1 Grammarians and their ways. So far, in the main, the language examined has been of a relatively pretentious and self-conscious variety. The speech, if not always of formal discourse, then at least of literate men. Most of the examples of its vocabulary and idiom, in fact, have been drawn from written documents or from written reports of more or less careful utterances. For example, the speeches of members of Congress and of other public men. The whole of Thornton's excellent material is of this character. In his dictionary, there is scarcely a locution that is not supported by printed examples. It must be obvious that such materials, however lavishly set forth, cannot exhibit the methods and tendencies of a living speech with anything approaching completeness, nor even with accuracy. What men put into writing, and what they say when they take sober thought, are very far from what they utter in everyday conversation. All of us, no matter how careful our speech habits, loosen the belt a bit, so to speak, when we speak familiarly to our fellows, and pay a good deal less heed to precedents and proprieties, perhaps, than we ought to. It was a sure instinct that made Ibsen put bad grammar into the mouth of Nora Helmar in A Doll's House. She is a general's daughter and the wife of a professor, but even professors' wives are not above occasional 
bogglings of the cases of pronouns and the conjugations of verbs. The professors themselves, in truth, must have the same habit, for sometimes they show plain signs of it in print. More than once, plowing through profound and interminable treatises of grammar and syntax in preparation for the present work, I have encountered the cheering spectacle of one grammarian exposing with contagious joy the grammatical lapses of some other grammarian, and nine times out of ten, a few pages further on, I have found the enchanted purist erring himself. The most funereal of the sciences is saved from utter horror by such displays of human malice and fallibility. Speech itself, indeed, would become almost impossible if the grammarians could follow their own rules unfailingly, and were always right. But here we are among the learned, and their sins, when detected and exposed, are at least punished by conscience. What are of more importance to those interested in language as a living thing are the offendings of the millions who are not conscious of any wrong. It is among these millions, ignorant of regulation and eager only to express their ideas clearly and forcefully, that language undergoes its great changes and constantly renews its vitality. These are the genuine makers of grammar, marching miles ahead of the formal grammarians. Like the Emperor Sigismund, each man among them may well say, ergo sum super grammaticam. It is competent for any individual to offer his contribution, his new word, his better idiom, his novel figure of speech, his short cut in grammar or syntax, and it is by the general vote of the whole body, not by the verdict of a small school, that the fate of the innovation is decided. As Brander Matthews says, there is not even representative government in the matter. The posse comitatus decides directly, and despite the sternest protest, finally. The ignorant the rebellious and the daring, come forward with their brilliant barbarisms. The learned and conservative bring up their objections. And when both sides have been heard, there is a show of hands, and by this the irrevocable decision of the community itself is rendered. Thus it was that the Romance languages were fashioned out of the wreck of Latin, the vast influence of the literate minority, to the contrary notwithstanding. Thus it was, too, that English lost its case inflections, and many of its old conjugations, and that our yes came to be substituted for the gay sea, or so be it of an earlier day, and that we got rid of whom, after man, in the man I saw, and that our stark pronoun of the first person was precipitated from the German Ich, and thus it is that, in our own day, the language faces forces in America which, not content with overhauling and greatly enriching its materials, now threaten to work changes in its very structure. Where these tendencies run strongest, of course, is on the plane of the vulgar spoken language. Among all classes, the everyday speech departs very far from orthodox English, and even very far from any recognizable spoken English, but among those lower classes which make up the great body of the people, it gets so far from orthodox English that it gives promise sooner or late, of throwing off its old bonds altogether, or at any rate, all save the loosest of them. Behind it is the gigantic impulse that I have described in earlier chapters, the impulse of an egoistic and iconoclastic people, 
facing a new order of life in highly self-conscious freedom, to break a relatively stable language long since emerged from its period of growth to their novel and multitudinous needs, and above all, to their experimental and impatient spirit. This impulse, it must be plain, would war fiercely upon any attempt at formal regulation, however prudent and elastic. It is often rebellious for the mere sake of rebellion. But what it comes into conflict with in America is nothing so politic, and hence nothing so likely to keep the brakes upon it. What it actually encounters here is a formalism that is artificial, illogical, and almost unintelligible. A formalism borrowed from English grammarians, and by them brought into English against all fact and reason from the Latin. In most of our grammars, perhaps in all of those issued earlier than the opening of the twentieth century, says Matthews, we find linguistic laws laid down which are in blank contradiction with the genius of the language. In brief, the American schoolboy, hauled before a pedagogue, to be instructed in the structure and organization of the tongue he speaks, is actually instructed in the structure and organization of a tongue that he never hears at all, and seldom reads, and that, in more than one of the characters thus set before him, does not even exist. The effects of this are twofold. On the one hand, he conceives an antipathy to a subject so lacking in intelligibility and utility. As one teacher puts it, pupils tire of it. Often they see nothing in it, because there is nothing in it. And on the other hand, the schoolboy goes entirely without sympathetic guidance in the living language that he actually speaks in and out of the classroom, and that he will probably speak all the rest of his life. All he hears in relation to it is a series of sneers and prohibitions, most of them grounded not upon principles deduced from its own nature, but upon its divergences from the theoretical language that he is so unsuccessfully taught. The net result is that all the instruction he receives passes for naught. It is not sufficient to make him a master of orthodox English, and it is not sufficient to rid him of the speech habits of his home and daily life. Thus he is thrown back upon these speech habits without any helpful restraint or guidance, and they make him a willing ally of the radical and often extravagant tendencies which show themselves in the vulgar tongue. In other words, the very effort to teach him an excessively tight and formal English promotes his use of a loose and rebellious English. And so the grammarians, with a traditional fatuity of their order, labor for the destruction of the grammar they defend and for the decay of all those refinements of speech that go with it. The folly of this system, of course, has not failed to attract the attention of the more intelligent teachers, nor have they failed to observe the causes of its failure. Much of the fruitlessness of the study of English grammar, says Wilcox, and many of the obstacles encountered in its study are due to the difficulties created by the grammarians. These difficulties arise chiefly from three sources. Excessive classification, multiplication of terms for a single conception, and the attempt to treat the English language as if it were highly inflected. So long ago as the 60s, Richard Grant White began an onslaught upon all such punditic stupidities, he saw clearly that the attempt to treat English as if it were highly inflected was making its intelligent study almost impossible, and proposed boldly that all English grammar books, 
be burned. Of late, his ideas have begun to gain a certain acceptance, and as the literature of denunciation has grown, the grammarians have been constrained to overhaul their texts. When I was a schoolboy during the penultimate decade of the last century, the chief American grammar was A Practical Grammar of the English Language by Thomas W. Harvey. This formidable work was almost purely synthetical. It began with a long series of definitions, wholly unintelligible to a child, and proceeded into a maddening maze of pedagogical distinctions puzzling even to an adult. The latter-day grammars, at least those for the elementary schools, are far more analytical and logical. For example, there is Longman's Briefer Grammar by George J. Smith, a text now in very wide use. This book starts off not with page after page of abstractions, but with a well-devised examination of the complete sentence, and the characters and relations of the parts of speech are very simply and clearly developed. But before the end, the author begins to succumb to precedent, and on page 114 I find paragraph after paragraph of such dull, fly-blown pedantry as this. Some intransitive verbs are used to link the subject and some adjective or noun. These verbs are called copulative verbs, and the adjective or noun is called the attribute. The attribute always describes or denotes the person or thing denoted by the subject. Verbals are words that are derived from verbs, and express action or being without asserting it. Infinitives and participles are verbals. And so on. Smith, in his preface, says that his book is intended not so much to cover the subject of grammar as to teach it, and calls attention to the fact, somewhat proudly, that he has omitted the rather hard subject of gerunds, all mention of conjunctive adverbs, and even the conjugation of verbs. Nevertheless, he immerses himself in the mythical objective case of nouns on page 108, and does not emerge until the end. Footnote. Even Sweet, though he bases his New English grammar upon the spoken language, and thus sets the purists at defiance, quickly succumbs to the labeling mania. Thus, his classifications of tenses include such fabulous monsters as these, continuous, recurrent, neutral, definite, indefinite, secondary, incomplete, inchoate, short, and long. End of footnote. The New Webster Cooley Course in English, another popular text, carries reform a step further. The subject of case is approached through the personal pronouns, where it retains its only surviving intelligibility, and the more lucid object form is used in place of objective case. Moreover, the pupil is plainly informed later on that a noun has in reality but two case forms, a possessive and a common case form. This is the best concession to the facts yet made by a textbook grammarian. But no one familiar with the habits of the pedagogical mind need be told that its interior pull is against even such mild and obvious reforms. Defenders of the old order are by no means silent. A fear seems to prevail that grammar, robbed of its imbecile classifications, may collapse entirely. Wilcox records how the Council of English Teachers of New Jersey, but a few years ago, spoke out boldly for the recognition of no less than five cases in English. Why five? asks Wilcox. Why not eight, or ten, or even thirteen? Undoubtedly, because there are five cases in Latin. Most of the current efforts at improvement, in fact, tend toward a mere revision and multiplication of classifications. The pedant is eternally convinced that pigeonholing and relabeling 
are contributions to knowledge. A curious proof in point is offered by a pamphlet entitled Reorganization of English in Secondary Schools, compiled by James Fleming Hosick and issued by the National Bureau of Education. The aim of this pamphlet is to rid the teaching of English, including grammar, of its accumulated formalism and ineffectiveness, to make it genuine instruction instead of a pedantic and meaningless routine. And how is this revolutionary aim set forth? By a meticulous and merciless splitting of hairs, a gigantic manufacture of classifications and subclassifications, a colossal display of professional bombast and flatulence. I could cite many other examples. Perhaps, after all, the disease is incurable. What such laborious stupidity shows at bottom is simply this, that the sort of man who is willing to devote his life to teaching grammar to children or to training school marms to do it is not often the sort of man who is intelligent enough to do it competently. In particular, he is not often intelligent enough to grapple with the fluent and ever amazing permutations of a living and rebellious speech. The only way he can grapple with it at all is by first reducing it to a fixed and formal organization, in brief, by first killing it and embalming it. The difference in the resultant proceedings is not unlike that between a gross dissection and a surgical operation. The difficulties of the former are quickly mastered by any student of normal sense, but even the most casual of laparotomies calls for a man of special skill and address. Thus, the elementary study of the national language, at least in America, is almost monopolized by dullards. Children are taught it by men and women who observe it inaccurately and expound it ignorantly. In most other fields, the pedagogue meets a certain corrective competition and criticism. The teacher of any branch of applied mathematics, for example, has practical engineers at his elbow, and they quickly expose and denounce his defects. The college teacher of chemistry, however limited his equipment, at least has the aid of textbooks written by actual chemists. But English, even in its most formal shapes, is chiefly taught by those who cannot write it decently and who get no aid from those who can. One wades through treatise after treatise on English style by pedagogues whose own style is atrocious. A Huxley or a Stevenson might have written one of high merit and utility. But Huxley and Stevenson had other fish to fry, and so the business was left to Professor Balderdash. Consider the standard texts on prosody, vast piles of meaningless words, hollow babble about spondees, iambics, trochees, and so on, idiotic borrowings from dead languages. Two poets, Poe and Lanier, blue blasts of fresh air through that fog, but they had no successors, and it has apparently closed in again. In the department of prose, it lies wholly unbroken. No first-rate writer of English prose has ever written a textbook upon the art of writing it. End chapter 6, part 1. Chapter 6, Part 2 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 6, The Common Speech. Part 2, Spoken American as it is. But here I wander afield. 
the art of prose has little to do with the stiff and pedantic english taught in grammar schools and a great deal less to do with the loose and lively english spoken by the average american in his daily traffic the thing of importance is that the two differ from each other even more than they differ from the english of a huxley or a stevenson the school marm directed by grammarians labors heroically but all her effort goes for naught the young american like the youngster of any other race inclines irresistibly toward the dialect that he hears at home and that dialect with its piquant neologisms its high disdain of precedent its complete lack of self-consciousness is almost the antithesis of the hard and stiff speech that is expounded out of books it derives its principles not from the subtle logic of learned and stupid men but from the rough and ready logic of every day it has a vocabulary of its own a syntax of its own even a grammar of its own its verbs are conjugated in a way that defies all the injunctions of the grammar books it has its contumacious rules of tense number and case it has boldly re-established the double negative once sound in english it admits double comparatives confusions in person clipped infinitives it lays hand on the vowels changing them to fit its obscure but powerful spirit it disdains all the finer distinctions between the parts of speech this highly virile and defiant dialect and not the fossilized english of the school marm and her books is the speech of the middle american of joseph jacob's composite picture the mill hand in a small city of indiana with his five years of common schooling behind him his diligent reading of newspapers and his proud membership in the order of foresters and the knights of the maccabees go into any part of the country north east south or west and you will find multitudes of his brothers car conductors in philadelphia immigrants of the second generation in the east side of new york iron workers in the pittsburgh region corner grocers in st louis holders of petty political jobs in atlanta and new orleans small farmers in kansas or kentucky house carpenters in ohio tinners and plumbers in chicago genuine americans all hot for the home team marchers in parades readers of the yellow newspapers fathers of families sheep on election day undistinguished norms of the homo americanus such typical americans after a fashion know english they can read it all save the hard words that is all save about ninety per cent of the words of greek and latin origin they can understand perhaps two-thirds of it as it comes from the lips of a political orator or clergyman they have a feeling that it is in some recondite sense superior to the common speech of their kind they recognize a fluent command of it as the salient mark of a smart and educated man one with the gift of gab but they themselves never speak it or try to speak it nor do they look with approbation on efforts in that direction by their fellows in no other way indeed is the failure of popular education made more vividly manifest despite a gigantic effort to enforce certain speech habits universally in operation from end to end of the country the masses of the people turn almost unanimously to very different speech habits nowhere advocated and seldom so much as even accurately observed the literary critic francis hackett somewhere speaks of the enormous gap between the literate and unliterate american he is apparently the first to call attention to it it is the national assumption that no such gap exists that all americans at least if they be white are so outfitted with sagacity in the public schools that they are competent to consider any public question intelligently and to follow its discussion with understanding but the truth is of course that the public school accomplishes no such magic the inferior man in america as elsewhere remains an inferior man despite the hard effort made to improve him and his thoughts seldom if ever rise above the most elemental concerns what lies above not only does not interest him it actually excites his derision and he has coined a unique word 
highbrow to express his view of it especially in speech is he suspicious of superior pretension the schoolboy of the lower orders would bring down ridicule upon himself and perhaps criticism still more devastating if he essayed to speak what his teachers conceived to be correct english or even correct american outside the schoolroom on the one hand his companions would laugh at him as a prig and on the other hand his parents would probably cane him as an impertinent critic of their own speech once he has made his farewell to the school marm all her diligence in this department goes for nothing the boys with whom he plays baseball speak a tongue that is not the one taught in school and so do the youths with whom he will begin learning a trade to-morrow and the girl he will marry later on and the saloon keepers star pitchers vaudeville comedians business sharpers and political mountebanks he will look up to and try to imitate all the rest of his life so far as i can discover there has been but one attempt by a competent authority to determine the special characters of this general tongue of the mobile vulgus that authority is dr w w charters now head of the school of education at the university of illinois in nineteen fourteen dr charters was dean of the faculty of education and professor of the theory of teaching in the university of missouri and one of the problems he was engaged upon was that of the teaching of grammar in the course of this study he encountered the theory that such instruction should be confined to the rules habitually violated that the one aim of teaching grammar was to correct the speech of the pupils and that it was useless to harass them with principles which they already instinctively observed apparently inclining to this somewhat dubious notion dr charters applied to the school board of kansas city for permission to undertake an examination of the language actually used by the children in the elementary schools of that city and this permission was granted the materials thereupon gathered were of two classes first the teachers of grades three to seven inclusive in all the kansas city public schools were instructed to turn over to dr charters all the written work of their pupils ordinarily done in the regular order of school work during a period of four weeks secondly the teachers of grades two to seven inclusive were instructed to make note of all oral errors in grammar made in the schoolroom and around the school building during the five school days of one week by children of any age and to dispatch these notes to dr charters also the result was an accumulation of material so huge that it was unworkable with the means at hand and so the investigator and his assistants reduced it of the oral reports two studies were made the first of those from grades three and seven and the second of those from grades six and seven of the written reports only those from grades six and seven of twelve typical schools were examined the ages thus covered ran from nine or ten to fourteen or fifteen and perhaps five-sixths of the material studied came from children above twelve its examination threw a brilliant light upon the speech actually employed by children near the end of their schooling in a typical american city and per corollary upon the speech employed by their parents and other older associates if anything the grammatical and syntactical habits revealed were a bit less loose than those of the authentic volkssprache for practically all of the written evidence was gathered under conditions which naturally caused the writers to try to write what they conceived to be correct english and even the oral evidence was conditioned by the admonitory presence of the teachers moreover it must be obvious that a child of the lower classes during the period of its actual study of grammar probably speaks better english than at any time before or afterward for it is only then that any positive pressure is exerted upon it to that end but even so the departures from standard usage that were unearthed were numerous and striking and their tendency to accumulate in definite groups showed plainly the working of general laws thus 
no less than fifty seven per cent of the oral errors reported by the teachers of grades three and seven involved the use of the verb and nearly half of these or twenty four per cent of the total involved a confusion of the past tense form and the perfect participle again double negatives constituted eleven per cent of the errors and the misuse of adjectives or of adjectival forms for adverbs ran to four per cent finally the difficulties of the objective case among the pronouns the last stronghold of that case in english were responsible for seven per cent thus demonstrating a clear tendency to get rid of it altogether now compare the errors of these children half of whom as i have just said were in grade three and hence wholly uninstructed in formal grammar with the errors made by children of the second oral group that is children of grades six and seven in both of which grammar is studied dr charter's tabulations show scarcely any difference in the character and relative rank of the errors discovered those in the use of the verb drop from fifty seven per cent of the total to fifty two per cent but the double negatives remain at seven per cent and the errors in the case of pronouns at eleven per cent in the written work of grades six and seven however certain changes appear no doubt because of the special pedagogical effort against the more salient oral errors the child pen in hand has in mind the cautions oftenest heard and so reveals something of that greater exactness which all of us show when we do any writing that must bear critical inspection thus the relative frequency of confusions between the past tense forms of verbs and the perfect participles drops from twenty four per cent to five per cent and errors based on double negatives drop to one per cent but this improvement in one direction merely serves to unearth new barbarisms in other directions concealed in the oral tables by the flood of errors now remedied it is among the verbs that they are still most numerous altogether the errors here amount to exactly fifty per cent of the total such locutions as i had went and he seen diminish relatively and absolutely but in all other situations the verb is treated with the lavish freedom that is so characteristic of the american common speech confusions of the past and present tenses jump from two per cent to nineteen per cent thus eloquently demonstrating the tenacity of the error and mistakes in the forms of nouns and pronouns increase from two per cent to sixteen a shining proof of a shakiness which follows the slightest effort to augment the vocabulary of every day the materials collected by dr charters and his associates are not of course presented in full but his numerous specimens must strike familiar chords in every ear that is alert to the sounds and ways of the sermo vulgus what he gathered in kansas city might have been gathered just as well in san francisco or new orleans or chicago or new york or in youngstown ohio or little rock arkansas or waterloo iowa in each of these places large and small a few localisms might have been noted oi substituted for er in new york you all in the south a few germanisms in pennsylvania and in the upper mississippi valley a few spanish locutions in the southwest certain peculiar vowel forms in new england but in the main the report would have been identical with the report he makes that vast uniformity which marks the people of the united states in political doctrine in social habit in general information in reaction to ideas and prejudices and enthusiasms in the various details of domestic custom and dress is nowhere more marked than in language the incessant neologisms of the national speech sweep the whole country almost instantly and the iconoclastic changes which its popular spoken form are undergoing show themselves from coast to coast he hurt himself cited by dr charters is surely anything but a missouri localism one hears it everywhere and so too one hears 
she invited him and i and it hurt terrible and i set there and this here man and no i never neither and he ain't here and where is he at and it seems like i remember and if i was you and us fellows and he give her hell and he taken and kissed her and he loaned me a dollar and the man was found two dollars and the bee stang him and i would a thought and can i have one and he got hisn and the boss left him off and the baby at the soap and them are the kind i like and he don't care and no one has their ticket and how is the folks and if you would have gotten in the car you would have rode down curiously enough this widely dispersed and highly savoury dialect already as i shall show come to a certain grammatical regularity has attracted the professional writers of the country almost as little as it has attracted the philologists there are foreshadowings of it in huckleberry finn in the biglow papers and even in the rough humour of the period that began with j c neal and company and ended with artemus ward and josh billings but in those early days it had not yet come to full flower it wanted the influence of the later immigrations to take on its present character the enormous dialect literature of twenty years ago left it almost untouched localisms were explored diligently but the general dialect went virtually unobserved it is not in chimmy fadden it is not in david harem it is not even in the pre-fable stories of george ade perhaps the most acute observer of average undistinguished american types urban and rustic that american literature has yet produced the business of reducing it to print had to wait for ring w lardner a chicago newspaper reporter in his grotesque tales of baseball players so immediately and so deservedly successful and now so widely imitated lardner reports the common speech not only with humor but also with the utmost accuracy the observations of charters and his associates are here reinforced by the sharp ear of one specially competent and the result is a mine of authentic american in a single story by lardner in truth it is usually possible to discover examples of almost every logical and grammatical peculiarity of the emerging language and he always resists very stoutly the temptation to overdo the thing here for example are a few typical sentences from the busher's honeymoon i and flory was married the day before yesterday just like i told you we was going to be you was wise to get married in bedford where not nothing is nearly half so dear the sum of what i have wrote down is twenty nine dollars and forty cents alan told me i should ought to give the priest five dollars i never seen him before i didn't used to eat no lunch in the playing season except when i knowed i was not going to work i guess the meals has cost me altogether about a dollar and fifty cents and i have eat very little myself i was willing to tell her all about them two poor girls they must not be no mistake about who is the boss in my house some men lets their wife run all over them alan has went to a college football game one of the reporters give him a pass he called up and said he hadn't only the one pass but he was not hurting my feelings none the flat across the hall from this here one is for rent if we should have bought in furniture it would cost us in the neighborhood of a hundred dollars even without no piano i consider myself lucky to have found out about this before it was too late and somebody else had have gotten the tip it will always be ourn even when we move away maybe you could have did better if you had have went at it in a different way both her and you is welcome at my house i never seen so much wine drank in my life here are specimens to fit into most of charter's categories verbs confused as to tense pronouns confused as to case double and even triple negatives nouns and verbs disagreeing in number 
have softened to of n marking the possessive instead of s like used in place of as and the personal pronoun substituted for the demonstrative adjective a study of the whole story would probably unearth all the remaining errors noted in kansas city lardner's baseball player though he has pen in hand and is on his guard and is thus very careful to write would not instead of wouldn't and even am not instead of ain't offers a comprehensive and highly instructive panorama of popular speech habits to him the forms of the subjunctive mood have no existence and will and shall are identical and adjectives and adverbs are indistinguishable and the objective case is merely a variorum form of the nominative his past tense is more often than not the orthodox present tense all fine distinctions are obliterated in his speech he uses invariably the word that is simplest the grammatical form that is handiest and so he moves toward the philological millennium dreamed of by george t lanigan when the singular verb shall lie down with the plural noun and a little conjugation shall lead them End of chapter 6, part 2. Chapter 6, part 3 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 6, The Common Speech. Part 3, The Verb. A study of the materials amassed by Charters and Lardner, if it be reinforced by observation of what is heard on the streets every day, will show that the chief grammatical peculiarities of spoken American lie among the verbs and pronouns. The nouns in common use, in the overwhelming main, are quite sound in form. Very often, of course, they do not belong to the vocabulary of English, but they at least belong to the vocabulary of American. The proletariat, setting aside transient slang, calls things by their proper names and pronounces those names more or less correctly. The adjectives, too, are treated rather politely, and the adverbs, though commonly transformed into adjectives, are not further mutilated. But the verbs and pronouns undergo changes which set off the common speech very sharply from both correct English and correct American. Their grammatical relationships are thoroughly overhauled and sometimes they are radically modified in form. This process is natural and inevitable, for it is among the verbs and pronouns, as we have seen, that the only remaining grammatical inflections in English, at least of any force or consequence, are to be found, and so they must bear the chief pressure of the influences that have been warring upon all inflections since the earliest days. The primitive Indo-European language, it is probable, had eight cases of the noun. The oldest known Teutonic dialect reduced them to six. In Anglo-Saxon they fell to four, with a weak and moribund instrumental hanging in the air. In Middle English the date of an accusative began to decay. In Modern English they have disappeared altogether, save as ghosts to haunt grammarians. But we still have two plainly defined conjugations of the verb, and we still inflect it for number, and in part at least for person. And we yet retain an objective case of the pronoun, and inflect it for person, number, and gender. Some of the more familiar conjugations of verbs in the American common speech, as recorded by Charters or Lardner, or derived from my own collectinea, are here set down. Present, am, preterite, was, perfect participle, been or ben. Footnote. Ben is the correct American pronunciation. Been, as we have seen, is the English. But I have often found ben rhyming with pen in such phrases as I been there. In footnote. Present. Attack. Preterite. Attacted. Perfect participle. Attacted. Present. Be. Preterite. Was. Perfect participle. Been or ben. Footnote. Ben is the correct American pronunciation. Been, as we have seen, is the English. But I have often found ben, rhyming with pen, in such phrases as I been there, in footnote. Present, beat, preterite, beaten, perfect participle, 
beat present become footnote get is used in the place of it as in i am getting old and he got sick in footnote preterite become perfect participle became present begin preterite begun perfect participle began present bend preterite bent perfect participle bent present bet preterite bet perfect participle bet present bind preterite bound perfect participle bound present bite preterite bitten perfect participle bit present bleed preterite bled perfect participle bled present blow preterite blowed or blew perfect participle blowed or blue present break preterite broken perfect participle broke present bring preterite brought or brung or brang perfect participle brung present broke passive preterite broke perfect participle broke present build preterite built perfect participle built present burn preterite burnt footnote burned with a distinct duh sound is almost unknown in american perfect participle burnt present burst footnote not used in footnote present bust preterite busted perfect participle busted present buy preterite bought or boughten perfect participle bought or boughten present can preterite could perfect participle coulda present catch preterite caught footnote cotched is heard only in the south and mainly among the negroes catch of course is always pronounced catch end footnote perfect participle caught present choose preterite chose perfect participle choose present climb preterite clum perfect participle clum present cling to hold fast preterite clung perfect participle clung present cling to ring preterite clang perfect participle clang present come preterite come perfect participle came present creep preterite crep or crope perfect participle crep present crow preterite crew perfect participle crew present cut preterite cut perfect participle cut present dare preterite dared perfect participle dared present deal preterite dole perfect participle dealt present dig preterite dug perfect participle dug present dive preterite dove perfect participle dived present do preterite done perfect participle done or did present drag preterite drug perfect participle dragged present draw preterite drawed footnote but i drew three jacks in poker end footnote perfect participle drawed or drew present dream preterite dreamt perfect participle dreamt present drank preterite drank or drunk perfect participle drank present drive preterite drove perfect participle drove present drown preterite drowned perfect participle drowned present eat preterite et or eat perfect participle eight present fall preterite fell or fallen perfect participle fell present feed preterite fed perfect participle fed present feel preterite felt perfect participle felt present 
fetch preterite fetched footnote fotch is also heard but it is not general in footnote perfect participle fetch present fight preterite fought footnote fit and fitten unless my observation errs are heard only in dialect fit is archaic english end footnote perfect participle fault present find preterite found perfect participle found present fine preterite found perfect participle found present fling preterite flying perfect participle flung present flow preterite flew perfect participle flowed present fly preterite flew perfect participle flew present forget preterite forgotten perfect participle forgotten present forsake preterite forsaken perfect participle forsook present freeze preterite frozen or friz perfect participle frozen present get preterite got or gotten perfect participle gotten present give preterite give perfect participle give present glide preterite glowed footnote glowed once enjoyed a certain respectability in america it occurs in the knickerbocker magazine for april eighteen fifty six in footnote perfect participle glowed present go preterite went perfect participle went present grow preterite growed perfect participle growed present hang preterite hung footnote hanged is never heard in footnote perfect participle hung present have preterite had perfect participle had or hadn present hear preterite heard perfect participle heard or hearn present heat preterite het footnote het is incomplete without the addition of up he was head up is always heard not he was het end footnote perfect participle het present heave preterite hove perfect participle hove present hide preterite hidden perfect participle hid present heist preterite heisted perfect participle heisted present hit preterite hit perfect participle hit present hold preterite held perfect participle held or held present holler preterite hollered perfect participle hollered present hurt preterite hurt perfect participle hurt present keep preterite kept perfect participle kept present kneel preterite knelt perfect participle knelt present no preterite knowed perfect participle knew present lay preterite laid or lain perfect participle laid present lead preterite led perfect participle led present lean preterite lent perfect participle lent present leap preterite lep perfect participle lep present learn preterite learnt perfect participle learnt present lend preterite loaned perfect participle loaned present lie to falsify preterite lied perfect participle lied present lie to recline preterite laid or lain perfect participle laid present light preterite lit perfect participle lit present lose preterite lost perfect participle lost present make preterite made perfect participle made present may preterite none perfect participle mida present mean preterite meant perfect participle meant present meet preterite met perfect participle met present mo 
Preterite, moan, perfect participle, mode. Present, pay, preterite, paid, perfect participle, paid. Present, plead, preterite, pled, perfect participle, pled. Present, prove, preterite, proved or proven, perfect participle, proven. Present, put, preterite, put, perfect participle, put. Present, quit, preterite, quit, perfect participle, quit. Present, raise, preterite, raised, perfect participle, raised. Present, read, preterite, read, perfect participle, read. Present, wrench, footnote, always used in place of rinse, end footnote. Preterite, wrenched, perfect participle, wrenched. Present, rid, preterite, rid, perfect participle, rid. Present, ride, preterite, ridden, perfect participle, rode. Present, rile, footnote, always used in place of royal, end footnote. Preterite, riled, perfect participle, riled. Present, ring, preterite, rung, perfect participle, rang. Present, rise, preterite, riz or rose, perfect participle, riz. Present, run, preterite, run, perfect participle, ran. Present, say, preterite, says, perfect participle, said. Present, see, preterite, seen, perfect participle, saw. Present, sell, preterite, sold, perfect participle, sold. Present, send, preterite, sent, perfect participle, sent. Present, set, preterite, set, footnote. Sought is heard as a localism only, end footnote. Perfect participle, sat. Present, shake, preterite, shaken or shuck, perfect participle, shook. Present, shave, preterite, shaved, perfect participle, shaved. Present, shed, preterite, shed, perfect participle, shed. Present, shine, to polish, preterite, shined, perfect participle, shined. Present, shoe, preterite, shoed, perfect participle, shoed. Present, shoot, preterite, shot, perfect participle, shot. Present, show, preterite, shown, perfect participle, showed. Present, sing, preterite, sung, perfect participle, sang. Present, sink, preterite, sunk, perfect participle, sank. Present, sit, footnote, see set, which is used almost invariably in place of sit, end footnote. Present, skin, preterite, scun, perfect participle, scun. Present, sleep, preterite, slept, perfect participle, slept. Present, slide, preterite, slid, perfect participle, slid. Present, sling, preterite, slang, perfect participle, slung. Present, slit, preterite, slitted, perfect participle, slitted. Present, smell, preterite, smelt, perfect participle, smelt. Present, sneak, preterite, snuck, perfect participle, snuck. Present, speed, preterite, speeded, perfect participle, speeded. Present, spell, preterite, spelt, perfect participle, spelt. Present, spill, preterite, spilt, perfect participle, spilt. Present, spin, preterite, span, perfect participle, span. Present, spit, preterite, spit, perfect participle, spit. Present, spoil, preterite, spoilt, perfect participle, spoilt. Present, spring, preterite, sprung, perfect participle, sprang. Present, steal, preterite, stole, perfect participle, stole. Present, sting, preterite, stang, perfect participle, stang. Present, stink, preterite, stank, perfect participle, stank. Present, 
strike preterite struck perfect participle struck present swear preterite swore perfect participle swore present sweep preterite swept perfect participle swept present swell preterite swole perfect participle swollen present swim preterite swum perfect participle swam present swing preterite swang perfect participle swung present take preterite taken perfect participle took present teach preterite taught perfect participle taught present tear preterite tore perfect participle torn present tell preterite toll perfect participle toll present think preterite thought footnote thunk is never used seriously it always shows humorous intent in footnote perfect participle thought present thrive preterite throve perfect participle throve present throw preterite throwed perfect participle through present tread preterite tread perfect participle tread present wake preterite woke perfect participle woken present wear preterite war perfect participle war present weep preterite wept perfect participle wept present wet preterite wet perfect participle wet present win preterite one or wan perfect participle one or wan present wind preterite wound perfect participle wound present wish wished preterite wished perfect participle wished present ring preterite rung perfect participle rang present write preterite written perfect participle wrote a glance at these conjugations is sufficient to show several general tendencies some of them going back in their essence to the earliest days of the english language the most obvious is that leading to the transfer of verbs from the so-called strong conjugation to the weak a change already in operation before the norman conquest and very marked during the middle english period chaucer used growed for grew in the prologue to the wife of bath's tale and rised for rose and smited for smote are in john purvey's edition of the bible circa thirteen eighty five many of these transformations were afterward abandoned but a large number survived for example climbed for clom as the preterite of to climb and melted for molt as the preterite of to melt others showed themselves during the early part of the modern english period cummed as the perfect participle of to come and digged as the preterite of to dig are both in shakespeare and the latter is also in milton and in the authorized version of the bible this tendency went furthest of course in the vulgar speech and it has been embalmed in the english dialects i seen and i knowed for example are common to many of them but during the seventeenth century it seems to have been arrested and even to have given way to a contrary tendency that is toward strong conjugations the english of ireland which preserves many seventeenth century forms shows this plainly ped for paid gother for gathered and ruse for raised are still in use there and joyce says flatly that the irish retained the old english custom i e the custom of the period of Cromwell's invasion, circa 1650, have a leaning toward the strong inflection. Certain verb forms of the American colonial period, now reduced to the estate of localisms, are also probably survivors of the 17th century. The three great causes of change in language, says Sace, may be briefly described as 1. Imitation or analogy, 2. A wish to be clear and emphatic, and 3. Laziness indeed if we choose to go deep enough we might reduce all three causes to the general one of laziness since it is easier to imitate than to say something new this tendency to take well-worn paths paradoxically enough is responsible both for the transfer of verbs from the strong to the weak declension 
and for the transfer of certain others from the weak to the strong. A verb in everyday use tends almost inevitably to pull less familiar verbs with it, whether it be strong or weak. Thus, fed is the preterite of to feed, and led is the preterite of to lead, paved the way for pled as the preterite of to plead, and rode as plainly performed the same office for glowed, and rung for brung, and drove for dove, and hove, and stole for dole, and won for scun. Moreover, a familiar verb itself, acquiring a faulty inflection, may fasten a similar inflection upon another verb of like sound. Thus, het, as the preterite of to heat, no doubt owes its existence to the example of et, the vulgar preterite of to eat. So far the irregular verbs. The same combination of laziness and imitativeness works toward the regularization of certain verbs that are historically irregular. In addition, of course, there is the fact that regularization is itself intrinsically simplification, that it makes the language easier. One sees the antagonistic pull of the two influences in the case of verbs ending in O-W. The analogy of new suggests snoo as the preterite of to snow, and it is sometimes encountered in the American Vulgate. But the analogy of snowed also suggests knowed, and the superior regularity of the form is enough to overcome the greater influence of new as a more familiar word than snowed. Thus, snoo grows rare and is in decay, but knowed shows vigor, and so do growed and throwed. The substitution of heard for heard also presents a case of logic and convenience supporting analogy. The form is suggested by steered, feared, and cheered. But its main advantage lies in the fact that it gets rid of a vowel change, always an impediment to easy speech. Here is in the contrary direction one barbarism breeds another. Thus, taken as the preterite of to take has undoubtedly helped to make preterites of two other perfects, shaken and forsaken. But in the presence of two exactly contrary tendencies, the one in accordance with the general movement of the language since the Norman conquest, and the other opposed to it, it is unsafe, of course, to attempt any very positive generalizations. All one may exhibit with safety is a general habit of treating the verb conveniently. Now and then, disregarding grammatical tendencies, it is possible to discern what appear to be logical causes for verb phenomena. That lit is preferred to lighted, and hung to hanged, is probably the result of an aversion to fine distinctions, and perhaps more fundamentally to the passive. Again, the use of found as the preterite of to fine is obviously due to an ignorant confusion of fine and find due to the wearing off of da in find, and that of lit as the preterite of to alight, to a confusion of alight and light. Yet again the use of tread as its own preterite in place of trod is probably the consequence of a vague feeling that a verb ending with d is already of preterite form. Shed exhibits the same process. Both are given a logical standing by such preterites as bled, fed, fled, led, read, dead, and spread. But here, once more, it is hazardous to lay down laws, for shredded, headed, dreaded, threaded, and breaded at once come to mind. In other cases, it is still more difficult to account for preterites in common use. Drug is wholly illogical, and so are clum and frizz. Neither, fortunately, has yet supplanted the more intelligible form of its verb, and so it is not necessary to speculate about them. As for crew, it is archaic English surviving in American, and it was formed perhaps by analogy with new, which has succumbed in America to node. Some of the verbs of the Vulgate show the end products of language movements that go back to the Anglo-Saxon period and even beyond. There is, for example, a disappearance of the final T in such words as crep, slep, lep, swep, and wep. Most of these in Anglo-Saxon were strong verbs, 
The preterite of to sleep, slapen, for example, was slep, and that of to weep was weop. But in the course of time, both to sleep and to weep acquired weak preterite endings, the first becoming slept and the second wept. This weak conjugation was itself degenerated. Originally, the inflectional suffix had been de or ede, and in some cases ode, and the vowels were always pronounced. The wearing down process that set in in the 12th century disposed of the final e, but in certain words the other vowels survived for a good while, and we still observe it in such archaisms as beloved. Finally, however, it became silent in other preterites, and loved, for example, began to be pronounced, and often written, as a word of one syllable. Loved. Footnote. The last stand of the distinct ed was made in Addison's day. He was in favor of retaining it, and in the Spectator for August 4, 1711, he protested against obliterating the syllable in the termination of our praetor perfect tense, as in the words drowned, walked, arrived, for drowned, walked, arrived, which has very much disfigured the tongue and turned a tenth part of our smoothest words into so many clusters of consonants. In footnote, this final D sound now fell upon difficulties of its own. After certain consonants it was hard to pronounce clearly, and so the sonant was changed into the easier surd, and such words as pushed and cliped became in ordinary conversation pushed and clipped. In other verbs the T sound had come in long before with a degenerated weak ending, and when the final E was dropped their stem vowels tended to change. Thus arose such forms as slept. In vulgar American another step is taken and the suffix is dropped altogether. Thus by a circuitous route Verbs originally strong and for many centuries hovering between the two conjugations have eventually become strong again. The case of Helt is probably an example of change by false analogy. During the 13th century, according to Sweet, D was changed to T in the weak preterites of verbs ending in RD, LD, and ND. Before that time, the preterite of send, send, had been send. Now it became sent. It survives in our modern sent, and the same process is also revealed in built, girt, lent, rent, and bent. The popular speech disregarding the fact that to hold is a strong verb arrives at helt by imitation. In the case of toll, which I almost always hear in place of told, there is a leaping of steps. The D is got rid of without any transitional use of T. So also perhaps in swole, which is fast displacing, swelled. Attacked and drowned seem to be examples of an effort to dispose of harsh combinations by a contrary process. Both are very old in English. Boughten and dreamt present greater difficulties. Lounsbury says that Boughten probably originated in the northern, i.e. lowland Scotch, dialect of English, which inclined to retain the full form of the past participle, and even to add its termination to words to which it did not properly belong. I record dreamt without attempting to account for it. I have repeatedly heard a distinct P sound in the word. The general tendency toward regularization is well exhibited by the new verbs that come into the language constantly. Practically all of them show the weak conjugation. For example, to phone, to bluff, to rubberneck, to ante, to bunt, to wireless, to insurge, and to loop the loop. Even when a compound has, as its last member, a verb ordinarily strong, it remains weak itself. Thus the preterite of to joy ride is not joy road, or even joy ridden, but joy rided. And thus bust from burst is regular, and its preterite is busted though burst is irregular and its preterite is the verb itself unchanged. The same tendency toward regularity is shown by the verbs of the Neal class. They are strong in English but tend to become weak in colloquial American. Thus the preterite of to kneel, 
despite the example of to sleep and its analogues, is not kneel, nor even knelt, but kneeled. I have even heard field as the preterite of to feel, as in I field my way, though here felt still persists. To spread also tends to become weak, as in he spreaded a piece of bread, and to peep remains so despite the example of to leap. The confusion between the inflections of to lie and those of to lay extends to the higher reaches of spoken American, and so does that between lend and loan. The proper inflections of to lend are often given to to loan, and so leaned becomes lent, as in I lent on the counter. In the same way to set has almost completely superseded to sit, and the preterite of the former, set, is used in place of sat, but the perfect participle, which is also the disused preterite of to sit, has survived, as in I have sat there. To speed and to shoe have become regular not only because of the general tendency toward the weak conjugation, but also for logical reasons. The prevalence of speed contests of various sorts, always to the intense interest of the proletariat, has brought such words as speeder, speeding, speed mania, speed maniac, and speed limit into daily use, and speeded harmonizes with them better than the stronger sped. As for shoed, it merely reveals the virtual disappearance of the verb in its passive form. An American would never say that his wife was well shod. He would say that she wore good shoes. To shoe suggests to him only the shoeing of animals, and so, by way of shoeing and horseshoer, he comes to shoed. His misuse of to learn for to teach is common to most of the English dialects. More peculiar in his speech is the use of to leave for to let. Charters records it in Washington, left them have it, and there are many examples of it in Lardner. Spit in American has become invariable. The old preterite spat has completely disappeared. But slit, which is now invariable in English, though it was strong in Old English and had both strong and weak preterites in Middle English, has become regular in American, as in she slitted her skirt. In studying the American verb, of course, it is necessary to remember always that it is in a state of transition, and that in many cases the manner of using it is not yet fixed. The history of language, says Lounsbury, when looked at from the purely grammatical point of view, is little else than the history of corruptions. What we have before us is a series of corruptions in active process, and while some of them have gone very far, others are just beginning. Thus it is not uncommon to find corrupt forms side by side with orthodox forms, or even two corrupt forms battling with each other. Lardner, in the case of to throw, hears if he had throwed. My own observation is that through is more often used in that situation. Again he uses the rottenest I ever seen gave. My own belief is that give is far more commonly used. The conjugation of to give, however, is yet very uncertain, and so Lardner may report accurately. I have heard I given, and I would have gave, but I give seems to be prevailing, and I would have give with it, thus reducing to give to one invariable form like those of to cut, to hit, to put, to cost, to hurt, and to spit. My table of verbs shows various other uncertainties and confusions. The preterite of to hear is heard. The perfect may be either heard or hearn. That of to do may be either done or did, with the latter apparently prevailing. That of to draw is drew if the verb indicates to attract or to abstract, and drawed if it indicates to draw with a pencil. Similarly, the preterite of to blow may be either blowed or blue, and that of to drink oscillates between drank and drunk, and that of to fall is still usually fell, though fallen has appeared, and that of to shake may be either shaken or shuck. The conjugation of to win is yet far from fixed. The correct English preterite one is still in use, but against it are arrayed wan and wind. Juan seems to show some kinship by ignorant analogy with ran and began. It is often used as the perfect participle, as in, I have wan four dollars. 
The misuse of the perfect participle for the preterite, now almost the invariable rule in vulgar American, is common to many other dialects of English, and seems to be a symptom of a general decay of the perfect tenses. That decay has been going on for a long time, and in American, the most vigorous and advanced of all the dialects of language, it is particularly well marked. Even in the most pretentious written American, it shows itself. The English, in their writing, still use the future perfect, albeit somewhat laboriously and self-consciously. But in America, it has virtually disappeared. One often reads whole books without encountering a single example of it. Even the present perfect and the past perfect seem to be instinctively avoided. The Englishman says, I have dined. But the American says, I am through dinner. The Englishman says, I had slept. But the American often says, I was done sleeping. Thus the perfect tenses are forsaken for the simple present and the past. In the Vulgate a further step is taken, and I have been there, becomes, I've been there. Even in such phrases as he hasn't been here, ain't, am not, is commonly substituted for have not, thus giving the present perfect a flavor of the simple present. The step from I have taken to, I taken, was therefore neither difficult nor unnatural, and once it had been made, the resulting locution was supported by the greater apparent regularity of its verb. Moreover, this perfect participle, thus put in place of the preterite, was further reinforced by the fact that it was the adjectival form of the verb, and hence collaterally familiar. Finally, it was also the authentic preterite in the passive voice, and although this influence in view of the decay of the passive may not have been of much consequence, Nevertheless, it is not to be dismissed as of no consequence at all. The contrary substitution of the preterite for the perfect participle, as in I have went and he has did, apparently has a double influence behind it. In the first place, there is the effect of the confused and blundering effort by an ignorant and unanalytical speaker to give the perfect some grammatical differentiation when he finds himself getting into it an excursion not infrequently made necessary by logical exigencies, despite his inclination to keep out. The nearest indicator at hand is the disused preterite, and so it is put to use. Sometimes a sense of its uncouthness seems to linger, and there is a tendency to give it an en suffix, thus bringing it into greater harmony with its tense. I find that Boughton, just discussed, is used much oftener in the preterite than in the simple past tense footnote, and still more often as an adjective, as in it was a bought in dress, in footnote, for the latter bought usually suffices. The quick ear of Lardner detects various other coinages of the same sort, among them tooken, as in little owl might have tooken sick. Hadden is also met with, as in I would have hadden. But the majority of preterites remain unchanged. Lardner's baseball player never writes, I have written, or I have written, but always, I have wrote. And in the same way he always writes, I have did, ate, went, drank, rode, ran, saw, sang, woke, and stole. Sometimes the simple form of the verb persists through all tenses. This is usually the case, for example, with to give. I have noted, I give, both as present and as preterite and I have give, and even I had give. But even here I have gave offers rivalry to I have give, and usage is not settled. So too with to come. I have come and I have came seem to be almost equally favored, with the former supported by pedagogical admonition, and the latter by the spirit of the language. Whatever the true cause of the substitution of the preterite for the perfect participle, it seems to be a tendency inherent in English, and during the age of Elizabeth it showed itself even in the most formal speech. An examination of any play of Shakespeare's will show many such forms, as I have wrote, I am mistook, and he has rode. In several cases this transfer of the preterite has survived. I have stood, for example, is now perfectly correct English, but before 1550 the form was I have stoned to hold and to sit belong to the same class. Their original perfect participles were not held and sat, but holden and sitten. 
These survive the movement toward the formalization of the language which began with the 18th century. But scores of other such misplaced preterites were driven out. One of the last to go was rote, which persisted until near the end of the century. Paradoxically enough, the very purists who performed the purging showed a preference for got, though not for forgot, and it survives in correct English today in the preterite present form as in I have got, whereas in American, both vulgar and polite, the elder and more regular gotten is often used. In the polite speech, gotten indicates a distinction between a completed action and a continuing action between obtaining and possessing. I have gotten what I came for is correct, and so is I have got the measles. In the vulgar speech much the same distinction exists, but the perfect becomes a sort of simple tense by the elision of have. Thus the two sentences change to I gotten what I come for, and I got the measles, the latter being understood not as past, but as present. In I have got the measles, got is historically a sort of auxiliary of have, and in colloquial American, as we have seen in the examples just given, the auxiliary has obliterated the verb. To have as an auxiliary, probably because of its intimate relationship with the perfect tenses, is under heavy pressure, and promises to disappear from the situations in which it is still used. I have heard was used in place of it, as in before the Elks was come here, Footnote, remark of a policeman talking to another, what he actually said was, before the Elks was, come here. Come and here were one word, approximately. Come here. The context showed that he meant to use the past perfect tense, in footnote. Sometimes it is confused ignorantly with a distinct of, as in she would have drove, and I would have gave. More often it is shaded to a sort of particle attached to the verb as an inflection as in, he would have told you, and who could have took it. But this is not all. Having degenerated to such forms, it is now employed as a sort of auxiliary to itself in the subjunctive, as in, if you had of went, if it had of been hard, and if I had of had. I have encountered some rather astonishing examples of this doubling of the auxiliary. One appears in, I wouldn't had a went. Here, however, the a uh, may belong partly to had and partly to went. Such forms as a-going are very common in American. But in the other cases, and in such forms as I had a-wanted, it clearly belongs to had. Sometimes, for syntactical reasons, the degenerated form of have is put before had instead of after it, as in I could have had her if I had have wanted to. Meanwhile, to have, ceasing to be an auxiliary, becomes a general verb indicating compulsion. Here it promises to displace must. The American seldom says, I must go. He almost invariably says, I have to go, or I have got to go, in which last case, as we have seen, got is the auxiliary. The most common inflections of the verb for mode and voice are shown in the following paradigm of to bite. Active voice. Indicative mode. Present. I bite. Past perfect. I had of bit. Present perfect. I have bit. Future. I will bite. Past. I bitten. Future perfect. Wanting. Subjunctive mode. Present. If I bite. Past perfect. If I had of bit. Past. If I bitten. Potential mode. Present. I can bite. Past. I could bite. Present perfect. Wanting. Past perfect. I could have bit. Imperative or optative mode. Future. I shall or will bite. Infinitive mode. Wanting. Passive voice. Indicative mode. Present. I am bit. Past perfect. I had been bit. Present perfect. I been bit. Future, I will be bit. Past, I was bit. Future perfect, wanting. Subjunctive mode. Present, if I am bit. Past perfect, if I had have been bit. Past, if I was bit. Potential mode, present. I can be bit. Past, I could be bit.
Present perfect. Wanting? Past perfect. I could have been bit. Imperative mode. Wanting? Infinitive mode. Wanting? A study of this paradigm reveals several plain tendencies. One has just been discussed, the addition of a degenerative form of have to the preterite of the auxiliary, and its use in place of the auxiliary itself. Another is the use of will instead of shall in the first person future. Shall is confined to a sort of optative, indicating much more than mere intention, and even here it is yielding to will. Yet another is the consistent use of the transferred preterite in the passive. Here the rule in correct English is followed faithfully, though the perfect participle employed is not the English participle. I am broke is a good example. Finally, there is the substitution of was for were, and of am for be in the past and present of the subjunctive. In this last case, American is in accord with the general movement of English, though somewhat more advanced. Be, in the Shakespearean form of where be thy brothers, was expelled from the present indicative two hundred years ago and survives today only in dialect. And as it thus yielded to are in the indicative, it now seems destined to yield to am and is in the subjunctive. It remains, of course, in the future indicative, I will be. In American, its conjugation coalesces with that of am in the following manner. Present, I am. Past perfect, I had have been. Present perfect, I been or been. Future, I will be. Past, I was. Future perfect, wanting. And in the subjunction, present, if I am, past perfect, if I had have been, past, if I was. All signs of the subjunctive indeed seem to be disappearing from vulgar American. One never hears if I were you, but always if I was you. In the third person, the S is not dropped from the verb. One hears not if she go, but if she goes. If he be, the man, is never heard. It is always if he is. This war upon the forms of the subjunctive, of course, extends to the most formal English. In Old English, says Bradley, the subjunctive played as important a part as in modern German, and was used in much the same way. Its inflection differed in several respects from that of the indicative. But the only formal trace of the old subjunctive still remaining, except the use of be and were, is the omission of the final s in the third person singular and even this is rapidly dropping out of use. Perhaps in another generation the subjunctive forms will have ceased to exist except in the single instance of were, which serves a useful function, although we manage to dispense with a corresponding form in other verbs. Here is elsewhere, unlettered American usage simply proceeds in advance of the general movement. B and the omitted S are already dispensed with, and even were has been discarded. In the same way, the distinction between will and shall, preserved in correct English but already breaking down in the most correct American, has been lost entirely in the American common speech. Will has displaced shall completely save in the imperative. This preference extends to the inflections of both. Shan't is very seldom heard. Almost always won't is used instead. As for should, it is displaced by ought to, degenerated to otter or oughta, and in its negative form by hadn't oughta, as in he hadn't oughter, said that, reported by charters. Lardner gives various redundant combinations of should and ought, as in I don't feel as if I should ought to leave, and they should not ought to have had, but I don't think it is as common as the simple oughta forms. In the main, should is avoided, sometimes at considerable pains. Often its place is taken by the more positive don't. Thus, I don't mind is used instead of I shouldn't mind. Don't has also completely displaced doesn't, which is very seldom heard. He don't and they don't are practically universal. In the same way ain't has displaced is not, am not, isn't, and aren't, and even have not and haven't. One recalls a famous speech in a naval melodrama of twenty years ago. We ain't got no manners, but we can fight like hell. Such forms as he ain't here, I ain't the man, them ain't what I want, and I ain't heard of it, are common. 
The extensive use of ain't, of course, is merely a single symptom of a general disregard of number, obvious throughout the verbs and also among the pronouns, as we shall see. Charters gives many examples. Among them, how is Uncle Wallace and Aunt Clara? You was, there is six, and the incomparable in ain't right to say. He ain't here today. In Lardner there are many more. For instance, them giants is not such rotten hitters, is they? The people has all wanted to shake hands with Matthewson and I. And some of the men has brung their wife along. Says, used as the preterite of to say, shows the same confusion. One observes it again in such forms as, then I goes up to him. Here the decay of number helps in what threatens to become a decay of tense. Examples of it are not hard to find. The average racetrack follower of the umbler sort seldom says, I won two dollars, or even, I won two dollars. But almost always, I win two dollars. And in the same way, he says, I see him come in, not, I saw him, or seen him. Charter's materials offers other specimens. Among them, we help distributed the fruit. She recognize, hug, and kiss him. And her father asked her if she intended doing what he asked. Perhaps the occasional use of eat as the preterite of to eat, as in I eat breakfast as soon as I got up, is an example of the same flattening out of distinctions. Lardner has many specimens among them if Weaver and them had not have begun kicking, and they would have knocked down the fence. I notice that used in used to be is almost always reduced to simple use, as in it used to be the rule. One seldom if ever hears a clear D at the end. Here, of course, the elision of the D is due primarily to assimilation with the T of two. A second example of one form of decay aiding another form. But the tenses apparently tend to crumble without help. I frequently hear whole narratives in a sort of debased present. I says to him, then he ups and says, I land him one on the ear, he goes down and out, and so on. Still, under the spell of our disintegrating inflections, we are prone to regard the tense inflections of the verb as absolutely essential. But there are plenty of languages that get on without them, and even in our own language, children and foreigners often reduce them to a few simple forms. Some time ago, an Italian contractor said to me, I have go there often. Here, one of our few surviving inflections was displaced by an analytical device, and yet the man's meaning was quite clear and it would be absurd to say that his sentence violated the inner spirit of English. That inner spirit, in fact, has inclined steadily toward I have go for a thousand years. End of chapter 6, part 3 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 6, part 4 of the American Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 6 The Common Speech Part 4 The Pronoun The following paradigm shows the inflections of the personal pronoun in the American common speech. First person, common gender, nominative, singular, I, plural, we, possessive conjoint, singular, my, plural, our, Possessive absolute, singular, mine, plural, ourn. Objective, singular, me, plural, us. Second person, common gender, singular, nominative, you, plural, use. Possessive conjoint, singular, your, plural, your. Possessive absolute, singular, Yorn, plural, yorn. Objective, singular, you, plural, use. Third person, masculine gender, nominative, singular, he, plural, they. Possessive conjoint, singular, his, plural, their. Possessive absolute, singular, hisn, plural, theirn. Objective singular, him, plural, them. Feminine gender, nominative, singular, she, plural, they. Possessive conjoint, singular, her, plural,
plural, there. Possessive absolute singular, hern, plural, thern. Objective singular, her, plural, them. Neuter gender, nominative, singular, it, plural, they. Possessive conjoint singular, its, plural, theirn. Possessive absolute singular, its, plural, their. Objective singular, it, plural, them. These inflections, as we shall see, are often disregarded in use, but nevertheless it is profitable to glance at them as they stand. The only variations that they show from standard English are the substitution of N for S as the distinguishing mark of the absolute form of the possessive, and the attempt to differentiate between the logical and the merely polite plurals in the second person by adding the usual sign of the plural to the former. The use of N in place of S is not an American innovation. It is found in many of the dialects of English, and is in fact historically quite as sound as the use of S. In John Wycliffe's translation of the Bible, circa 1380, the first sentence of the Sermon on the Mount, Mark 5, verse 3, is made, Blessed be the poor in spirit, for the kingdom in heavens is herein. And in his version of Luke 24, verse 24, is this, And some of Aaron went into the grave. Here, herein, or herein, represents, of course, not the modern hers, but theirs. In Anglo-Saxon, the word was heora, and down to Chaucer's day, a modified form of it here was still used in the possessive plural in place of the modern there, though they had already displaced high in the nominative. Footnote. Henry Bradley, in The Making of English, pages 54 and 55. In the parts of England which were largely inhabited by Danes, the native pronouns, i.e., heo, his, heom, and heora, were supplanted by the Scandinavian pronouns which are represented by the modern she, they, them, and their. This substitution, at first dialectical, gradually spread to the whole language. End footnote. But in John Purvey's revision of the Wycliffe Bible, made a few years later, Hearn actually occurs in Second Kings 8, verse 6, thus, Restore thou to her all things that had been Hearn. In Anglo-Saxon there had been no distinction between the conjoint and absolute forms of the possessive pronouns. The simple genitive sufficed for both uses. But with the decay of that language the surviving remnants of its grammar began to be put to service somewhat recklessly. And so there arose a genitive inflection of this genitive, a true double inflection. In the northern dialects of English that inflection was made simply by adding s, the sign of the possessive. In southern dialects the old n declension was applied. And so there arose such forms as minum and yorum, mine and yours, from mine and your, my and your. Meanwhile, the original simple genitive, now become your, also survived. And so the literature of the 14th century shows the three forms flourishing side by side, your, yours, and urine. All of them are in Chaucer. Thus, yorn, hern, hisn, ourn, and theirn, whatever their present offense to grammarians, are of a genealogy quite as respectable as that of yours, hers, his, ours, and theirs. Both forms represent a doubling of inflections and hence grammatical debasement. On the side of the yours form is the standard usage of the past five hundred years. But on the side of the yearn form there is no little force of analogy and logic as appears on turning to mine and thine. In Anglo-Saxon, as we have seen, my was mine. In the same way, thy was thine. During the decadence of the language, the final n was dropped in both cases before nouns, that is, in the conjoint form, but it was retained in the absolute form. This usage survives to our own day. One says, 
my book, but the book is mine. Thy faith, but I am thine. Footnote. Before a noun beginning with a vowel, thine and mine are commonly substituted for thy and my, as in thine eyes and mine infirmity. But this is solely for the sake of euphony. There is no compensatory use of my and thy in the absolute. End footnote. Also one says, no matter, but I have none. Without question, this retention of the N in these pronouns had something to do with the appearance of the N declension in the treatment of your, her, his, and our, and after there had displaced here in the third person plural, in there. And equally without question, it supports the vulgar American usage today. What that usage shows is simply the strong popular tendency to make language as simple and as regular as possible, to abolish subtleties and exceptions. The difference between his book and the book is hisn is exactly that between my and mine, thy and thine, in the examples just given. Perhaps it would have been better, says Bradley, if the literary language had accepted hisn, but from some cause it did not do so. As for the addition of s to you in the nominative and objective of the second person plural, it exhibits no more than an effort to give clarity to the logical difference between the true plural and the mere polite plural. In several other dialects of English the same desire has given rise to cognate forms, and there are even secondary devices in American. In the South, for example, the true plural is commonly indicated by you all which, despite a northern belief to the contrary, is never used in the singular by any save the most ignorant. You all, like use, simply means you jointly, as opposed to the you that means thou. Again there is the form observed in you can all of you go to hell, another plain effort to differentiate between singular and plural. The substitution of you for thou goes back to the end of the thirteenth century. It appeared in late Latin and in the other continental languages as well as in English, and at about the same time. In these languages the true singular survives alongside the transplanted plural, but English has dropped it entirely save in its poetical and liturgical forms, and in a few dialects. It passed out of ordinary polite speech before Elizabeth's day. By that time, indeed, its use had acquired an air of the offensive, such as it has today, save between intimates or to children in Germany. Thus at the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh in 1603, Sir Edward Coke, then Attorney General, displayed his animosity to Raleigh by addressing him as thou, and finally burst into the contemptuous, I thou thee, thou traitor and in Twelfth Night Sir Toby Belch urges Sir Andrew Ogcheek to provoke the disguised Viola to combat by thouing her. In our own time, with thou passed out entirely, even as a pronoun of contempt, the confusion between you in the plural and you in the singular presents plain difficulties to a man of limited linguistic resources. He gets around them by setting up a distinction that is well supported by logic and analogy. I seen you's is clearly separated from I seen you, and in the conjoint position, you guys is separated from you liar. So much for the personal pronouns. As we shall see, they are used in such a manner that the distinction between the nominative and the objective forms, though still existing grammatically, has begun to break down. But first it may be well to glance at the demonstrative and relative pronouns. Of the former there are but two in English, this and that, with their plural forms these and those. To them American adds a third, them, which is also the personal pronoun of the third person objective case. Footnote. It occurs too, of course, in other dialects of English, though by no means in all. The Irish influence probably had something to do with its prosperity in vulgar American. At all events, the Irish use it in the American manner. Joyce, in English as we speak it in Ireland, pages 34 and 35, argues that this usage was suggested by Gaelic. In Gaelic, the accusative pronouns a, e, 
and id, him, her, and them, are often used in place of the nominatives, say, si, and siad, he, she, and they, as in, isiad sheen na bukailaji, them are the boys. This is good grammar in Gaelic, and the Irish, when they began to learn English, translated the locution literally. The familiar Irish, John is dead and him always so hardy, shows the same influence. End footnote. In addition, it has adopted certain adverbial pronouns, this here, these here, that there, those there, and them there, and set up inflections of the original demonstratives by analogy with mine, hisen, and yourn, to wit, thisen, thesen, thaten, and thosen. I present some examples of everyday use. Them are the kind I like. Them men all work here. Who is this here Smith I hear about? These here are mine. That their medicine ain't no good. Those their wops has all took to the woods. I wish I had one of them their forwards. Thisn is better than thatn. I like thesen better than thosen. The origin of the demonstratives of the thisn group is plain. They are degenerate forms of this one, that one, etc., just as none is a degenerate composition form of not one. In every case of their use that I have observed, the simple demonstratives might have been set free, and one actually substituted for the terminal in. But it must be equally obvious that they have been reinforced very greatly by the absolutes of the hisen group for in their relation to the original demonstratives they play the part of just such absolutes, and are never used conjointly. Thus one says in American, I take thisn, or thisn is mine, but one never says, I take thisn hat, or thisn dog is mine. In this conjoint situation, plain this is always used, and the same rule applies to these, those, and that. Them, being a newcomer among the demonstratives, has not yet inquired an inflection in the absolute. I have never heard themen, and it will probably never come in, for it is forbiddingly clumsy. One says in American, both them are mine, and them collars are mine. This here, these here, that there, those there, and them there, are plainly combinations of pronouns and adverbs and their function is to support the distinction between proximity, as embodied in this and these, and remoteness, as embodied in that, those, and them. This here coat is mine simply means this coat here, or this present coat, is mine. But the adverb promises to coalesce with the pronoun so completely as to obliterate all sense of its distinct existence, even as a false noun or adjective. As commonly pronounced, this here becomes a single word, somewhat like this year, and these here becomes these year, and that there and them there become that air and them air. Those there, if I observed accurately, is still pronounced more distinctly, but it too may succumb to composition in time. The adverb will then sink to the estate of a mere inflectional particle, as one has done in the absolute of the thisn group. Them, as a personal pronoun in the absolute, of course, is commonly pronounced M, as in I seen em, and sometimes its vowel is almost lost. But this is also the case in all save the most exact spoken English. Sweet and Lounsbury, following the German grammarians, argue that this M is not really a debased form of them, but the offspring of him which survived as a regular plural of the third person in the objective case down to the beginning of the 15th century. But in American, them is clearly pronounced as a demonstrative. I have never heard em men, or em are the kind I like, but always them men, and them are the kind I like. The relative pronouns, so far as I have been able to make out, are declined as follows. Nominative who, which, what, that. Possessive conjoint, whose, whose. Possessive absolute, whosen, whosen. Objective, who, which, what, that. 
Two things will be noted in this paradigm. First, there is the disappearance of whom as the objective form of who. And secondly, there is the appearance of an inflected form of whose in the absolute, by analogy with mine, hisen, and thesen. Whom, as we have seen, is fast disappearing from standard spoken American. In the vulgar language, it is already virtually extinct. Not only is who used in such construction as who did you find there, where even standard spoken English would tolerate it, but also in such constructions as the man who I saw, them who I trust in, and to who. Crap explains the use of who on the ground that there is a general feeling, due to the normal word order in English, that the word which precedes the verb is the subject word, or at least the subject form. But this explanation is probably fanciful. Among the plain people no such general feeling for case exists. Their only general feeling is a prejudice against case inflections in any form whatsoever. They use who in place of whom simply because they can discern no logical difference between the significance of the one and the significance of the other. Whosen is obviously the offspring of the other absolutes in in. In the conjoint relation plain, whose is always used as in whose hat is that and the man whose dog bit me. But in the absolute, whosen is often substituted, as in, if it ain't hisen, then whosen is it? The imitation is obvious. There is an analogous form of which, to wit, whichen, resting heavily on which one. Thus, whichen do you like, and I didn't say whichen, are plainly variations of which one do you like, and I didn't say which one. That, as we have seen, has a like form, thatn, but never, of course, in the relative situation. I like thatn is familiar, but the one thatn I like is never heard. If that as a relative could be used absolutely, I have no doubt that it would change to thatn, as it does as a demonstrative. So with what? As things stand, it is sometimes substituted for that, as in, them's the kind what I like, Joined to but, it can also take the place of that in other situations, as in, I don't know but what. The substitution of who, for whom, in the objective case just noted, is typical of a general movement toward breaking down all case distinctions among the pronouns, where they make their last stand in English, and its dialects. This movement, of course, is not peculiar to vulgar American, nor is it of recent beginning. So long ago as the 15th century, the old clear distinction between ye nominative and you objective disappeared, and today the latter is used in both cases. Sweet says that the phonetic similarity between ye and thee, the objective form of the true second singular, was responsible for this confusion. At the start, ye actually went over to the objective case and the usage thus established shows itself in such survivors of the period as hark ye, hark ye, and look ye. In modern spoken English, indeed, you in the objective often has a sound far more like that of ye than like that of you, as in, for example, how do you do? And in American, its vowel takes the neutral form of the e in the definite article, and the word becomes a sort of shortened ya. But whatever emphasis is laid upon it, you becomes quite distinct even in American. In I mean you, for example, there is never any chance of mistaking it for ye. In Shakespeare's time, the other personal pronouns of the objective case threatened to follow you into the nominative, and there was a compensatory movement of the nominative pronouns toward the objective. Lounsbury has collected many examples. Marlowe used, is it him you seek? Tis her I esteem, and not thee nor them shall want. Fletcher used, tis her I admire. Shakespeare himself used, that's me. Contrarywise, Webster used, what difference is between the duke and I? And Green used, nor earth nor heaven shall part my love and I. Crap has unearthed many similar examples from the Restoration dramatists. Etheridge used, tis them, it may be him, let you and I, and nor is it me. 
Matthew Pryor, in a famous couplet, achieved this. For thou art a girl as much brighter than her, as he was a poet sublimer than me. The free exchange continued, in fact, until the eighteenth century was well advanced. There are examples of it in Addison. Moreover, it survived, at least in part, even the attack that was then made upon it by the professors of the newborn science of English grammar. And to this day, it is me is still in more or less good colloquial use. Sweet thinks that it is supported in such use, though not, of course, grammatically, by the analogy of the correct, it is he and it is she. Lounsbury, following Dean Alford, says it came into English in imitation of the French, c'est moi, and defends it as at least as good as it is I. The contrary form between you and I has no defenders, and is apparently going out. But in the shape of between my wife and I, it is seldom challenged, at least in spoken English. All these liberties with the personal pronouns, however, fade to insignificance when put beside the thoroughgoing confusion of the case forms in vulgar American. Us fellers is so far established in the language that we fellers from the mouth of a car conductor would seem almost an affectation. So too is me and her are friends. So again are I seen you and her, her and I sat down together, him and his wife, I knowed it was her. Here are some other characteristic examples of the use of the objective forms and the nominative from Charters and Lardner. Me and her was both late. His brother is taller than him. That little boy was me. Us girls went home. They were John and him. Her and little Al is to stay here. She says she thinks us and the Allens. If Weaver and them had not have begun kicking, but not me. Him and I are friends. Me and them are friends. Less numerous, but still varied and plentiful, are the substitutions of nominative forms for objective forms. She gave it to mother and I. She took all of we children. I want you to meet he and I at 29th Street. He gave he and I both some. It is going to cost me six dollars a week for a room for she and the baby. Anything she has is okay for I and Flory. Here are some grotesque confusions indeed. Perhaps the best way to get at the principles underlying them is to examine first not the cases of their occurrence, but the cases of their non-occurrence. Let us begin with the transfer of the objective form to the nominative in the subject relation. Me and her was both late. Is obviously sound American. One hears it or something like it on the streets every day. But one never hears, me was late, or her was late, or us was late, or him was late, or them was late. Again one hears, us girls was there, but never, us was there. Yet again one hears, her and John was married, but never, her was married. The distinction here set up should be immediately plain. It exactly parallels that between her and hern, our and ourn, there and theirn. The tendency, as Sweet says, is to merge the distinction of nominative and objective in that of conjoint and absolute. The nominative in the subject relation takes the usual nominative form only when it is in immediate contact with its verb. If it be separated from its verb by a conjunction or any other part of speech, even including another pronoun, it takes the objective form. Thus, me went home would strike even the most ignorant shop girl as Brad Grammar, but she would use me and my friend went, or me and him, or he and her, or me and them, without the slightest hesitation. What is more, if the separation be effected by a conjunction and another pronoun, the other pronoun also changes to the objective form, even though its contact with the verb may be immediate. Thus one hears me and her was there, not me and she. Her and him kissed, not her and he. Still more, this second pronoun commonly undergoes the same inflection even when the first member of the group is not another pronoun but a noun. Thus one hears, John and her were married, not John and she. To this rule there is but one exception, and that is in the case of the first person pronoun, especially in the singular. Him and me are friends, is heard often. 
but him and I are friends, is also heard. I seems to suggest the subject very powerfully. It is actually the subject of perhaps a majority of the sentences uttered by an ignorant man. At all events, it resists the rule at least partially, and may even do so when actually separated from the verb by another pronoun, itself in the objective form. As for example, in I and him were there. In the predicate relation, the pronouns respond to a more complex regulation. When they follow any form of the simple verb of being, they take the objective form as in It's me, it ain't him, and I am him. Probably because the transitiveness of this verb exerts a greater pull than its function as a mere copula. And perhaps too because the passive naturally tends to put the speaker in the place of the object. I seen he, or he kissed she, or he struck I, would seem as ridiculous to an ignorant American as to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and his instinct for simplicity and regularity naturally tends to make him reduce all similar expressions, or what seem to him to be similar expressions, to coincidence with the more seemly, I seen him. After all, the verb of being is fundamentally transitive, and in some ways the most transitive of all verbs and so it is not illogical to bring its powers over the pronoun into accord with the powers exerted by the others. I incline to think that it is some such subconscious logic and not the analogy of it is he, as Sweet argues, that has brought it is me to conversational respectability even among rather careful speakers of English. Footnote. It may be worth noting here that the misuse of me for my as in I lit me pipe, is quite unknown in American, either standard or vulgar. Even me own is seldom heard. This boggling of the cases is very common in spoken English. End footnote. But against this use of the objective form in the nominative position after the verb of being, there also occurs in American a use of the nominative form in the objective position, as in she gave it to mother and I, and she took all of we children. What lies at the bottom of it seems to be a feeling somewhat resembling that which causes the use of the objective form before the verb, but exactly contrary in its effects. That is to say, the nominative form is used when the pronoun is separated from its governing verb, whether by a noun, a noun phrase, or another pronoun, as in she gave it to mother and I, she took all of we children, and he paid her and I respectively. But here usage is far from fixed, and one observes variations in both directions. That is, toward using the correct objective when the pronoun is detached from the verb, and toward using the nominative even when it directly follows the verb. She gave it to mother and me, she took all of us children, and he paid her and me, would probably sound quite as correct to a knight of Pythias as the forms just given. And at the other end, Charters and Lardner report such forms as, I want you to meet he and I, and it is going to cost me six dollars a week for a room for she and the baby. I have noticed, however, that in the overwhelming main the use of the nominative is confined to the pronoun of the first person, and particularly to its singular. Here again we have an example of the powerful way in which I asserts itself, and superimposed upon that influence is a cause mentioned by Sweet in discussing between you and I. It is a sort of by-product of the pedagogical war upon it is me. As such expressions, he says, are still denounced by the grammars, many people try to avoid them in speech as well as in writing. The result of this reaction is that the me in such constructions as between John and me, and he saw John and me, sounds vulgar and ungrammatical and is consequently corrected into I. Here the pedagogue, seeking to impose an inelastic and illogical grammar upon a living speech, succeed only in corrupting it still more. Following than and as, the American uses the objective form of the pronoun as in he is taller than me, and such is her. He also uses it following like, but not when, as often happens, he uses the word in place of as or as if. Thus he says, do it like him but do it like he does, and she looks like she was sick. What appears here is an instinctive feeling that these words, followed by a pronoun only, are not adverbs but prepositions, 
and that they should have the same power to put the pronoun into an oblique case that other prepositions have. Just as the taller of we would sound absurd to all of us, so taller than he to the unschooled American sounds absurd. This feeling is a good deal of respectable support. As her was used by Swift, than me by Burke, and than whom by Milton. The brothers Fowler show that in some cases than him is grammatically correct and logically necessary. For example, compare I love you more than him and I love you more than he. The first means I love you more than I love him. The second, I love you more than he loves you. In the first, him does not refer to I, which is nominative, but to you, which is objective, and so it is properly objective also. But the American, of course, uses him even when the preceding noun is in the nominative, save only when another verb follows the pronoun. Thus he says, I love you better than him, but I love you better than he does. In the matter of the reflexive pronouns, the American Vulgate exhibits forms which plainly show that it is the spirit of the language to regard self, not as an adjective, which it is historically, but as a noun. This confusion goes back to Anglo-Saxon days. It originated at a time when both the adjectives and the nouns were losing their old inflections. Such forms as Peter's self, Peter's self, Christ's self, Christ's self, and I self, I self, then came into use, and along with them came combinations of self and the genitive, still surviving in his self and their selves, or their self. Down to the sixteenth century, these forms remained in perfectly good usage. Each for his self, for example, was written by Sir Philip Sidney, and it is to be found in the dramatists of the time, though modern editors always change it to himself. How the dative pronoun got itself fashioned upon self in the third person masculine and neuter is one of the mysteries of language, but there it is, and so against all logic, history, and grammatical regularity, himself, themselves, and itself, not its self, are in favor today. But the American, as usual, inclines against these illogical exceptions to the rule set by myself. I constantly hear his self and their selves, as in, he done it himself, and they don't know their selves. Sometimes their self is substituted for their selves, as in, they all seen it their self. And also the emphatic own is often inserted between the pronoun and the noun, as in, let every man save his own self. The American pronoun does not necessarily agree with its noun in number. I find, I can tell each one what they make, each fellow put their foot on the line, nobody can do what they like, and she was one of these kind of people in charters, and I am not the kind of man that is always thinking about their record. If he was to hit a man in the head, they would think their nose tickled, in Lardner. At the bottom of this error there is a real difficulty the lack of a pronoun of the true common gender in English corresponding to the French soi and son. His, after a noun or pronoun connoting both sexes, often sounds inept, and his or her is intolerably clumsy. Thus the inaccurate plural is often substituted. The brothers Fowler have discovered anybody else who have only themselves in view in Richardson, and everybody is discontented with their lot in Disraeli, and Ruskin once wrote, If a customer wishes you to injure their foot, in spoken American, even the most careful, they and their often appear. I turn to the congressional record at random and in two minutes find, if anyone will look at the bank statements, they will see. In the lower reaches of the language, the plural seems to get into every sentence of any complexity, even when the preceding noun or pronoun is plainly singular. End of chapter 6, part 4. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 6, part 5 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. 
Chapter Six: The Common Speech, Part Five: The Adverb. All the adverbial endings in English, save ly, have gradually fallen into decay. It is the only one that is ever used to form new adverbs. At earlier stages of the language, various other endings were used, and some of them survive in a few old words, though they are no longer employed in making new words. The Anglo-Saxon endings were e and l-i-c-e. The latter was at first merely an e ending to adjectives in l-i-c, but after a time it attained to independence and was attached to adjectives not ending in l-i-c. In early Middle English this l-i-c-e changes to l-i-k-e, and later on to l-i and l-y. Meanwhile, the E ending, following the E endings of the nouns, adjectives, and verbs, ceased to be pronounced, and so it gradually fell away. Thus a good many adverbs came to be indistinguishable from their ancestral adjectives. For example, hard in to pull hard, loud in to speak loud, and deep in to bury deep, equals the Anglo-Saxon deoppe. Worse, not a few adverbs actually became adjectives, for example, wide, which was originally the Anglo-Saxon adjective weed equals wide, with the adverbial e ending, and late, which was originally the Anglo-Saxon adjective lat equals slow, with the same ending. The result of this movement toward identity in form was a confusion between the two classes of words, and from the time of Chaucer down to the 18th century, one finds innumerable instances of the use of the simple adjective as an adverb. He will answer true, is in Sir Thomas More, and soft unto himself, he said, in Chaucer, the singers sang loud, in the revised version of the Bible, Nehemiah 12:42 and indifferent well in Shakespeare. Even after the purists of the 18th century began their corrective work, this confusion continued. Thus one finds, the people are miserable poor in Hume, how unworthy you treated mankind in The Spectator, and wonderful silly in Joseph Butler. To this day the grammarians battle with the barbarism, still without complete success. Every new volume of rules and regulations for those who would speak by the book is full of warnings against it. Among the great masses of the plain people, it goes without saying, it flourishes, unimpeded. The cautions of the schoolmarm, in a matter so subtle and so plainly lacking in logic or necessity, are forgotten as quickly as her prohibition of the double negative, and thereafter the adjective and the adverb tend more and more to coalesce in a part of speech which serves the purposes of both, and is simple and intelligible and satisfying. Charters gives a number of characteristic examples of its use. Wounded very bad. I sure was stiff, drank out of a cup easy, he looked up quick. Many more are in Lardner. A chance to see me work regular, I am glad I was lucky enough to marry happy, I beat them easy, and so on. And others fall upon the ear every day. He done it proper, he done himself proud, she was dressed neat, she was awful ugly, the horse ran okay. It near finished him, it sells quick, I like it fine, he et hoggish, she acted mean, they keep company steady. The bobtailed adverb indeed enters into a large number of the commonest coins of vulgar speech. Near silk, I dare say, is properly nearly silk. The grammarians protest that run slow should be run slowly. But near silk and run slow remain, and so do to be in bad, to play it up strong, and their brothers. What we have here is simply an incapacity to distinguish any ponderable difference between adverb and adjective, and beneath it perhaps is the incapacity, already noticed in dealing with it is me, to distinguish between the common verb of being and any other verb. If it is bad is correct, 
then why should it leaks bad be incorrect it is just this disdain of purely grammatical reasons that is at the bottom of most of the phenomena visible in vulgar american and the same impulse is observable in all other languages during periods of inflectional decay during the highly inflected stage of a language the parts of speech are sharply distinct but when inflections fall off they tend to disappear the adverb being at best the stepchild of grammar as the old latin grammarians used to say omnis pars orationis migrat in adverbium is one of the chief victims of this anarchy john horn took despairing of bringing it to any order even in the most careful english called it in his epea petrescenta the common sink and repository of all heterogeneous and unknown corruptions where an obvious logical or lexical distinction has grown up between an adverb and its primary adjective the unschooled american is very careful to give it its terminal ly for example he seldom confuses hard and hardly scarce and scarcely real and really these words convey different ideas hard means unyielding hardly means barely scarce means present only in small numbers scarcely is substantially synonymous with hardly real means genuine really is an assurance of veracity so again with late and lately thus an american says i don't know scarcely not i don't know scarce he died lately not he died late but in nearly all such cases syntax is a preservative not grammar these adverbs seem to keep their tails largely because they are commonly put before and not after verbs as in for example i hardly or scarcely know and i really mean it many other adverbs that take that position habitually are saved as well for example generally usually surely certainly but when they follow verbs they often succumb as in i'll do it sure and i seen him recent and when they modify adjectives they sometimes succumb too as in it was sure hot practically all the adverbs made of adjectives in y lose the terminal ly and thus become identical with their adjectives i have never heard mightily used it is always mighty as in he hit him mighty hard so with filthy dirty nasty lowly naughty and their cognates one hears he acted dirty he spoke nasty the child behaved naughty and so on here even standard english has had to make concessions to euphony cleanly is seldom used cleanly nearly always takes its place and the use of illy is confined to pedants vulgar american like all the higher forms of american and all save the most precise form of written english has abandoned the old inflections of here there and where to wit hither and hence thither and thence whither and whence these fossil remains of dead cases are fast disappearing from the language in the case of hither equals to here even the preposition has been abandoned one says not i came to here but simply i came here in the case of hence however from here is still used and so with from there and from where finally it goes without saying that the common american tendency to add s to such adverbs as towards is carried to full length in the vulgar language one constantly hears not only somewheres and forwards but even no ways and anyways here we have but one more example of the movement toward uniformity and simplicity anyways is obviously fully supported by sideways and always end of chapter six part five chapter six part six of the american language this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 6. The Common Speech. Part 6. The Noun and Adjective. The only inflections of the noun remaining in English are those for number and for the genitive, and so it is in these two regions that the few variations to be noted in vulgar American occur. The rule that, in forming the plurals of compound nouns or noun phrases, the s shall be attached to the principal noun is commonly disregarded, and it goes at the end. Thus, I have two sons-in-law is never heard. One always hears, I have two son-in-laws. So with the genitive, I once overheard this, that umbrella is the young lady I go with's. Often a false singular is formed from a singular ending in s, the latter being mistaken for a plural. Chinese, Portuguese, and Japanese are familiar. I have also noted trapi, tactic, and summon from trapeze, tactics, and summons. Paradoxically, the word incidents is commonly misused for incident, as in he told an incidence. Here, incidence, or incident, seems to be regarded as a synonym not for happening, but for story. I have never heard he told of an incidence. The of is always omitted. The general disregard of number often shows itself when the noun is used as object. I have already quoted Lardner's Some of the Men Has Brung Their Wife Along. In a popular magazine I lately encountered, those book ethnologists can't see what is before their nose. Many similar examples might be brought forward. The adjectives are inflected only for comparison and the American commonly uses them correctly, with now and then a double comparative or superlative to ease his soul. More better is the commonest of these. It has a good deal of support in logic. A sick man is reported today to be better. Tomorrow he is further improved. Is he to be reported better again or best? The standard language gets around the difficulty by using still better. The American Vulgate boldly employs more better. In the case of worse, worser is used, as Charters shows. He also reports baddest, more queerer, and beautifulest. Littler, which she notes, is still outlawed from standard English, but it has, with littlest, a respectable place in American. The late Richard Harding Davis wrote a play called The Littlest Girl. The American freely compares adjectives that are incapable of the inflection logically. Charters reports most principal, and I myself have heard uniquer, and even more uniquer, as in I have never saw nothing more uniquer. I have also heard more ultra, more worse, idealer, liver, that is, more alive, and wellest, as in he was the wellest man you ever seen. In general, the ER and EST terminations are used instead of the more and most prefixes, as in beautiful, beautifuler, beautifulest. The fact that the comparative relates to two and the superlative to more than two is almost always forgotten. I have never heard the better of the two, but always the best of the two. Charters also reports the hardest of the two, and my brother and I measured and he was the tallest. I have frequently heard, it ain't so worse, but here a humorous effect seems to have been intended. Adjectives are made much less rapidly in American than either substantives or verbs. The only suffix that seems to be in general use for that purpose is why, as in tony, classy, daffy, nutty, dinky, leery, etc. The use of the adjectival prefix super is confined to the more sophisticated classes. The plain people seem to be unaware of it. This relative paucity of adjectives appears to be common to the more primitive varieties of speech. 
e j hills in his elaborate study of the vocabulary of a child of two found that it contained but twenty-three descriptive adjectives of which six were the names of colors as against fifty-nine verbs and a hundred and seventy-three common nouns moreover most of the twenty-three minus six were adjectives of all work such as nasty funny and nice colloquial american uses the same rubber stamps of speech funny connotes the whole range of the unusual hard indicates every shade of difficulty nice is everything satisfactory bully is a superlative of almost limitless scope the decay of one to a vague n sound as in thisn is matched by a decay of than after comparatives earlier than is seldom if ever heard composition reduces the two words to earliern so with bettern fastern hottern deadern etc once i overheard the following dialogue i like a belt more loosen what this one is well then why don't you unloosen it more'n you got it unloosened end of chapter six part six chapter six part seven of the american language this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 6. The Common Speech. Part 7. The Double Negative. Syntactically, Perhaps the chief characteristic of vulgar American is its sturdy fidelity to the double negative. So freely is it used, indeed, that the simple negative appears to be almost abandoned. Such phrases as, I see nobody, or I know nothing about it, are heard so seldom that they appear to be affectations when encountered. The well-nigh universal forms are, I don't see nobody, and I don't know nothing about it. Charters list some very typical examples. Among them, he ain't never coming back no more. You don't care for nobody but yourself. Couldn't be no more happier. And I can't see nothing. In Lardner there are innumerable examples. They was not no team. I have not never thought of that. I can't write no more. No chance to get no money from nowhere. We can't have nothing to do. And so on. Some of his specimens show a considerable complexity. For example... Matthewson was not only going as far as the coast, meaning, as the context shows, that he was going as far as the coast and no further. Only gets into many other examples, such as, he hadn't only the one pass, and I don't work nights no more, only except Sunday nights. This latter I got from a car conductor. Many other curious specimens are in my collectania. Among them, one swaller don't make no summer, I never see nothing I would a rather saw. And once a child gets burnt once, it won't never stick its hand in no fire no more. And so on. The last embodies a triple negative. In The More Faster You Go, The Sooner You Don't Get There, there is an elaborate muddling of negatives that is very characteristic. Like most other examples of bad grammar encountered in American, the compound negative is of great antiquity and was once quite respectable. The student of Anglo-Saxon encounters it constantly. In that language, the negative of the verb was formed by prefixing a particle, ne. Thus, singen, to sing, became ne singen, not to sing. In case the verb began with a vowel, the ne dropped its e and was combined with the verb, as in nefra, never, from ne, efra, not ever. In case the verb began with an H or a W followed by a vowel, the H or W of the verb and the E of ne were both dropped, as in neft, has not, from ne hath, not has, and nold, would not, from ne wold. Finally, in case the vowel following a W was an I, it changed to Y, as in neist, knew not, from ne wist. But inasmuch as Anglo-Saxon was a fully inflected language, the inflections for the negative did not stop with the verbs. 
The indefinite article, the indefinite pronoun, and even some of the nouns were also inflected, and survivors of those forms appear to this day in such words as none and nothing. Moreover, when an actual inflection was impossible, it was the practice to insert this ne before a word in the sense of our no or not. Still more, it came to be the practice to reinforce ne before a vowel with ne, not, or not, nothing, which later degenerated to nat and not. As a result, there were fearful and wonderful combinations of negatives, some of them fully matching the best efforts of Lardner's baseball player. Sweet gives several curious examples. Nen ne dorst nan thing asien, translated literally, becomes No one dares not ask nothing. Vet hus ne ne fail becomes The house did not fall not. As for the Middle English, he never neighed nothing, it has too modern and familiar a ring to need translating at all. Chaucer, at the beginning of the period of transition to modern English, used the double negative with the utmost freedom. In the knight's tale is this, He never yet no villainy ne said, in all his life unto no manner white. By the time of Shakespeare this license was already much restricted, but a good many double negatives are nevertheless to be found in his plays, and he was particularly shaky in the use of nor. In Richard the Third, one finds, I never was nor never will be. In Measure for Measure, Harp not on that, nor do not banish treason. And in Romeo and Juliet, Thou expectedst not, nor I looked not for. This misuse of nor is still very frequent. In other directions, too, the older forms show a tendency to survive all the assaults of grammarians. No, it doesn't, heard every day and by no means from the ignorant only, is a sort of double negative. The insertion of but before that, as in, I doubt but that, and there is no question but that, makes a double negative that is probably full-blown. Nevertheless, as we have seen, it is heard on the floor of Congress every day, and the Fowlers show that it is also common in England. Even worse forms get into the congressional record. Not long ago, for example, I encountered, without hardly an exception, in a public paper of the utmost importance. There are indeed situations in which the double negative leaps to the lips or from the pen almost irresistibly. Even such careful writers as Huxley, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Leslie Stephen have occasionally dallied with it. It is perfectly allowable in the Romance languages, and as we have seen, is almost the rule in the American Vulgate. Now and then, some anarchistic student of the language boldly defends and even advocates it. The double negative said a writer in the London Review a long time ago, has been abandoned to the great injury of strength of expression. Surely, I won't take nothing, is stronger than either I will take nothing or I won't take anything. Language begins, says Sace, with sentences, not with single words. In a speech in process of rapid development, unrestrained by critical analysis, the tendency to sacrifice the integrity of words to the needs of the complete sentence is especially marked. One finds it clearly in American. Already we have examined various assimilation and composition forms, thatten, used to, woulda, them ear, and so on. Many others are observable. Often is a good example. It comes from off of and shows a preposition decaying to the form of a mere inflectional particle. One constantly hears, I bought it off in John. Sorta, kinda, and their like follow in the footsteps of woulda. Usent follows the analogy of don't and wouldn't. Would've and should've are widely used. Lardner commonly hears them as would of and should of. The neutral a particle also appears in other situations, especially before way, as in that away and this away. It is found again in at all, a liaison form of at all. Footnote. At all, by the way, is often displaced by any or none, as in he don't love her any, and it didn't hurt me none. End of footnote. End of chapter six, part seven. Chapter six, part eight of the American language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken Chapter 6 The Common Speech Part 8 Pronunciation before anything approaching a thorough and profitable study of the sounds of the American common speech is possible, there must be a careful assembling of the materials, and this, unfortunately, still awaits a philologist of sufficient enterprise and equipment. Dr. William A. Reed, of the State University of Louisiana, has made some excellent examinations of vowel and consonant sounds in the South. Dr. Louise Pound has done capital work of the same sort in the Middle West, and there have been other regional studies of merit. But most of these become misleading by reason of their lack of scope. Forms practically universal in the nation are discussed as dialectical variations. This is the central defect in the work of the American Dialect Society, otherwise very industrious and meritorious. It is essaying to study localisms before having first planted the characteristics of the general speech. The dictionaries of Americanisms deal with pronunciation only casually, and often very inaccurately. The remaining literature is meager and unsatisfactory. Until the matter is gone into at length, it will be impossible to discuss any phase of it with exactness. No single investigator can examine the speech of the whole country. For that business, a pooling of forces is necessary. But meanwhile, it may be of interest to set forth a few provisional ideas. At the start, two streams of influence upon American pronunciation may be noted. The one, an inheritance from the English of the colonists, and the other, arising spontaneously within the country, and apparently, much colored by immigration. The first influence, it goes without saying, is gradually dying out. Consider, for example, the pronunciation of the diphthong oi. In Middle English, it was as in boy, but during the early modern English period, it was assimilated with that of the i in wine, and this usage prevailed at the time of the settlement of America. The colonists thus brought it with them, and at the same time it lodged in Ireland, where it still prevails. But in England, during the pedantic 18th century, this I sound was displaced by the original OI sound, not by historical research, but by mere deduction from the spelling, and the new pronunciation soon extended to the polite speech of America. In the common speech, however, the I sound persisted, and down to the time of the Civil War, it was constantly heard in such words as boil, hoist, oil, join, poison, and royal, which thus became bile, heist, isle, gine, pison, and rile. Since then, the school marm has combated it with such vigor that it has begun to disappear, and such forms as pison, gine, bile, and isle are now very seldom heard, save as dialectic variations. But in certain other words, perhaps supported by Irish influence, the I sound still persists. Chief among them are hoist and royal. An unlearned American, wishing to say that he was enraged, never says that he was roiled, but always that he was riled. Desiring to examine the hoof of his horse, he never orders the animal to hoist, but always to heist. In the form of booze heister, the latter is almost in good usage. I have seen booze heister thus spelled, and obviously to be thus pronounced, in an editorial article in the American issue organ of the Anti-Saloon League of America. Various similar misplaced vowels were brought from England by the colonists, and have persisted in America, while dying out of good England usage. There is, for example, short I in place of long E, 
as in critter for creature. Critter is common to almost all the dialects of English, but American has embedded the vowel in a word that is met with nowhere else, and has thus become characteristic to it, crick for creek. Nor does any other dialect make such extensive use of slick for sleek. Again, there is the substitution of the flat A for the broad A in sauce. England has gone back to the broad A, but in America the flat A persists, and many Americans who use sassy every day would scarcely recognize saucy if they heard it. Yet again, there is quite. Originally, the English pronounced it quite, but now they pronounce the diphthong as in doily. In the United States, the quate pronunciation remains. Finally, there is deaf. Its proper pronunciation in the England that the colonists left was deaf, but it now rhymes with Jeff. That new pronunciation has been adopted by polite American, despite the protests of Noah Webster, but in the common speech the word is still always deaf. However, a good many of the vowels of the early days have succumbed to pedagogy. The American proletarian may still use skier for scare, but in most of the other words of that class he now uses the vowel approved by correct English usage. Thus, he seldom permits himself such old forms as dream for drain, keer for care, skears for scarce, or even cheer for chair. The Irish influence supported them for a while, but now they are fast going out. So too are kiver for cover, crep for crop, and chist for chest. But kittle for kettle still shows a certain vitality. Wrench is still used in place of rinse, and squinch in place of squint, and a flat A continues to displace various E sounds in such words as rare for rear, example as a horse, and wrestle for wrestle. Contrarywise, E displaces A in catch and radish, which are commonly pronounced catch and reddish. This E sound was once accepted in standard English. When it got into spoken American it was perfectly sound. One still hears it from the most pedantic lips in any. There are also certain other ancients that show equally unbroken vitality among us. For example, stomp for stamp, snoot for snout, Gardeen for guardian, and champion for champion. But all these vowels, whether approved or disapproved, have been under the pressure, for the past century, of a movement toward a general vowel neutralization, and in the long run it promises to dispose of many of them. The same movement also affects standard English, as appears by Robert Bridges's tract on the present state of English pronunciation. But I believe that it is stronger in America, and will go farther, at least with the common speech, if only because of our unparalleled immigration. Standard English has nineteen separate vowel sounds. No other living tongue of Europe, save Portuguese, has so many. Most of the others have a good many less. Modern Greek has but five. The immigrant, facing all these vowels, finds some of them quite impossible. The Russian Jew, as we have seen, cannot manage er. As a result, he tends to employ a neutralized vowel in all the situations which present difficulties, and this neutralized vowel, supported by the slipshod speech habits of the native proletariat, makes steady progress. It appears in many of the forms that we have been examining, 
in the final A of woulda. Vaguely before the N in thisn and often, in place of the original D in used to, and in the common pronunciation of such words as been, come, and have, particularly when they are sacrificed to sentence exigencies as in I've been thinking, come here, and he would have saw you. Here we are upon a wearing down process that shows many other symptoms. One finds not only vowels disorganized, but also consonants. Some are displaced by other consonants, measurably more facile. Others are dropped altogether. D becomes T, as in holt, or is dropped, as in toll. Handkerchief, brand new, and fine, for find. In ast, for ask, T replaces K. When the same word is used in place of asked, as often happens, example, in I asked him his name, it shoulders out ked. It is itself lopped off in bankrupt, quantity, crep, slep, wep, kep, grismill, and less, let's, let us, and is replaced by d in kindergarten and pardoner. L disappears, as in already and gentleman. S becomes ch, as in pinchers. The same ch replaces c, as in pitcher for picture, and t, as in amateur. G disappears from the ends of words, and sometimes too in the middle, as in strength and recognize. R, though it is better preserved in American than in English, is also under pressure, as appears by bust, stuck on for struck on, cuss for curse, yesterday, sarsaparilla, partridge, cartridge, they is for there is, and sad day for Saturday. An excrescent T survives in a number of words. Example, once, twice, clust, wished, for wish, and chanced. It is an heirloom from the English of two centuries ago. So is the final H in height. An excrescent B, as in chimbly and family, seems to be native. Whole syllables are dropped out of words, paralleling the English butchery of extraordinary, for example, in boundary, history, library, and probably. Ordinary, like extraordinary, is commonly enunciated clearly, but it has bred a degenerated form, honorary or honorary, differentiated in meaning. Consonants are misplaced by metathesis, as in perspiration, hundred, brethren, children, introduce, apern, calvary, government, modern, and worsted for worsted. O is changed to er, as in feller, swaller. Yeller, beller, umbreller, and holler. I C E is changed to E R S in jaunders. Words are given new syllables, as in elum, mischievous, and municipial. In the complete sentence, assimilation makes this disorganization much more obvious. Merns in a brief article, gives many examples of the extent to which it is carried. He hears, Was he say? For what does he say? Where is he? For where is he? Asked her in. For ask her in. Hit him out. For hit them out. Sry. 
for that is right, and Khmer for come here. He believes that T is gradually succumbing to D, and cites ass better for that's better. When did you get in? For when did you get in? And sit up for sit up. One hears countless other such decayed forms on the street every day. Have to is almost invariably made have to, with the neutral vowel where I have put the second A. Let's, already noticed, is less. The neutral vowel replaces the oo of good in goodbye. What did you say reduces itself to was a Maybe is maybe. Perhaps is preps. So long is slong. Excuse me is excuse me. The common salutation, how are you, is so dismembered that it finally emerges as a word almost indistinguishable from hi. Here there is room for inquiry. And that inquiry deserves the best effort of American phonologists, for the language is undergoing rapid changes under their very eyes, or perhaps more accurately, under their very ears, and a study of those changes should yield a great deal of interesting matter. How did the word stint on American lips first convert itself into stent and then into stunt? By what process was balk? changed into buck. Both stunt and buck are among the commonest words in the everyday American vocabulary, and yet no one so far has investigated them scientifically. A byway that is yet to be so much as entered is that of naturalized loan words in the common speech. A very characteristic word of that sort is sachet. Its relationship to the French chasse seems to be plain, and yet it has acquired meanings in American that differ very widely from the meaning of chasse. How widely it is dispersed may be seen by the fact that it is reported in popular use as a verb signifying to prance or to walk consciously in southeastern Missouri, Nebraska, northwestern Arkansas, eastern Alabama, and western Indiana, and with slightly different meaning on Cape Cod. The travels of café in America would repay investigation, particularly its variations in pronunciation. I believe that it is fast becoming caif. Plaza, boulevard, vaudeville, menu, and Rathskeller have entered into the common speech of the land, and are pronounced as American words. Such words, when they come in verbally by actual contact with immigrants, commonly retain some measure of their correct native pronunciation. Spiel, kosher, ganoff, and matzah are examples. Their vowels remain un-American. But words that come in visually say through street signs and the newspapers, are immediately overhauled and have thoroughly Americanized vowels and consonants thereafter. School teachers have been trying to establish various pseudo-French pronunciations of vase for 50 years past, but it still rhymes with face in the Vulgate. Vaudeville is vaudeville. Boulevard has a hard D at the end. Plaza has two flat A's. The first syllable of menu rhymes with B. The first of Rathskeller with cats. Fiancé is fiancé. Nay rhymes with C. Décolleté is décolleté. Hofbrau is hofbrau. The German W has lost its V sound and becomes an American W. I have in my day heard protege for protégé, habitu for habitué, 
connoisseur for connoisseur, scherzo for scherzo, premier for premier, etude for etude, and prelude for prelude. Divorcé is divorcee and has all the rakishness of the adjectives in Y. The first syllable of mayonnaise rhymes with hay. Crème de menthe is cream de mint. Schweitzer is Schweitzer. Rochefort is Roquefort. I have heard debut with the last syllable rhyming with nut. I have heard minute for minuet. I have heard to chef d'oeuvre for chef d'oeuvre. And who doesn't remember? As I walked along the boys' boulong with an independent air. And say au revoir, but not goodbye. Charles James Fox, it is said, called the red wine of France bore docks to the end of his days. He had an American heart. His great speeches for the revolting colonies were more than mere oratory. End of chapter 6, part 8. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 7, part 1 of the American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 7. Differences in Spelling, Part 1. Typical Forms. Some of the salient differences between American and English spelling are shown in the following list of common words. Anemia. American. A. N. E. M. I. A. English. A. N. A. E. M. I. A. Aneurysm. American. A. N. E. U. R. I. S. M. English. A. N. E. U. R. Y. S. M. Annex. Noun. American. A. N. N. E. X. English. A. N. N. E. X. E. Arbor. American. A. R. B. O. R. English. A. R. B. O. U. R. Armor. American. A. R. M. O. R. English. A. R. M. O. U. R. Asphalt. American. A. S. P. H. A. L. T. English. A. S. P. H. A. L. T. E. Ataxia. American. A. T. A. X. I. A. English. A. T. A. X. Y. Axe. American. A. X. English. A. X. E. Bulk. Verb. American. B. A. L. K. English. B. A. U. L. K. Baritone. American. B. A. R. I. T. O. N. E. English. B. A. R. Y. T. O. N. E. Bark. A ship. American. B. A. R. K. English. B. A. R. Q. U. E. Behavior. American. B E H A V I O R. English. B E H A V I O U R. Behoove. American. B E H O O V E. English. B E H O V E. Buncom. American. B U N C O M B E. English. B U N K U M. Burden. Ships. American. B U R D E N. English. 
B-U-R-T-H-E-N. Cachexia. American. C-A-C-H-E-X-I-A. -E English. C-A-C-H-E-X-Y. Caliber. American. C-A-L-I-B-E-R. English. C-A-L-I-B-R-E. American. Candor. C-A-N-D-O-R. English. C-A-N-D-O-U-R. Center. American. C-E-N-T-E-R. English. C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. Check. Bank. American. C-H-E-C-K. English. C-H-E-Q-U-E. -E. Checkered. American. C-H-E-C-K-E-R-E-D. English. C-H-E-Q-U-E-R-E-D. -E -E Cider. American. C-I-D-E-R. English. C-Y-D-E-R. Clamor. American. C-L-A-M-O-R. English. C-L-A-M-O-U-R. Clangor. American. C-L-A-N-G-O-R. English. C-L-A-N-G-O-U-R. Cloture. American. C-L-O-T-U-R-E. English. C-L-O-S-U-R-E. Footnote. Fowler and Fowler in the King's English, page 32, say that when it was proposed to borrow from France what we, the English, now know as the closure, it seemed certain for some time that with the thing we should borrow the name, cloture, a press campaign resulted in closure. But in the congressional record it is still cloture though with the loss of the circumflex accent, and this form is generally retained by American newspapers. End footnote. Color. American. C-O-L-O-R. English. C-O-L-O-U-R. Connection. American. C-O-N-N-E-C-T-I-O-N. -E English. C O N. N E X I O N. Counselor, American, C O U N C I L O R. English, C O U N C I L L O R. American, Counselor, C O U N S E L O R. English, C O U N S E L L O R. Cozy, American. C O Z Y English C O S Y Curb American C U R B English K E R B Cyclopedia American C Y C L O P E D I A English C Y C L O P A E D I A Defense American, D-E-F-E-N-S-E. -E -E. English, D-E-F-E-N-C-E. -E. Demeanor, American, D-E-M-E-A-N-O-R. English, D-E-M-E-A-N-O-U-R. Diarrhea, American, D-I-A-R-R-H-E-A. English, D-I-A-R-R-H-O-E-A. -R -R Draft, ships, American, D-R-A-F-T. English, D-R-A-U-G-H-T. Dreadnought, American, D-R-E-A-D-N-A-U-G-H-T. English, D-R-E-A-D-N-O-U-G-H-T. Dryley. American, D-R-Y-L-Y, -Y. English, D-R-I-L-Y. Ecology, American, 
E C O L O G Y. English O E C O L O G Y. Ecumenical American E C U M E N I C A L. English O E C U M E N I C A L. Edema American E D M A. English O E D E M A. Encyclopedia American E N C Y C L O P E D I A. English E N C Y C L O P A E D I A. Endeavor American E N D E A V O R. English E N D E A V O U R. Eon American E O N. English A E O N. Epaulet American E P A L U E T. English E P A U L E T T E. Esophagus American E S O P H A G U S. English O E S O P H A G U S. Faggot American F A G O T. English F A G G O T. Favor American F A V O R English F A V O U R Favorite American F A V O R I T E English F A V O U R I T E Fervor American F E R V O R English F E R V O U R Flavor American F L A V O R English F L A V O U R Font Printers American F O N T English F O U N T Forgather American F O R E G A T H E R English F O R G A T H E R American Forgo F O R E G O English F O R G O Form Printers American F O R M English F O R M E Fuse American F U S E English F U Z E Gauntlet To Run the Gauntlet American G A N T L E T English G A U N T L E T Glamour American G L A M O R English G L A M O U R Goodbye American G O O D hyphen B Y English G O O D hyphen B Y E Gram American G R A M English G R A M M E Gray American G R A Y English G R E Y Harbor American H A R B O R English H A R B O U R Honor American H O N O R English H O N O U R Hostler American H O S T L E R English O S T L E R Humor American H U M O R English H U M O U R Enclose American I N C L O S E English E N C L O S E Endorse American I N D O R S E English E N D O R S E Inflection American I N F L E C T I O N English I N F L E X I O N Inquiry American I N Q U I R Y English E N Q U I R Y Jail American J A I L English G A O L Jewelry American J E W E L R Y English J 
J-E-W-E-L-L-E-R-Y. Jimmy. Burglars. American. J-I-M-M-Y. English. J-E-M-M-Y. Labor. American. L-A-B-O-R. English. L-A-B-O-U-R. Laborer. American. L-A-B-O-R-E-R. English. L-A-B-O-U-R-E-R. Leader. American. L-I-T-E-R. English. L-I-T-R-E. Maneuver. American. M-A-N-E-U-V-E-R. English. M-A-N-O-E-U-V-R-E. Medieval. American. M-E-D-I-E-V-A-L. English. M-E-D-I-A-E-V-A-L. Meter. American. M-E-T-E-R. English. M-E-T-R-E. Misdemeanor. American. M-I-S-D-E-M-E-A-N-O-R. English. M-I-S-D-E-M-E-A-N-O-U-R. Mold. American. M-O-L-D. English. M-O-U-L-D. Mollusk. American. M-O-L-L-U-S-K. English. M-O-L-L-U-S-C. Molt. American. M-O-L-T. English. M-O-U-L-T. Mustache. American. M-U-S-T-A-C-H-E. English. M-O-U-S-T-A-C-H-E. Neighbor. American. N-E-I-G-H-B-O-R. English. N-E-I-G-H-B-O-U-R. American. Neighborhood. N-E-I-G-H-B-O-R-H-O-O-D. English. N-E-I-G-H-B-O-U-R-H-O-O-D. Net. Adjective. American. N-E-T. English. N-E-T-T. Odor. American. O-D-O-R. English. O-D-O-U-R. Offense. American. O-F-F-E-N-S-E. English. O-F-F-E-N-C-E. Pajamas. American. P-A-J-A-M-A-S. English. P-Y-J-A-M-A-S. Parlor. American. P-A-R-L-O-R. English. P-A-R-L-O-U-R. Peas. Plural of P. American. P-E-A-S. English. P-E-A-S-E. Picket. Military. American. P-I-C-K-E-T. English. P-I-Q-U-E-T. Plow. American. P-L-O-W. English. P-L-O-U-G-H. Pretense. American. P-R-E-T-E-N-S-E. English. P-R-E-T-E-N-C-E. Program. American. P-R-O-G-R-A-M. English. P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M-E. Pudgy. American. P-U-D-G-Y. English. P-O-D-G-Y. Pygmy. American. P-Y-G-M-Y. English. P-I-G-M-Y. Ranker. American. R-A-N-C-O-R. English. R-A-N-C-O-U-R. Rigor. American. R-I-G-O-R. English. R-I-G-O-U-R. Rumor. American. R-U-M-O-R. English. R-U-M-O-U-R. Savory. American. S-A-V-O-R-Y. English. S-A-V-O-U-R-Y. Scimitar. American. S-C-I-M-I-T-A-R. English. S-C-I-M-E-T-A-R. Septicemia. American. S-E-P-T-I-C-E-M-I-A. English. S-E-P. 
T-I-C-A-E-M-I-A. -I -E show, verb, American, S-H-O-W. English, S-H-E-W. Siphon, American, S-I-P-H-O-N. English, S-Y-P-H-O-N. Siren, American, S-I-R-E-N. English, S-Y-R-E-N. Skeptic, American, S-K-E-P-T-I-C. English, S-C-E-P-T-I-C. Slug, verb, American, S-L-U-G. English, S-L-O-G. Slush, American, S-L-U-S-H. English, S-L-O-S-H. Splendor, American, S-P-L-E-N-D-O-R. English, S-P-L-E-N-D-O-U-R. Staunch, American, S-T-A-N-C-H. English, S-T-A-U-N-C-H. Story of a House, American, S-T-O-R-Y. English, S-T-O-R-E-Y. Sucker, American, S-U-C-C-O-R. English, S-U-C-C-O-U-R. Taffy, American, T-A-F-F-Y. English, T-O-F-F-Y. Tire, noun, American, T-I-R-E. English, T-Y-R-E. Toilet, American, T-O-I-L-E-T. -E English, T-O-I-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Traveler, American, T-R-A-V-E-L-E-R. -E English, T-R-A-V-E-L-L-E-R. -E Tumor, American, T-U-M-O-R. English, T-U-M-O-U-R. Valor, American, V-A-L-O-R. English, V-A-L-O-U-R. Vapor, American, V-A-P-O-R. English, V-A-P-O-U-R. Veranda, American, V-E-R-A-N-D-A. -E English, V-E-R-A-N-D-A-H. Vile, American, V-I-A-L. English, P-H-I-A-L. Vigor, American, V-I-G-O-R. English, V-I-G-O-U-R. Vice, a tool, American, V-I-S-E. English, V-I-C-E. Wagon, American, W-A-G-O-N. English, W-A-G-G-O-N. Woolen, American, W-O-O-L-E-N. English, W-O-O-L-L-E-N. End of Chapter 7, Part 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 7, Part 2 of The American Language. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Language by H. L. Mencken. Chapter 7. Differences in Spelling. Part 2. General Tendencies. This list is by no means exhaustive. According to a recent writer upon the subject, there are 812 words in which the prevailing American spelling differs from the English. But enough examples are given to reveal a number of definite tendencies. American, in general, moves toward simplified forms of spelling more rapidly than English, and has got much further along the road. Redundant and unnecessary letters have been dropped from whole groups of words. The U from the group of nouns in our, with the sole exception of savior, and from such words as mold and balk. The E from annex, asphalt, axe, form, peas, story, etc. The duplicate consonant from wagon. Net, faggot, woolen, jeweler, counselor, etc., 
and the silent foreign suffixes from toilet, epaulette, program, veranda, etc. In addition, simple vowels have been substituted for degenerated diphthongs in such words as anemia, esophagus, diarrhea, and medieval, most of them from the Greek. Further attempts in the same direction are to be seen in the substitution of simple consonants for compound consonants, as in plow, bark, check, vile, and draft, in the substitution of I for Y to bring words into harmony with analogues, as in tire, cider, and baritone, confer wire, rider, merriment, and in the general tendency to get rid of the somewhat uneuphonious Y, as in ataxia and pajamas. Clarity and simplicity are also served by substituting CT for X in such words as connection and inflection, and S for C in words of the defense group. The superiority of J-A-I-L to G-A-O-L is made manifest by the common mispronunciation of the latter, making it rhyme with coal. The substitution of I for E in such words as endorse, enclose, and jimmy is of less patent utility, but even here there is probably a slight gain in euphony. Of more obscure origin is what seems to be a tendency to avoid the O sound, so that the English slog becomes slug, podgy becomes pudgy, nout becomes naught, slosh becomes slush, toffee becomes taffy, and so on. Other changes carry their own justification. Hostler is obviously better American than ostler, though it may be worse English. Show is more logical than shoe. Cozy, C-O-Z-Y, is more nearly phonetic than cozy, C-O-S-Y. Curb has analogues in curtain, curdle, curfew, curl, current, curry. Curve, curtsy, curse, currency, cursory, curtail, cur, curt, and many other common words. Curb, K-E-R-B, has very few, and of them only kerchief and kernel are in general use. Moreover, the English themselves use curb, C-U-R-B, as a verb, and in all noun senses, save that shown in curbstone. But a number of anomalies remain. The American substitution of A for E in gray is not easily explained, nor is the substitution of K for C in skeptic and mollusk, nor the retention of E in forego nor the unphonetic substitution of S for Z in fuse, nor the persistence of the first Y in pygmy. Here we have plain vagaries, surviving in spite of attack by orthographers. Webster, in one of his earlier books, denounced the K in skeptic as a mere pedantry, but later on he adopted it. In the same way, pygmy, gray, and mollusk have been attacked, but they still remain sound American. The English themselves have many more such illogical forms to account for. In the midst of the our words, they cling to a small number in or, among them stupor. Moreover, they drop the u in many derivatives, for example, in arboreal, armory, clamorously, 
clangorous, odiferous, humorist, laborious, and rigorism. If it were dropped in all derivatives, the rule would be easy to remember, but it is retained in some of them, for example, colorable, favorite, misdemeanor, colored, and laborer. The derivatives of honor exhibit the confusion clearly. Honorary, honorarium, and honorific drop the U, but honorable retains it. Furthermore, the English make a distinction between two senses of rigor. When used in its pathological sense, not only in the Latin form of rigor mortis, but as an English word, it drops the U. In all other senses, it retains the U. The one American anomaly in this field is savior. In its theological sense, it retains the U, but in that sense only. A sailor who saves his ship is its savior, S-A-V-I-O-R, not its savior, S-A-V-I-O-U-R. End of chapter 7, part 2. Recording by Linda Johnson.